the tactical experience of the later years, and earlier history, confirms his wisdom, and the only question is why the exploitation of the success in the south was not more prompt. Part of the dense infantry strength which had been used to strew no man's land with dead might better have been kept to swell the reserve for such a purpose. Even as it was, the Germans were badly shaken, and if British reserve divisions were few, theirs were less, as their delay in counter-attacking showed. But the 4th Army made no attempt to push reserves through at the sectors of least resistance and at 10 p.m. on the 1st merely ordered its corps to continue to attack evenly along the whole front. At Rawlinson's suggestion, Goff was put in charge of the two left corps, X and 8, which had most obviously failed dash an unenviable task for a man who had been intended, and was best fitted, for the role of exploitation. The corps commanders pointed out the hopelessness of a fresh attack without adequate preparation. Goff wisely concurred, and the orders were cancelled. As these corps were not in a state to attack unbroken defences again, nothing happened on the second. Meantime the 13 corps, which had made a real penetration on the extreme right, was held back. This passivity was the more regrettable because, in conjunction with the French, it had already shattered a ragged and fumbling night counter-attack by a German division hurried up from Cambrai, the one enemy reserve immediately available. Opportunity receded further when. For the third, Rawlinson merely ordered a renewed attack by the left wing in conjunction with his centre. This plan, Haig approved but modified, with not altogether happy results. He was now turning his eyes to the right, and he reduced the Moro's attack to thrusts by small packets against Pfl and Avilas. The rearrangement accentuated the defects due to divided control so that the attacks became not only petty in scale but disjointed in delivery, and proved void of any effect except further casualties. Meantime, troops of the 13 Corps on the right walked into Bernafay Wood almost without opposition, but were restrained from going farther. The French 20 Corps next to it was, as a corollary, also constrained to inactivity but south of the Somme the French captured the German second line and the high ground overlooking P.E. Haig was now convinced of the advisability of concentrating his effort on the right. But he met a French stumbling block. Both Joffre and Fock, who was in direct charge of the French share of the offensive, insisted that Haig should capture the ridge from Posiers to Thpval in the centre as a preliminary to any attack on the right, or Longueville, sector. Haig's contention that he had not enough ammunition to cover effectively a renewed attack on the whole front, and that the Longueville Ridge defences were weaker than at Thpfil, made no impression, and Joffre declared that if the British attacked Longueville they would be beaten. Indeed, he went so far as to give Haig a direct order to attack in the centre, whereupon Haig retorted that he was responsible to the British government, and that, although he was ready to follow Joffre's strategy, in matters of tactics he would take his own line. This settled the question. A long interval followed, however, before the 4th Army was ready for the attack on the enemy's second line. The interval was the longer because Haig considered it necessary to clear away all the enemy's outlying footholds before attempting the main stroke, and sought to seize these by a series of nibbling attacks. At the same time the X and 8 Corps on the left were definitely transferred from Rawlinson's 4th Army to Goff's Reserve Army, later to become the 5th, and the available reserves and guns were concentrated on the reduced 4th Army front. Thus, during the days immediately following July 1st, when the German defence was seriously shaken in the southern sector, Montauban, La Boisle, the renewed attacks were slight in strength and spasmodic. The resistance had breathing space to reorganize and harden, to strengthen its hold on the commanding ridge, Jinchipo's years, where ran the German second line. The British progress became very slow, and a special obstacle was offered by Marnitz Wood. The three days abortive attacks, by the 38th, Welsh, Division, and consequent delay here were to prejudice the main stroke but as great a handicap was imposed from above. If the British higher command had been over-ambitious and unduly optimistic before July 1st, it perhaps now tended to the other extreme. Rawlinson, however, 
had been brought to realize that bold and rapid measures were essential if he was to forestall the German reinforcements and labor which were rebuilding, in rear, the fortified front faster than the British could force a way through it. If the British waited until their front line had been carried near enough to the German second line, Brau Unistellung, for a close assault, they might well be confronted with a barrier as firm as the original of July 1st. Rawlinson framed a plan to attack and break the German defences on a four-mile front between Delville Wood on the right, and Bazant in Le Petit Wood on the left. His right was fully three-quarters of a mile distant from this second line, with the vital tactical feature of Trones Wood between still in German hands. Thence towards his left no man's land gradually narrowed, until in front of Marnitz Wood it was only about three hundred yards wide, but Trones would enfiladed a large part of the line of advance. If the obvious course was adopted, and an attack delivered only on the left, the prospects were barren, for the experience of 1915 had shown that an attack on a narrow frontage against an enemy with ample guns might gain an initial success, only to be blown out of the captured fragment by the concentration of hostile gunfire thus facilitated. Instead of the obvious, Rawlinson took a course which for all its risks, calculated risks, was more truly secure and economical of force. The troops were to cross the exposed area by an advance under cover of darkness, followed by a dawn attack, preceded by a hurricane bombardment of only a few minutes duration. This plan revived the use of surprise, which lay rusting throughout the greater part of the war until in fact the last year from Cambrai onwards. In 1916 the ideas of a night advance and of such a brief bombardment were alike so fresh in revival as to be a shock and appear a gamble to orthodox opinion. That he should attempt the maneuver with new army troops, men who had been civilians less than two years before, made his plan seem yet more rash. The commander-in-chief was strongly opposed to it, preferring a more limited alternative, but Rawlinson persevered, his own confidence reinforced by the confidence of the actual troop leaders in their ability to carry out the night operation. For once, Horn, who was usually as apt to agree with Haig's views as he was dependable in other ways, agreed instead with his immediate superior, and this fact may have helped to tilt the scales. Rawlinson gained his way, but instead of the already delayed attack being launched on July 13, as he intended, the reluctance of the higher command caused it to be postponed until July 14, a day's delay that was to have grave consequences. Another drawback was the lack of French cooperation, owing to lack of faith in the prospects of the attack. The attacking troops were composed of the 9th and 3rd Divisions of the 13 Corps on the right, W. T. First and J. A. L. Haldane and the 7th and 21st Divisions of the 15 Corps on the left, H. E. Watson D. G. M. Campbell, while on the extreme right flank Max's 18th Division had the task of clearing Thrones Wood. On the extreme left the three Cal formed a defensive flank between Bazant in Le Petit Wood and Cantelmason. Cavalry divisions were brought up close and placed under the orders of the two attacking corps. The German front was held by only six battalions of mixed divisions in General Stein's group, with the 7th Division in reserve south of Bayporm. The trenches of the Brau Unistellung ran just in front of Delville Wood, Longueville, Bazant in Le Grand and Bazant in Le Petit Woods, with High Wood, like a dark cloud on the skyline behind, dominating the whole area of approach. From it the Germans could see several miles behind the old British front line of July 1 St. On the right, markers went out some hours after darkness had fallen on July 13 and placed white tapes to guide the troops along their 1,000 yards approach, then further tapes at right angles to mark the forward line on which the troops were to form up, so that they should start parallel with their objective. The hazardous and difficult task was carried through successfully and soon after midnight the battalions assembled in the shelter of Caterpillar Valley, moving up in long worm-like lines of companies or platoons in single file. At 3.20 am the barrage fell on the German trenches, and five minutes later the whole line moved forward to the assault. The vision which had dared to attempt such a surprise stroke, 
and had supported imagination with good staff work, was justified. The whole of the German second line was rapidly overrun, and the attacking troops passed beyond. From left to right, the 21st Division pressed through Bazant in Le Petit Wood to the village, the 7th Division cleared Bazant in Le Grand Wood and pushed up the slopes towards High Wood. The 3rd Division captured Bazant in Le Grand, and the 9th Division fought their way, albeit with difficulty, through Longueville to the outskirts of Delville Wood. On this right flank, every yard of advance was bitterly opposed, and in the depths of Delville Wood, during the ensuing days, the South Africans made their supreme sacrifice of the war, where today a white stone colonnade of peaceful beauty commemorates, and contrasts with, the bloodiest battle hell of 1916. But on the left flank opportunity, an open country, stretched out its arms. Soon after midday the German resistance was clearly disintegrating on the front of the 7th Division, and an effort was made to exploit the chance although some hours were lost. The 7th Division moved forward soon after 6 p.m. with two squadrons of cavalry working on their flank, the first mounted cavalry seen on a British battlefield since 1914. Roseate expectations pictured open warfare on the skyline, but once more it proved a mirage in the military desert. The troops of the illustrious 7th Division were a shade battle-weary, their depleted ranks had been filled with many untried drafts. Whatever the cause, the advance tended to lack vigor, and although most of Highwood was cleared that evening, the northern corner of the flanking trenches remained in the Germans' grip. Worst of all, 24 hours postponement had enabled fresh reserves to come up, and as their strength steadily swelled the German hold tightened the British relaxed. Late on July 15 the wood was evacuated under pressure of counter-attacks, and two months were to pass before possession was regained. The surprise storm of the Somme Bastille on July 14 brought the British to the verge of a strategic decision, thereafter their effort degenerated into a battle of attrition. After the disappointing end of the July 14 stroke, Haig played for smaller stakes. His overdrawn supplies of ammunition were causing concern, and he had in mind no effective substitute for gun pounding as an opener for the enemy's sealed front. Early in June he had contemplated the step of transferring his main offensive to the Messines sector in Flanders if the German reserves held him up on the Somme. And the Anzac Corps began to move thither in readiness. But by July 7 he had decided instead to pour his own reserves down to the Somme, now, for the enemy, the line of expectation, and to throw all his weight into the direct offensive the dot he ordered, however, a number of local attacks in the north as a means to fix the enemy's attention and keep his reserves there, and away from the Somme. The method reveals a most curious military delusion, for while simulated preparations for a large-scale offensive would cause the enemy natural apprehension, the actual delivery of a narrow-fronted local attack would merely disclose the bluff. One consequence was the shattering of the 5th Australian Division in an absurdly advertised attack at Frommel's, an attack which was the final link of an almost incredibly muddled chain of causation. The rest of the Anzac Corps had been moved to the Somme, where Haig's aim was now to enlarge his lodgment on the main ridge. He had favoured the idea of trying to carry out his original third phase, of rolling up the German front northwards, although the original conditions had not been fulfilled. But he had not sufficient elbow room to deploy an adequate force for it. And it would have diverged from the line of cooperation with the French. Hence he decided to continue his main pressure with his right, eastward towards the French line of convergence, while on his left Goff sought to gain the Po's years the end of the ridge and so widen the British holding upon it. To this end Gough was given the Anzac Corps, Birdwood, and on July 23 he launched part of it against Poe's years in conjunction with a renewed assault by the three corps of the 4th Army along the whole of its narrow front, from Guillemont to Bazant in Lepetti. This failed completely, on the left the 1st Australian Division gained a footing in Poe's years. Haag reverted to the method of nibbling, now to be exalted as a definite and masterly strategy of attrition, and to be defended by optimistic miscalculations of the German losses. Nearly two months of bitter fighting followed, 
during which the British made little progress at much cost, and the infantry of both sides served as compressed cannon fodder for artillery consumption. On the left flank the Anzac Corps was the main agent of the new plan of methodical progress. The effect is best described in the measured words of the Australian official history doubtless to the commander-in-chief, and possibly to the cabinet, the use of terms implying leisurely progress brought some comfortable assurance of economy of life as well as of munitions, but to the front line the method merely appeared to be that of applying a battering ram 10 or 15 times against the same part of the enemy's battlefront with the intention of penetrating for a mile, or possibly two into the midst of his organized defenses. Even if the need for maintaining pressure be granted, the student will have difficulty in reconciling his intelligence to the actual tactics. To throw the several parts of an army corps, brigade after brigade, twenty times in succession against one of the strongest points in the enemy's defense, may certainly be described as methodical but the claim that it was economic is entirely unjustified. 23,000 men were expended in these efforts for the ultimate gain, after six weeks, of a tiny tongue of ground just over a mile deep. And what of the moral effect? Although most Australian soldiers were optimists, and many were opposed on principle to voicing, or even harbouring, grievances, it is not surprising if the effect on some intelligent men was a bitter conviction that they were being uselessly sacrificed. For Christ's sake, write a book on the life of an infantryman, said one of them, and by doing so you will quickly prevent these shocking tragedies. That an officer who had fought so nobly as Lieutenant J. A. Rawls, should, in the last letter before his death, speak of the murder of many of his friends through the incompetence, callousness, and personal vanity of those high in authority, is evidence not indeed of the literal truth of his words, but of something much amiss in the higher leadership. We have just come out of a place so terrible, wrote Dash, one of the most level-headed officers in the force, that a raving lunatic could never imagine the horror of the last thirteen days. The history indicates that Bird would lost much of his Gallipoli popularity through his failure to interpose against Goff's impetuous desire for quick results and his lack of thought. This may have been a factor in leading the Australian troops to reject Birdwood's personal appeal when they voted against the conscription of other men to share the horrors that they had experienced. But Poe's years was matched on the other flank by Guillemont now a peaceful hamlet amid cornfields, then a shambles of blended horror and mystery. From Throneswood it is down one slope, up another, only a few hundred yards of farm road now, yet in July and August, 1916, an infinite distance. Division after division essayed to cross it, felt the petty prize within their fingers, and then slipped back unable to maintain their hold. And when it was at last secured on September 3rd, Jinchi, a few hundred yards farther up the slope, was a similar obstruction until September 9. Save Thville, still defiant, no hamlets have exacted a heavier price for their possession. Now at last the British line was straightened on a seven mile front running northwest from Loose Wood, overlooking Combles, where it joined up with the French. They had just extended farther south the attack south of the Somme storming three miles of the old German front line near Chorns and taking 7,000 prisoners. On August 30, Rawlinson had recorded in his diary dash the chief is anxious to have a gamble with all the available troops about September 15, with the object of breaking down German resistance and getting through to Bayporm. And be added, somewhat illogically dash we shall have no reserves in hand, save tired troops, but success at this time might bring the botches to terms. Despite his professed faith in attrition, Haig was now reduced to gambling on a breakthrough. The attack was to pivot on the left wing, Goff's army. The primary object of the main blow, by Rawlinson, was to break through what had originally been the Germans' last line between Morville and Lassars, in cooperation with the French thrust to the south between Combles and the Somme, thus pinching out Combles. If the opening success warranted the attempt the British attack was to be extended northward to seize Corselet and Martin Puich. Eight divisions were deployed for the original attack, and two detailed for the extension. 
A special feature was the employment for the first time of tanks, the armored cross-country machines which had been invented as an antidote to the defensive obstacle of machine guns and barbed wire. In disregard of the opinions of the tank's progenitors, and of their own expressed agreement with these opinions, the British Higher Command had decided to utilize such machines as were available, as a stake to redeem the fading prospects of the Somme offensive. When this decision was taken only 60 of the initial 150 machines had been transported to France. 49 were actually employed, to work in tiny detachments of two or three machines, another breach with the principles laid down by Colonel Swinton. The scant and hasty preparation combined with the mechanical defects of this early model to reduce the total, so that only 32 reached the starting point. Of these, 9 pushed ahead with the infantry, 9 failed to catch the infantry, but helped in clearing the captured ground, 9 broke down and 5 were ditched in the craters of the battlefield. The first 9 rendered useful aid, especially in capturing Flas, but the greater prize, of a great surprise stroke, was a heavy forfeit to pay for redeeming in a limited degree the failure of the Somme offensive. After three days bombardment, the attack was launched at dawn on the 15th in a slight mist. The mist, together with the clouds of smoke, prevented the German gunners in many places from seeing the light signals fired by their infantry, and the consequent lack of artillery support on the German side eased the path of the British infantry. Thus the 15 Corps in the centre made early and good progress, by 10 a.m. its left division was beyond Flas. Its progress was greatly helped by the tanks, of which the German regimental histories give a vivid impression dash the arrival of the tanks on the scene had the most shattering effect on the men. They felt quite powerless against these monsters which crawled along the top of the trench enfilading it with continuous machine gun fire and closely followed by small parties of infantry who threw hand grenades on the survivors. But on the right the 14 Corps lost heavily and was held up long before it could reach Morville and Les Boeufs. The 3 Corps, on the left, also fell short of its objectives, although its 47th Division finally cleared the long-sought high wood. On the extreme left the projected extension of the attack was carried out, and both Martin Puich and Corselet were taken. As a result of the day the crest of the ridge had been gained, except on the right, and with it the commanding observation which the Germans had so long enjoyed. The failure on the right was redressed on September 25th, by another big attack which, in conjunction with the French, compelled the Germans to evacuate Combles. Next day Pfeil at last fell to an attack by four divisions of Goff's army. German accounts make it clear that the decisive break in their front was caused by the appearance of three British tanks. On the outskirts of Thpval village, Haig still called for pressure without intermission and, as a result of further small gains, by the first week of October the Germans were back in their last completed line of defences, which ran from Sailly Seisel, on the right, past La Transloy and in front of Bayporm, they were busily constructing fresh lines in rear but these were not yet complete. On the other hand these days had proved the continued strength of the German resistance, and the limited success held but little hope of a real breakthrough or its exploitation. The early onset of the autumn rains made this hope more slender daily. The rains combined with the bombardments to make the ground a morass in which guns and transport were bogged, while even lightly equipped infantry could barely and slowly struggle forward. Attacks under such conditions were terribly handicapped, that most of them failed was inevitable, and if a trench was taken the difficulties of consolidating it liquidated the gain. By October 12 Haig seems to have been at last convinced that he could not pierce the German defences that year. But Joffre and Fock continued to urge him on, and in partial response Haig continued to call for fresh attacks through the mud towards Le Transloy until a strong protest was made by Lord Cavan, commanding the 14 Corps, who desired to know whether it was deliberately intended to sacrifice the British right in order to help the French left, and pointedly added Dash no one who has not visited the front can really know the state of exhaustion to which the men are reduced. But other corps commanders had less moral courage, and Rawlinson, although sympathetic, seems to have yielded against his better judgment to his chief's determination. 
Hence the three and Anzac Corps continued a hopeless series of petty attacks until November 16. Their ineffectiveness was redeemed, as their ineptitude was obscured, by a welcome, last hour success of Goff's army. The wedge that had been slowly driven eastward between the Anker and the Somme had turned the original German defences north of the Anker into a pronounced salient. For some time Goff's army had been preparing an attack against this and a temporary improvement in the weather allowed it to be launched on November 13, by seven divisions. Beaumont Hamel and Bocourt zur were captured, with 7,000 prisoners, but on the left so once more proved impregnable. Haig was pleased, because it would strengthen the hands of the British representatives at the forthcoming Allied military conference at Chantilly so the Somme offensive could at last be suspended with honour satisfied. The folly of the last phase, from September 25th onwards, was that having at last won the crest of the ridge, and its commanding observation, the advantage was thrown away by fighting away down into the valley beyond. Thereby the troops were doomed to spend the winter in flooded trenches. Somme mud was soon to be notorious. Thus, the Miscal Battle of the Somme closed in an atmosphere of disappointment, and with such a drain on the British forces that the coincident strain on the enemy was obscured. This strain was largely due to the rigidity of the German higher commanders, especially General von Below of the First Army, who issued an order that any officer who gave up an inch of trench would be court martialed and that every yard of lost trench must be retaken by counter-attack. If German mistakes do not condone British mistakes they at least caused a vain loss of life, and still more of morale, which helped to balance the British loss, until on August 23rd Below was compelled to swallow his own orders and modify his method of resistance, in accord with that of the new Hindenburg Ludendorff RE Gym.6 seen for the growing pains of the tank on September 15, 1916, a new instrument of war received its baptism of fire, and helped to make the British attack on that day one of the landmarks of the Somme offensive. It was one of the few attacks which did not require the use of a large-scale map and a magnifying glass to detect its progress. But, far more significant, it cast its shadow over the whole future of the war. And as it thus becomes a greater landmark in the history of the war than in the history of the Somme, so it is likely to become a still greater landmark in the history of war. For this new instrument, the tank, changed the face of war by substituting motor power for a man's legs as a means of movement on the battlefield and by reviving the use of armor as a substitute for his skin or for earth scrapings as a means of protection. Hitherto he could not fire if he wished to move, and could not move if he wished for cover. But September 15, 1916, saw the simultaneous combination in one agent of fire power, movement, and protection, an advantage until then enjoyed in modern warfare only by those who fought on the sea. But although sea warfare on land may be the ultimate consequence of the tank, and was foreshadowed in its first name of landship, the original intention was more limited and more immediately practical, to provide an antidote to the machine gun which, in alliance with barbed wire, had reduced warfare to stagnation and generalship to attrition. The Q was a British production, the most significant achievement of British brains during the World War. Yet it has an essential transatlantic link, symbolical in view of the association on the battlefield that was soon to follow. For the source of both the evil and the antidote was American. The trench deadlock was due above all to the invention of an American, Hiram Maxim. His name is more deeply engraved on the real history of the World War than that of any other man. Emperors, statesmen, and generals had the power to make war, but not to end it. Having created it, they found themselves helpless puppets in the grip of Hiram Maxim, who, by his machine gun, had paralyzed the power of attack. All efforts to break the defensive grip of the machine gun were vain, they could only raise tombstones and not triumphal arches. When at last a key to the deadlock was produced, it was forged from the invention of another American, Benjamin Holt. From his agricultural tractor was evolved the tank, 
an ironic reversal of the proverbial custom of beating swords into plowshares. The eventual effect of the tank is best appreciated by studying the evidence of those who had to face it. Was it not Ludendorff himself who spoke of the great tank surprise of August 8, 1918, as the black day of the German army in the history of the war, and added, mass attacks by tanks remained hereafter our most dangerous enemies. More emphatic still is the comment of General von Zweldash it was not the genius of Marshal Fock that beat us, but General Tank. Nor can it be suggested that these were afterthoughts put forward in mitigation of defeat, for the most striking evidence of all, red hot from the forge of battle, is to be found in the momentous report submitted, on October 2, 1918, by the representatives of the German military headquarters to the leaders of the Reichstag dash the chief army command has been compelled to take a terribly grave decision and declare that according to human possibilities there is no longer any prospect of forcing peace on the enemy. Above all, two facts have been decisive for this issue, first, the tanks. The confession thus made gains force from comparison with the earlier disparagement of the tanks by the German commands. For history, the first question is how the tank came to be introduced, and the second, why its decisive effect was delayed until 1918. The first question is befogged rather than guided by the popular question, so widely raised during and after the war. Dash who invented the tank? So many claimed the honor, many with some show of reason and still more without, that the public became confused. And the government did not help to establish the actual chain of causation, perhaps influenced by the instinct of the treasury to avoid the recognition of financial obligations. Thus it did not become clear until the evidence in an action brought against the crown in 1925 was available to supplement that given in 1919 before the Royal Commission on Awards to Inventors. In order to defeat this unjustified claim to reward the treasury had to provide an opportunity for evaluating the genuine claims to honor. The historical evolution of the tank has been confused also by the lack of any clear definition of the tank and its purpose, and this vagueness owes something to the fact that prior to the time when the camouflage name tank was invented, the machine was known as a landship or land cruiser. Such a title, due to its being mothered in infancy by the Admiralty, however prophetic of its still distant future, is far from applicable to its past, in the war. Regarded as a landship, or even as an armored battle car, the origin of the tank is lost in the mists of antiquity. Among its forebears might be included the ancient war chariot, the Husset war carts which formed their famous Wagenberg, even, with some show of reason, the battle elephants of Pius, or the medieval knight in armor. If the search be limited to self moving, as distinct from men or animal moved machines, its origin might be traced to Voltrio's wind propelled war chariot of 1472, or to the proposals made by that many sided genius, Leonardo da Vinci, to his patron Ludovico Sforza. In 1599, Simon Stevin constructed for the Prince of Orange two actual landships wheel borne and sail propelled. As far back as 1634, David Ramsey took out the earliest patent for a self-moving car capable of use in war. So through an endless chain of experiments the origin might be traced. The Caterpillar track itself, perhaps, in general opinion the distinctive feature of the tank, goes back to the early 19th century or even to Richard Edgeworth's device of 1770. If the definition be drawn still closer to mean a petrol-driven tracked machine for military use, the Hornsby tractor, used at Aldershot in 1908, takes precedence of the American Holt tractor in the ancestry of the tank. If the use of tank-like machines as weapons be the test, then Mr. H. G. Wells deserves the credit popularly accorded him for priority of conception, although his prophetic story of 1903 in the Strand magazine was itself twenty years behind the writings and drawings of M. Albert Robida in La Caricature, if similarity of design, then one recalls Mr. L. E. de Mole's model, superior to the 1916 tank, which was pigeonholed in the War Office in 1912. 
to these add also the story of the Nottingham plumber whose hobby it was to make toy machines of this nature, and whose design, submitted to the war office in 1911, and duly pigeonholed, was unearthed after the war, the file bearing the terse official comment. The man's mad. The chief result of this historical survey, however, is to show the futility of trying to determine the credit for the origination of this decisive weapon of the World War without a clear understanding and definition of its particular purpose. Leonardo da Vinci and the Nottingham plumber alike may claim to be among the fathers of mechanical warfare, but for the parentage of the actual tank of the World War we must look closer. The test of its origin is tactical rather than technical. It was a specific antidote for a specific disease which first broke out virulently in the World War. This disease was the complete paralysis of the offensive brought about by the defensive power of serried machine guns, and aggravated by wire entanglements, this disease doomed the manhood of the nation to a slow and lingering end, prolonged only by the capacity to produce fresh victims for the futile sacrifice. Why Chile's phrase, necessity, mother of invention, has never had a truer example, and it provides the real test to determine the immediate origin of the World War tank. The first military physician who diagnosed the disease and conceived the antidote was Colonel Ernest Swinton, whose pen name of Olalia Coye had become well known through the Green Curve and Duffer's Drift, studies of war in fiction form, wherein the pill of knowledge was delightfully coated with jam. A term of hard labor on the British official history of the Russo-Japanese War gave him the opportunity to analyze its tendencies and to deduce the potential domination of the machine gun. Later, he took an interest in the whole tractor experiments. These two impressions soon fitted together like the two segments of a circle. For when, soon after the outbreak of war, he was sent to France as official eyewitness at general headquarters, he was both well placed and well prepared to recognize the first symptoms of stalemate, and to suggest a remedy. On October 20, visiting London, he saw Colonel Morris Hankey, the Secretary of the Committee of Imperial Defense, and after describing the situation, domination of defense based on the machine gun, outlined his proposals for an antidote. These were, in brief, to develop such a machine as the whole tractor into a bulletproof trench crossing machine gun destroyer, armed with one or more small quick firing guns. In Hankey he found an acute and receptive mind, and a further discussion the next day led to an understanding that Hankey would take up the matter at home and Swinton in France. On October 23, Swinton took up the question at general headquarters, but the suggestion came up against a blank wall. Meanwhile, Hankey put the idea before Lord Kitchener, with equally barren result. But he also submitted to the Prime Minister, Mr. Asquith, a memorandum on various ways, strategic and technical, of overcoming the deadlock, which embodied, among others, Swinton's suggestion. This reached Mr. Churchill. His mind was already active with the problem of enabling armored cars to cross broken ground and trenches, because of his concern with the armored car detachments of the Royal Naval Air Service operating on the Belgian coast. On January 5, 1915, Churchill wrote a letter to the Prime Minister supporting and amplifying the suggestion in Hankey's memorandum for the use of armored caterpillar tractors to overrun trenches. This letter was sent by Asquith to Kitchener. By a coincidence Swinton had called at the war office on January 4 to press anew his proposals, now extended owing to the continued experience of conditions in France. The seed thus planted at the war office by two sowers fell on stony soil, and after some attention finally withered, owing largely to the freezing verdict of Sir Capel Holden, Director of Mechanical Transport. Fortunately, the general idea was kept alive on other soil, for Churchill in February, formed a committee at the Admiralty, which later became known as the Land Ships Committee. But this committee, though investigating many lines of thought and experiment, did not make much practical headway, its energies being diverted for a time in the direction of a land ship with giant wheels. A worse blow was the removal of Churchill's vision and driving force, though even when he left the Admiralty it was his influence which kept the experiments alive. By this time also, fortunately, the committee, 
Under the guidance of Mr. Tennyson Dean Court, the director of naval construction, had got onto the right line, that of the caterpillar. Even so, concrete results seem to have been hindered, and energy leaking, through lack of any exact specification of the military requirements of such a machine, for in the scheme of scientific war the tactical takes precedence of the technical. This essential, but hitherto missing, link came in a memorandum forwarded from General Headquarters, and once this was available progress became rapid and practical. The memorandum was compiled by Swinton, who had surmounted the barrier of unbelief and convention by an appeal direct to the Commander-in-Chief. It formulated the performance required of the machine, and on this specification the newly framed Joint Committee of War Office and Admiralty went to work. On July 19, Swinton returned to England as Acting Secretary to the War Committee of the Cabinet and got in touch with the Joint Committee later, on the Prime Minister's authorization, calling an interdepartmental conference to coordinate the work on the new machines. On September 19, an inspection was held at Lincoln of a provisional machine, Little Willie, but this was rejected by Swinton as failing to conform to requirements. He was then shown a full-size wooden model, or mock-up, of a larger machine, which had been specially designed by Mr. Drayton and Lieutenant Wilson to meet the latest army specification. This was accepted, as it looked capable of complying with the two main conditions, to climb a vertical face of five feet and cross a ditch eight feet wide, and it was decided to concentrate on the production of a sample machine of this type. Finally, on February 2, 1916, at Hatfield was held the official trial of this machine, christened Mother or Big Willie, and as a result 40 of these machines were ordered, a number subsequently increased to 150. The French, now, had independently begun similar experiments through the initiative of Colonel S. Sheen, whose project was sanctioned by Joffre on December 12. Although both idea and machine were later in maturing than the British, it is a significant contrast that the first French order was for 400, and that order was soon doubled. During the summer of 1916, the crews for the new machines were being trained in a vast secret enclosure, surrounded by armed guards, near Thetford in Norfolk. They formed a unit that was christened the Heavy Section, Machine Gun Corps. For secrecy's sake, also a new name had been chosen for the machines. The need was to find a name sufficiently mystifying and yet plausible to any outside observer who might see the top or lined machines in transit on the railway, and after discussing the merits of tank, cistern, and reservoir, the choice fell on the first dot through the secrecy so well maintained, surprise was obtained when the tanks made their debut on the battlefield. Unhappily the fruits of the surprise were forfeited. Herein lay the tragedy of September 15th. 1916, for the official guardians disregarded the entreaties of the parents and insisted on putting the tank to work before it was mechanically mature and before its numbers were adequate. Thus they not only endangered its future usefulness but threw away the chance of surprising the enemy while he was unprepared with any countermeasures. The consequence was to prolong the hardships and toll of the war. The reply normally made to this charge is to point out the mechanical defects which the early tanks developed, the numbers that were ditched, and to argue that a weapon must be tested under battlefield conditions before mass production is begun. The contention is plausible, but unconvincing in view of the facts. The tank first used in the shell mangled chaos of the Somme, and against the deep and intricate trench systems of 1916, was built to a specification laid down in the summer of 1915, when trench lines were far less developed and artillery bombardments were not so heavy as to turn the ground into a morass, as in 1916 and 1917. Moreover, the apologists gloss over the fact that in September, 1916, the tanks were hurried out to France and rushed into battle before their crews were fully trained and before the commanders in France had time to think, or had been given instructions, how to use them. Again, the very likelihood that the proportion of mechanical failures in this early model would be high was surely a logical reason for the production of a large number, so that sufficient might survive to reap the harvest of surprise.
As the British nation was paying over several million pounds a day for the pleasure of watching and occasionally tapping on the locked gates of the German front, it would surely have been worth risking an extra day's expenditure in the purchase of a possible means of breaking the lock. Let us probe a little further the mystery of the premature use of this immature instrument. In December, 1915, Churchill drafted a paper on the use of the tank. Printed for the Committee of Imperial Defense, copies were given to the Commander in Chief in France. In February, 1916, as soon as the design and armament of the machine had been settled sufficiently for accurate calculations, Swinton produced a more comprehensive and detailed memorandum. This emphasized that the vital factor was the secret production of tanks until masses could be launched in a great surprise stroke, and that on no account should they be used in driblets as they were manufactured. Haag expressed his full agreement with this memorandum in the spring. Yet in August he suddenly decided to use the mere 60 then available. At that time the offensive on the Somme had practically come to a standstill and the reports of petty gain at heavy loss grated unpleasantly on the ear of the public. Haig's decision came as a shock to the cabinet at home, and Lloyd George, now war minister, energetically protested, while Montague, his successor at the Ministry of Munitions, went out to general headquarters in a vain attempt to avert the premature use of the tanks. Haig was immovable and the powerless parents had to submit to the sacrifice of their offspring's future. Thus history is left to surmise that the tanks were pawned for a song dash of the Somme. Pawned to pay for a resounding local success which might draw an encore from the public, and, incidentally, drown the growing volume of criticism. But the greater prize thus lost beyond recall was a heavy forfeit to pay for redeeming in a limited degree the ill success of the Somme offensive. With Haig this act may have been prompted by a laudable if unwise desire to economize the lives of his infantry without giving up his offensive. He had certainly shown his eagerness to clutch at any new aid. But the attitude of some of his staff cannot be similarly excused. For the breach of principle does not complete the tally of general headquarters. Swinton's memorandum laid down a number of conditions which were disregarded in September, 1916, only to be adopted after bitter experience had shown their necessity. The sector for tank attack was to be carefully chosen to comply with the powers and limitations of the tanks. This condition was neither considered nor fulfilled until the Cambrai Offensive in November, 1917. Their routes of approach were to be specially prepared, as well as suitable railway trucks or barges to bring them up, despite six months warning these preparations were not begun until the tanks arrived in August. The need for reserves of tanks was stressed, but the lesson was not even learnt by the time of Cambrai, nor indeed, until August. 1918. The combined tactics of tanks and infantry were expounded, also to be overlooked, until Cambrai. In addition to shell, the tank guns were to fire case shot. It was designed but its manufacture was debarred until the commanders in France clamoured for it after the Somme. Some of the tanks were to be equipped with wireless sets, these were designed and operators trained, but General Headquarters would not allow the equipment to be sent out, and it was dispersed. The attitude and mentality prevailing at General Headquarters is illustrated by a story current at the time. A General on Haig's staff gave instructions that the tanks were to be brought to the front by a certain railway route. The technical expert in charge of the movement pointed out that this was impossible because of the loading gauge. The General retorted dash what the hell is a loading gauge? The officer explained, and pointed out that by another route they could avoid the two tunnels that made this route impossible. But the general, still refusing to recognize the impossible, curtly said dash then, have the tunnels widened. The trial of the tank on the Somme did not complete. A thousand of a new model had just been ordered by the Ministry of Munitions in England. But their opponents, by which one means not the Germans but the general staff in France made haste to report so adversely that the war office cancelled the order. Unfortunately for their intention, if fortunately for England, the officer in charge of the construction of tanks was a temporary soldier, Major Albert Stern, 
whose permanent position in the city enabled him to bear with equanimity the frowns of his temporary superiors. Disregarding the order he went straight to the war minister, to find that the cancellation had been sent without Lloyd George's knowledge. And having satisfied himself of Lloyd George's opposition to any such foolish measure, Stern called on the chief of the Imperial General Staff, Sir William Robertson, to intimate that he was not going to carry out the cancellation order. Nevertheless, let it be said to the credit of those who, on the general staff, opposed the tank, that if they had not the ingenuity to devise means of beating the Germans, they were fertile in devices to beat the sponsors of the tank. Swinton, as merely a soldier, was not a difficult adversary and almost at once was ousted from his position in command of the whole tank unit in England. In July, 1917, Dioncourt and Stern were neatly excluded from the meetings of the committee, which now at the War Office controlled tank design and production, a committee whose three military members had not even seen a tank until a few weeks previously. The program of building 4,000 tanks for the next year's campaign was then cut down by two-thirds. And in October, under pressure from the generals, Stern was removed from his post at the Ministry of Munitions and replaced by an admiral who had not seen a tank at all. The general staff would seem to have profited from contact with their French colleagues, and to have learnt that the most important point when proved wrong is to get rid of the uncomfortable prophet who has proved right. Just as Swinton was sacrificed to balance for the general staff's folly in launching the first model into the Somme battle, so Stern seems to have been chosen to expiate the folly of throwing the next model into the swamps of Pass Kendale. Instead of losing faith in their own judgment the general staff again lost faith in the tank. Happily, the younger regular soldiers who had taken charge of the tanks at the front had overcome their first doubts and, realizing the stupidity of Pass L, fought for the chance to give the tanks a fair trial. They obtained it at Cambrai in November, a battle which at last fulfilled the pattern designed in February, 1916. Although, for want of the resources wasted at Pass L, the victory itself was but a tinsel crown, it yielded the tanks a solid crown which none could any longer dispute. As 1917 was the year of vindication, so 1918 proved the year of triumph. Yet it is a sobering reflection that the price in lives might have been cheaper if tanks had been available in thousands instead of hundreds. The numbers manufactured under the reduced program of 1917 sufficed to bring victory, but they could not bring back the dead. May the tank's hard childhood be an object lesson for future generations so that if war engulfs them they may learn by the experience of others and not at their own cost. Six scene 5 Romania swallowed Romania entered the war on August 27, 1916, and the fall of Bucharest on December 6, 1916, marked the virtual extinction of her war efforts and of the misplaced exhilaration which had greeted her entry on the side of the Allies. Less known and less studied than almost any other campaign of the world struggle, it is a special interest, and deserves far more attention than it has received, because it epitomized the Allies' fundamental weakness and the Germans' strength, the evils inherent in a co-partnership system of conducting war as opposed to the concentration of effort and economy of force which springs from a single control. Nor is this the sum of its lessons? There are others which have more practical value, because more easily remedied. It revealed the fallacy of numbers, and the much abused Napoleonic saying that God is on the side of the big battalions received yet another historical contradiction from the Alexandrine principle of quality rather than quantity. Once again the blend of superior hitting power with superior mobility played havoc with an army which pinned its faith to weight of human bodies. Moreover, the swift three months' conquest of Romania has a particular value for British study, because it was essentially a war of movement, carried out under the difficult natural conditions, topographical and climatic, for which the small British army is trained and has to be prepared. During the preceding years of the war, public opinion in Romania had gradually consolidated in favour of intervention on the Allies' side, 
and the friendly sentiments of Jonsku and Philipsku found a powerful lever in the people's desire to rescue their kinsmen in Transylvania from a foreign rule far more drastic than Alsace Lorraine had suffered. At last, in the summer of 1916, the spectacular, but, as we now know, superficial successes of the Russian advance under Bruzlov encouraged Romania to take the decisive step, into the abyss. She might have fared better if she had declared war earlier, when Serbia was still an active force and Russia a real one. The two years of preparation had doubled the numbers of the Romanian army, but in reality reduced its relative efficiency, for while her foes, under the pressure of hard experience, had developed their means of firepower and equipment, Romania's isolation and the incapacity of her military leadership had combined to prevent the transformation of her army from a militia of bayontmen into a modern force. Her infantry had no automatic rifles, gas equipment, trench mortars, and few machine guns, in the ten active divisions only the usual pre-war proportion of two per battalion, and of the thirteen new divisions eight had none at all. Her artillery was inadequate, and her air force negligible. She had only six weeks supply of ammunition at the start, an explosion in the Bucharest arsenal had destroyed nine million rounds of small arm ammunition, and her allies failed to maintain the daily supply of 300 tons which they had promised. And the unwieldy size of her divisions, added to the indifferent quality of her corps of officers, was in itself a break on mobile operations. Her strategical situation was another source of weakness, her territory forming an L reversed, with the bottom section, Wallachia, sandwiched between Transylvania and Bulgaria. Moreover, the length of her frontier was out of all proportion to the depth of the country, she suffered a shortage of lateral railways, and the capital was within 30 miles of the Bulgarian frontier. Further, she had in the Dobrua, on the other side of the Danube, a backyard strip which offered an easy way of access. These internal and geographical handicaps were accentuated by the divergent counsels of her allies as to her action. While the British general staff favoured a southward advance against Bulgaria which might have crushed the latter between the Romanians and the Salonica army, the Russians urged a westward advance which would, in theory, be in closer cooperation with their Bukovina advance. The political and moral advantages of a move into Transylvania led the Romanians to adopt the second course, and bitter as the upshot was, their folly is not so certain as their critics have suggested. The Bulgarian territory offered many obstacles to an effective invasion by such a defective instrument as the Romanian army proved, and they had ample ground to doubt the energy of Sarail in pushing forward to meet them. On the other hand, we now know that a more rapid invasion of Transylvania by the Romanians would have put the Austro-Germans in a grave position, and that even with the breathing space they were unluckily given they were almost at their wit's sent to scrape together forces for this new front. Romania's fault was less in her choice of objective than in her incapacity to strike for it rapidly and forcefully. The Romanian advance began, on the night of August 27th to 28th, with three main columns, each of about four divisions, moving in a general northwesterly direction through the Carpathian passes, the conception being to pivot on the left and wheel the right up into line facing west when the Hungarian plain was gained. Three divisions were left to guard the Danube, and three more in the Dobrua backyard, where there also the Russians had promised to send one cavalry and two infantry divisions. The Romanians' stipulation originally had been for a force of 150,000 Russians. The slow and cautious advance of the Romanian columns, hampered by the bad mountain roads and the Austrian destruction of bridges, but not by resistance, withheld danger from the five weak Austrian divisions which covered the frontier and enabled the Supreme Command to bring up five German and two Austrian divisions and concentrate them on the line of the River Meros ready for a counter offensive. In fulfillment of the other half of Falkenhayn's plan, a Bulgarian force of two divisions, and two more to follow, with a German detachment and an Austrian bridging train, was placed under Mackenzie to invade the Dobrua. Falkenhayn adds that preparations were made for the abundant equipment of Mackenzie's army with such weapons, not yet known to the Romanians, as heavy artillery, mine throwers, gas. Thus, 
at the outset, Romania had 23 divisions against 7, but within a week she would have 16 against her, so that her chances of success turned on the rapidity of her action. While her columns were creeping westward into Transylvania, Mackenzie stormed the Turch Ukia bridgehead on September 5 destroyed the three Romanian divisions which covered the Danube front, and then, with his flank secure, pressed eastwards into the Dobrua. It was a shrewd moral blow, for the automatic strategic effect was to draw away the Romanian reserves intended to support the Transylvanian offensive, and so check its progress for want of nourishment. And the dispersion left them weak everywhere. Thus on September 18, when Falkenhayn arrived to conduct the Austro-German offensive in Transylvania, he found the Romanian advance almost at a standstill, and their columns widely separated over a 200-mile front. One must mention that Falkenhayn had now been replaced in the supreme command by Hindenburg, and Ludendorff, and given this executive command as a consolation. Falkenhayn's decision was first to concentrate against the Romanian southern column, which had crossed the Rotherturn Pass, while using smaller forces to hold off the other columns. Even allowing for his superior information. He took bold risks and suffered anxious moments before success, as so often in war, favored the brave. The Alpine Corps, by a 50-mile march in three days over the mountains, turned the Romanians' southern flank, and combined with the skillful maneuver of the reserves in the direct attack to throw back the Romanians from Sibiu, Hermannstadt, and force them to retreat through the mountains. His next move was facilitated by the fact that the Romanian higher command, like Napoleon's opponents, saw too many things at once. They kept their Transylvanian armies inactive while diverting their reserves for an abortive attempt to force a crossing of the Danube at Rakovo and take Mackenzie in rear. This enabled Falkenhayn to concentrate against the Romanian center column at Brasov, Kronstadt, and by October 9 he had driven this back in turn, but he missed his greater goal of encircling and destroying it which would have opened a clear passage into Romania. The mischance jeopardized the whole German plan and almost saved Romania, for with all the passes through the mountain barriers still in their hands, her troops sturdily repulsed the Austro-German efforts to press through on their heels, and compelled them to wait for reinforcements. A prompt attempt by Falkenhayn to swing farther south and force away by the Vulcan and Zerduk passes was also stopped and the beginning of the winter snows was on the point of blocking operations when a concentrated last-minute effort at the same point, November 11th to 17th, broke through to Targaju. A rapid pursuit through the Wallachian plain hustled the Romanians back to the line of the Alt. It was the signal for the next move in the ably coordinated plan. Mackenzie, leaving only a fraction to hold the northerly part of the Dobrua, withdrew the bulk of his forces westwards to Sistovo, where, on November 23, he forced the crossing of the Danube and automatically turned the flank of the Romanian line on the Alt. A prompt and well-planned Romanian counter-stroke, inspired by General Preysen, their new chief of the general staff, for a brief time threatened danger to Mackenzie's force and almost enveloped its flank. But once the counterstroke was parried the converging pressure of Mackenzie and Falkenhayn proved too great for the Romanians' last desperate resistance on the line of the Argesu, and on December 6 the Austro-Germans entered Bucharest, the pursuit pressed the Romanians and the Russians, whose action in the Bobrua had been ineffectual, rapidly back to the Serith Black Sea line. The greater part of Romania, with its wheat and oil, lay under the heel of the invader, and the Romanian army was crippled, while her allies had suffered a moral setback greater than any material advantage for which they might have hoped from her intervention. For military history, this brief campaign furnished an object lesson that men do not count more than machines, but instead, that the better machine controlled by a better man, the commander, can discount the value of big battalions. Weapons and training count far more than mere numbers. Six scene six the capture of Baghdad entry of the British into Baghdad on March 11, 1917, was an event which impressed the imagination of the whole world, 
both because of the romantic appeal of the famed city of the Arabian Nights, and because it symbolized the first streaks of dawn coming to illumine the darkness which had lain like a pall over the Allied cause throughout 1916. If the historical data that are now available dim the radiance of popular impressions, revealing that the military achievement was less striking than it appeared at the time, the moral significance and value cannot be minimized. But in justice to those who earlier fought and failed, it is well to realize the fallacy underlying this contemporary public view that the operations which led to the fall of Baghdad were as white as those which culminated in the surrender of Kit were black. The strategy and organization of the campaign were infinitely more sound and more sure, but on the lower scale of tactical execution, the record of the advance is spotted with missed opportunities, despite an overwhelming preponderance of force. While recognizing the difficulties of the country, the historian cannot but feel that a sledgehammer was used to crush a flea, and the flea escaped being crushed. And if quality rather than quantity be the test of a feat of arms, comparison suggests that the advance and retreat of Town Chen's original 6th Division, in face of superior numbers, with inadequate equipment, primitive communications, and utterly isolated in the heart of an enemy country, forged an intrinsically final link in the chain of British military history. Credit for the 1917 success is due, above all, to the strategical direction, and to the ability and energy of those who put the organization of supplies and transport on a sound and efficient basis. These assets, moreover, sufficed to attain the military goal, without any further uneconomic drain on the forces in the more vital theaters of war. The general direction was now transferred to Whitehall. After the surrender of Town Shendadkut, despite the gallant but costly efforts to relieve him, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, Sir William Robertson, was emphatically in favor of a defensive strategy in Mesopotamia. He inclined to adopt a withdrawal to Amara as the simplest and cheapest way of safeguarding the oil fields, and of commanding the two river arteries, the Tigris and Euphrates. But the new commander, Maud, who had been Robertson's own choice, maintained, after examination, that the advanced position at Kut was both militarily secure and politically wise. He was supported by Duff and Munro, the successive commanders in chief in India, and Robertson gave way, accepting the judgment of the man on the spot. There is profound psychological interest in studying how the strong personality of Maud and the military results which, step by step, he obtained, combined to change this defensive policy, almost imperceptibly, into a fresh offensive policy. The mirage of Russian cooperation had also an influence, for, beginning as a mere supplementary aid to a Russian offensive, the advance became an all-British achievement. The whole summer and autumn of 1916 were devoted to thorough reorganization and preparation, initiated by Lake but greatly expanded and intensified by his successor, Maud. He strove to ameliorate the condition of the troops, to improve both their health and training, to develop the precarious lines of communication, and to amass a large reserve of supplies and ammunition. Thus Maud ably established a secure base for his subsequent and sustained offensive, fulfilling Napoleon's maxim. The design of his plan of operations was equally admirable blending boldness and circumspection. A study of his orders, both initial and during operations, shows that the lack of decisiveness cannot be charged to his want of energy. Where he tended to err was in excessive centralization and secrecy. If the latter is usually a fault on the right side, it seems here to have been partly responsible for the pause at Azizia, on the advance to Baghdad for his inspector general of communications had to complain that even he had not been given warning that such a move was intended, and thus he had made no special preparations in readiness. This imperceptible offensive began on December 12, 1916, the first step in a series of well-thought-out trench nibbles, methodical and deliberate, on the west bank of the Tigris. When it began, Maud faced the Turkish trenches at a right angle to the Tigris, and gradually brought his left shoulder up, pivoting on the river, and at the same time extending his front farther and farther upstream. At last by February 22, 1917, 
he had cleared the west bank, his extended line facing the main Turkish forces on the other bank, from Sanayat to the Shumran bend above Kut. Thus the Turks had not merely to guard against a direct attack from the south upon their fortified position at Sanayat, but against a cross-river blow from the west, which might cut their communications. The length of this patient siege warfare process was not merely due to the intricacy of the defences or the stubborn resistance of the weak Turkish detachments on the West Bank. Robertson had no taste for further adventures, and his instructions from home were framed to prevent them. The historian who studies the orders and operations gains the impression that Maud's operations were contrived, consciously or unconsciously, to undermine the stability not merely of the Turkish position, but of Robertson's instructions. The outcome of these deliberate and economical operations was that by the third week in February Maud was able, and admirably placed, to play for a bigger stake. His plan was to pin the Turks left at Sanayat while he sprang at their communications, by forcing the river crossing at the Shumran Bend, where the right flank ended and their line of retreat prolonged their line of battle. Wisely he realized that a mere feint at Sanayat was useless and that a real simultaneous menace to both extremities was essential if the Turkish force was to be held while it was being cut off. Unhappily his purpose was not fulfilled. Splendid as was the gallantry of the troops at the Shumran crossing, the difficulty of the task made progress slow, and the Sanayat attack could not pin the defenders long enough. Even so, the Turks were placed in such peril that, as they confess, only the slowness of the enemy saved them from disaster. The main cause was the tardy and feeble action of the cavalry in pursuit, partly due to Maud's too strict control, partly to the cavalry commander's want of energy and initiative, and partly to the inherent vulnerability of cavalry under modern conditions. On February 24, when there was a splendid opportunity of turning retreat into rout, the cavalry division broke off to go back to bivouac at 7 p.m., after a mere 23 casualties. And on subsequent days they were no more effective. The excuses offered are the need to water and the obstacle of modern firearms, and their admission rather accentuates than impairs the lesson as to the restricted modern value of cavalry, even in Asia. Only the daring pursuit of the naval flotilla disturbed the Turks' orderly retreat acting on the river as a few cross-country armoured cars might have done on land. The strategic victory had at least one more sanction for an attempt to gain Baghdad, and on March 5 his advance from Azizia began. When a check came at the line of the Diyala, Maud switched the cavalry division and 7th Corps to the West Bank, for an outflanking move direct on Baghdad. More mistakes enabled the Turks to hold up this menace, but realizing their hopeless inferiority of strength and the inevitable end, against two powerful converging advances, they gave up Baghdad on the night of March 10, and retired northward up the river. Next afternoon Maud entered the city, and another name was added to the role of Baghdad's innumerable conquerors. For the prestige of Britain and the morale of all the Allies the capture was an invaluable stimulant worth the immediate effort, if not the sum of the efforts which had gone to fill the debit side of the victor's balance sheet. Six scene seven the Battle of Blind Man's Buff, Jutland only once during over four years of war did the Grand Fleet of Britain and the High Seas Fleet of Germany meet. It would be more exact to say that they hailed each other in passing dash with a hail that was awe-inspiring but leaving an impression that was merely pen-inspiring. No battle in all history has spilt so much, ink. On the afternoon of May 31, 1916, the fleet that had been built to dispute the mastery of the sea stumbled into the fleet that had held it for centuries. In the early evening these two fleets, the greatest the world had seen, groped towards each other, touched, broke away, touched again and broke away again. Then darkness fell between them. And when the glorious 1st of June dawned a sorely puzzled Grand Fleet paraded on an empty sea. A fundamental difference between the higher naval and military leadership in the World War was that the admirals would not give battle unless sure of an initial advantage, and perhaps not then, whereas the generals were usually ready to take the offensive whatever the disadvantages. In this attitude the admirals were true to their art, the generals were not. 
The sole reason for employing men who have made war their profession is the presumption that by training they have acquired a mastery of their art. Anyone with sufficient authority or inspiration can lead or push men to battle, especially if he is furnished with technically trained assistants who can help him to regulate the marshalling of the forces in movement and fire. For this shepherding of sheep to the slaughter, perhaps artful but essentially inartistic, a practiced demagogue would have a definite superiority over the tongue-tied professional warrior. But the custom of employing a professional is based on the idea that through art he will be able to obtain more profit at less cost. Only one consideration should override a commander's fidelity to the fundamental truths which govern his art, and that is national expediency. It is for the government, and not for its employee, to decide whether the needs of policy compel a sacrifice of art and the consequent sacrifice of lives. Curiously, however, in the World War the generals were so full of the lust of battle that they voluntarily sacrificed art, and repeatedly sought battle at a disadvantage against the wishes of a government reluctantly dragged in their wake. The admirals, in contrast, were so faithful to their art that they sometimes ignored or evaded the express wish of the government for battle even without an assured advantage. If their sense of reality was refreshing, it tended to throw a heavier burden of expense on the armies, although it is fair to point out that this might not have occurred if the generals had not been so extravagantly eager to shoulder it. Perhaps one explanation of the difference was that the admirals exercised their command in the forefront of the battle and the generals from headquarters far in rear. This does not imply that the difference was merely a matter of the physical courage required, for some generals were as ready to risk their own lives as their men's while others undoubtedly gained moral courage through physical remoteness. But, undoubtedly, imagination and sense of reality are quickened by personal contact with the situation, a commander so placed is better able to appreciate where the advantage lies and when it fades, quicker, also, to recognize the impossible. It would be natural to expect as a result of this difference that sailors would have a bias towards tactics, soldiers towards strategy. Actually, the reverse occurred. The explanation of the paradox would seem to lie in the different experience of peace training, wherein the soldier serves in small garrisons and exercises in cramped areas, while the sailor traverses the wide oceans and learns navigation as the staple of his craft. For him, geography precedes gunnery. From the outbreak of war, British naval strategy was governed, rightly by the appreciation of the fact that maintenance of sea supremacy was even more vital than defeat of the German fleet. Instantaneously, that sea supremacy had come into force and upon it was based the whole war effort of Britain, and her allies, because upon it depended the very existence of Britain. Churchill has epitomized the issue in a graphic phrase dash Jellicoe was the only man on either side who could lose the war in an afternoon. Hence the aim and desire to defeat the German fleet was always subsidiary. If it could be achieved it might do much to hasten the victory of the Allies. It might even prevent their defeat. The collapse of Russia as well as the near starvation of Britain by the U-boats may well be traced to the inability of the British Navy to crush the German fleet. But if, in trying to defeat the German fleet, the British lost so heavily as to lose its strategic superiority national defeat would be certain. The aim of German naval strategy since August, 1914, had been to avoid the risk of a decisive action until the British fleet was so weakened that the prospect of success veered from gloomy to fair. Mines and torpedoes were the means on which the Germans relied to achieve this preliminary weakening. And it was the fear of such underwater weapons, the possibility that by trap or chance they might dramatically alter the balance of strength, which infused an extra degree of caution into the British strategy of precaution. In a letter of prophetic foresight on October 14, 1914, Jellicoe had warned the Admiralty that if a chance of battle came he would regard the turning away of the German battle fleet as a sign that it was trying to lure him into such a trap, where mines and submarines lay in wait that he would refuse to be drawn into it and, instead, would move quickly to a flank. In other words, he would sidestep to avoid the chance of being surprised, and so not only disarm the enemy of his best potential weapon, but possibly throw him off his balance. 
The calculation is an indication of how thoroughly Jellicoe had thought out his theory of war, up to a point. Both the German and the British strategic keynotes were well attuned to the reality of their respective conditions, the question remains whether more energy and subtlety could have been shown in executing them. The situation in May 1916, after nearly two years of war, was that the British fleet was still waiting for a favorable chance of battle and the German fleet was further away from the attainment of its preliminary aim of weakening the British. Despite a few losses due to mines and torpedoes, the British fleet was proportionately much stronger than at the beginning. In the coming clash it was to bring 37 capital ships, battleships and battle cruisers, of the dreadnought type against the German 23 and in gunpower the margin was still greater, 168 guns of 13.5 to 15 inch caliber and 104 of 12 inch could be brought against 176 German guns of only 12 inch caliber. It is true that the German fleet also included six pre-dreadnought battleships, but in a fleet action these would be little better than a target for the heavier guns of the British. Moreover, by their presence they reduced the already slower German fleet to a still more marked inferiority in speed. The British had also a comfortable superiority in cruisers and destroyers, 8 armoured and 26 light cruisers, against 11 of the last, 80 destroyers against 63. Another advantage gained since the outbreak of war was in the sphere of knowledge. For the British had not only gained from occasional contacts a clearer idea of the capacity of the enemy's weapons, but had discovered his signal code. In August, 1914, the German light cruiser Magdeburg had been sunk in the Baltic, and clasped in the arms of a drowned under-officer the Russians had found the cipher and signal books of the German navy, as well as their squared maps of the North Sea. These were sent to London and thereafter, by intercepting the enemy's enciphered wireless messages, the British intelligence was able to obtain advance information of many of the enemy's movements. Although suspicion led the enemy to make variations in their codes and maps, their efforts to seal up the leakage of information were offset by the development of directional wireless as a means of locating the position of ships. And this was the source of the one naval battle of the war, Jutland. In January, 1916, a new commander was appointed to the German High Seas Fleet. This was Admiral Sheer, the nominee of Admiral von Tirpitz, and an advocate of a more aggressive war policy. The pressure of the British blockade and the relaxation of the German submarine blockade, under pressure from President Wilson, combined to provide an urge to action. And a rumored division of the British fleet, to protect the coast from raids came as an encouragement to action. In mid-May Sheer crystallized his plan. A cruiser raid on Sunderland was intended to draw out part of the British fleet to counter it, and lying in wait for this detachment would be the German submarines with the high seas fleet behind, ready to pounce. The submarines were duly dispatched, but bad weather prevented reconnaissance by the German airships. Without this safeguard Sheer would not move, and thus the submarines exhausted their seagoing endurance. On May 30, Sheer decided to abandon his plan, and the use of his submarines, for an alternative. This was to send the scouting force, of battle and light cruisers, under Admiral Hipper, to demonstrate off the Norwegian coast, while he followed, out of sight. He calculated that the danger to the British cruiser patrol and shipping might draw part of the British fleet to the spot and give him a chance to destroy it. Hipper steamed north early in the morning of the 31st, with Sheer 50 miles astern. Already, the previous evening, the impending departure of the Germans, although not their purpose, was known to the British Admiralty, and the Grand Fleet was ordered to sea. Jellicoe with the main section of the fleet sail eastward by 10.30 pm for a rendezvous some 50 miles off the Norwegian coast, being joined on the way by Jerem's squadron from Invaghorden. Beatty with the battle cruisers, reinforced by four of the latest Queen Elizabeth type battleships, sailed simultaneously from Rosyth, near Edinburgh, with orders from Jellicoe to reach by 2 p.m. on the 31st to spot 69 miles south-southeast of the main rendezvous. From this, 
If no enemy had yet been sighted, Jellico would sweep southwards toward Heligoland Bight, while BT was ordered to close to within sight of him. BT reached his own rendezvous at the assigned hour and was just turning north towards Jellico when the Galatea, one of his screen of light cruisers, sighted a stray merchant steamer and, instead of turning with the rest, continued east southeast to examine her. This was the first of many jests of fate. For simultaneously a German light cruiser, screening hip as western flank, also sighted the steamer and decided to investigate. Within a few moments the two unsuspecting rivals had sighted each other, and warned their respective superiors. Thereby the strange steamer not only brought on the Battle of Jutland, but probably cost the British a decisive victory. For if this chance meeting had not occurred, the two forces might not have met until they were farther north, when the Germans would have been farther from shelter and nearer the jaws of Jellicoe. Minutes were now to be momentous. Controversy as to their use has been acrid, but much of the criticism on both sides seems pedantic, more apt for the proverbial armchairs, although here occupied by professional sailors, than for the vague conditions in the North Sea on the afternoon of May 31, 1916. At 2.20 pm, the Glatea signaled enemy in sight. Two cruisers, probably hostile, bearing southeast, course unknown. The sound of guns from the distant Galatea had just been heard when at 2.32 pm BT turned again southeastwards to cut off the retreat of the enemy cruisers. Unfortunately, his signal to turn, made by flags, was not read owing to smoke and want of wind by Evan Thomas' squadron of battleships which had been following five miles astern. In consequence Evan Thomas did not turn until 2.40 pm and thereby found himself 10 miles behind Beatty's battle cruisers. It has been argued that the signal should have been made, more simply and effectively, by searchlight flashes, an argument that seems irrefutable. It has been argued that Evan Thomas should have turned on his own initiative, as he must have seen Beatty turning an argument which seems highly disputable in view of his general orders and his ignorance of Beatty's tactical intentions. On the other side, it has been contended, first, that Beatty himself should have acted earlier, second, that he should also have given Evan Thomas the chance to close up to him, either by continuing on his northward course while Evan Thomas was turning or, still better, by swinging towards him before turning. But this ideal perhaps unduly discounts the conditions, physical and psychological. Both Jellico and Beatty had been steaming leisurely, with hope of an encounter waning as the hours passed, and all the more because the Admiralty had signalled that, by directional wireless, the enemy fleet had been located still at its anchorage. Yet another unlucky mishap. If fair account be taken of the hazy situation, Beatty would seem to have taken his decision with all reasonable promptness. As for the decision itself he had every reason, from past experience, to fear that the German cruisers would give him the slip, and little reason to suspect that they masked a greater force. At the most he might meet the German battle cruisers, and they were only five in all, while he had six. If his temperament was impetuous rather than calculating, both past experience and the general strategic situation would here seem to justify his action in forfeiting extra strength to gain extra minutes. Finding that the enemy cruisers were apparently following the Galatea northwestwards, Beatty himself gradually changed his course until he was steaming northeast. Thereby he and Hippo were converging towards each other and about 3.30 pm they came in sight of each other. Hippo promptly turned to fall back towards his own battle fleet and Beatty duly turned on a parallel course. At 3.45 pm both sides opened fire at a range of about 9 miles. Owing to bad light the British miscalculated the range, and so not only lost the advantage that their guns outranged the Germans, but made poor shooting. In contrast, the British were silhouetted against the western sky. Just after 4 p.m. catastrophe burst upon the British. A shell from the Lutzow, Hipper's flagship, plunged into the midship turret of the Lion, Beatty's flagship. With both legs shattered, 
Major Harvey of the Marines managed before he died to call down the voice tube the order to flood the magazines, and thereby save the ship from being blown up. But the indefatigable, hit by a salvo of three shells from the Vendette Anne, dropped out of the line and, hit again, turned over and sank with one thousand men. Fortunately, at this critical moment, Evan Thomas, by cutting the corners, had come within range, and his accurate fire disturbed the accuracy of the German's dash although the poor quality of the British shells, which burst without penetrating their armor, saved the Germans from vital injury. And at 4.26 pm they scored afresh, when the battle cruiser Queen Mary, hit by a salvo, blew up and sank with her crew of 1,200, her grave and their grave marked by a gigantic pall of smoke 800 feet high. Thus PT was reduced from six ships to four, against five. About this time also, the Princess Royal vanished momentarily in an ominous cloud of smoke and spray, and a signalman on the Lion laconically reported, Princess Royal blown up, sir. Whereupon Beatty is curtly said to his flag Captain Dash Chatfield, there seems to be something wrong with our damned ships today. Turn two points to port Dash nearer the enemy. It was a tribute to his cool nerve, although the crisis had really passed with the entry of Evan Thomas into the fight. That entry marred the trap which Sheer was planning for Beatty. For instead of steering to catch Beatty between the two jaws formed by Hipper and his own main fleet, here was forced to steam direct to Hipper's A. At 4.33 pm, good enough slight cruiser squadron, two miles ahead of the Lion, sighted battleships to the southeast, and signaled the news to BT. Good enough boldly held to his course until he could definitely identify the high seas fleet and then sent a wireless message direct to Jellico who had already quickened his pace towards BT. BT also held his course until he had sighted Sears battleships and then at 4.40 pm, turned about to run north towards Jellico. The turn was well timed to let BT's force, now the bait, be seen by Sears without letting it come within range of Sears guns. But the signal to turn, again made by flags, was again missed by Evan Thomas, who held to his southward course until he had passed Beatty running north. Thereby he came under fire from Sears leading battleships, and became both the bait to Sear and the shield to Beatty during the run north. Danger during Beatty's turn, which was made in succession round a fixed point, was partly averted by the disconcerting and gallant attacks of the British destroyers. Two had been crippled and, drifting helplessly between the oncoming lines of battleships, with glorious impudence fired their last torpedoes before they were riven by shells. German destroyers chivalrously stopped to pick up the survivors. Meantime the two great fleets were rushing towards each other, Sir in ignorance, Jellico in knowledge of his enemy's approach, but not of his exact course. But upon such detailed knowledge Jellico's own dispositions must depend. Unfortunately the haze over the North Sea was mental as well as physical. Beatty, leading the run north, had lost touch with Sears' fleet and even with Hippers, which was steaming roughly parallel to him in the mist. And although Evan Thomas was still in touch with Sear he sent no reports. The only messages Jellico received came at the very start of the retirement, four from Good Enough and one from Beatty, whose wireless had been shot away so that he had to transmit the message through a third ship. But the importance of this lack of information of the enemy can be, and has been, exaggerated. For the German fleet did not vary its course and the real trouble came from British error in reckoning their own position, on the part of both Jellicoe's and Beatty's flagships. The result was that when the two came in sight of each other the Lion was found to be some seven miles farther west than Jellicoe had anticipated. and. As a corollary, the enemy also were sighted on the starboard bow, that is, on Jellicoe's right front instead of straight ahead. More frequent reports of the position of Beatty's fleet might have provided, through averaging, a more accurate reckoning. Jellicoe was advancing south in a compact mass of six parallel columns, like a six pronged comb, four miles wide from flank to flank. This is not a fighting formation, 
for only a minimum of the total guns would be able to fire, forward, if an enemy was met. To deliver the maximum fire the ships must bring their broadsides to bear, and must form into line of battle. If the enemy were found directly ahead each column had only to wheel to the right or left for the whole fleet to be in line, firing their broadsides at the enemy. The Grand Fleet only required four minutes to make this deployment, but it required that the enemy should be in exactly the right position. An alternative method, if the enemy lay to a flank, was for one of the columns, normally a wing column, to steam on while the remainder wheeled to follow in its wake. In this case the fleet would still be able to form a single chain within four minutes, but would take much longer to straighten their line. Let us now see what actually happened. Jellicke had dispatched the third battle cruiser squadron, Hood, to support Beatty, but owing to the error in reckoning already mentioned it moved too far eastward. Thereby it became unintentionally the upper jaw of a trap into which the unconscious Hipper was putting his head. Hipper meantime was still running parallel to, but out of sight of, Beatty. At 5.40 pm Hipper suddenly sighted Beatty afresh, to the westward, and coming under fire, swerved more to the eastward. Then he heard Hood's guns opening fire on his light cruisers. Alarmed, he turned away to the southeast at 6.34 pm, only to see his light cruisers attacked by four of Hood's destroyers, which he imagined to be the forerunners of Jellicoe's main fleet. So he swerved again, to the southwest. Meantime, Jellicoe and Beatty had not sighted each other until just before 6 pm, although their advanced cruisers had made visual contact at 5.30 pm, when about 5 miles apart. At 6.1 pm Jellicoe flashed the question dash where is the enemy's battle fleet? No answer came. BT was busily intent on his own disappearing opponent, Hipper, following him on a long outer curve which, incidentally, was carrying BT across Jellicoe's front. At 6.10 pm Jellicoe repeated his question and four minutes later BT, almost simultaneously with Evan Thomas, reported the enemy's bearing. The two reports enabled Jellicoe to judge Sears' rough position, although not the course he was steering, which, actually, was northwestward in Hipper's wake. Within a minute of Beatty's report Jellicoe had made his decision and given the order to deploy, on his left wing. Two minutes later his right wing opened fire, as it was wheeling to the left. It has been argued that he should have deployed earlier, but this would have meant acting on uncertain information, and the risk of putting himself in an unfavorable position. It has been argued that he should have deployed on his right, but this would have meant the risk that the enemy crossed the head of his line before he could cross theirs, and the certainty that until the line was straightened out, 22 minutes later, only a part, if a growing part, of his fleet could fire. It has been argued, by Churchill, that he might have deployed on one of the center divisions and thereby have saved seven minutes, besides gaining the advantage of deploying within closer, yet not too close reach to the oncoming foe. This, however, was a maneuver rather more complex and less practiced, and would at least have meant that the fire of the left fork of the tail was temporarily masked. Jellicoe's actual deployment ensured that he would have time to cross the head of the enemy's line. The historic and deadly maneuver of crossing the T- and also that none of his battleships would have their fire masked by others while the chain was straightening. Nor does there seem much actual substance in the criticism that a chance was lost by deploying farther away from the enemy. Rather was it gained. Fossier had no intention of fighting the Grand Fleet unless at an advantage. Thus he no sooner saw that Jellicoe's line, obscured for a time by the smoke of the cruiser action in the intervening space, was likely to cross the T than he made, at 6.30 pm, an instant turnabout. This was a deft emergency maneuver whereby each ship, beginning from the rear, began to turn in almost simultaneous succession, it enabled the whole line to slip out of range in the minimum time. His precipitancy was due to the fact that he mistook Hood's battle cruisers for Jellicoe's leading battleships, and so thought the British maneuver was further advanced than in reality. His mistake was to his opponent's disadvantage.
Forgelike had signaled at 6.29 pm for his line to turn south southeast by subdivisions, in order to get closer to the enemy, but had cancelled the order on finding that his tail had not yet straightened out. Nor had it done so when Sear made his somersault turn, under cover of a torpedo attack and a smoke screen. This hit Sear's retirement for the few minutes before he was swallowed up in the mist. Although several of his leading battleships had suffered heavy hits, the only complete loss had been one of Hipper's light cruisers, the V Spaden. And, before disappearing, Hipper had destroyed another British battle cruiser, the Invincible, and one armoured cruiser, and had left a second sinking dot. But the potentially vital fact in Sears' retirement was that he had turned westward, away from his own harbours. If he had sighted the British battle fleet on his flank, as would have happened if Jellicoe had deployed in any other way, the natural course for Sear would have been, not to turn about, but to turn right, and so retire towards his own harbours. Thus the best justification for Jellicoe's choice is that it gave him the opportunity to cut off Sear's path of retreat. It also placed Sear against the western sky. This opportunity Jellicoe promptly exploited. To give direct chase to Sear, when his own line was already six miles astern of Sear, and only two hours daylight remained, was a move that promised little. It would also have exposed the battle fleet to the very risk of running into mines dropped and torpedoes fired by the enemy, which Jellicoe was intent to avoid. Instead, at 6.44 pm he ordered each division to turn southeast, so that they were once more in six columns eckland back like a staircase from left to right. In the next quarter of an hour he made two more partial turns. The effect was to bring him round in a gradual curve between the unseen Germans and their line of retreat, while edging closer to them. Only the coming darkness and the increasing mist threatened the advantage gained by his skillful maneuver. One criticism, however, appears reasonable, that, either on Beatty's initiative or Jellicoe's orders, the battle cruiser fleet, whose essential role was that of feelers for the battle fleet, might have swung round more sharply and sought to keep touch with the enemy. Actually, the battle cruisers were farther away than the battle fleet from the enemy. The enemy, however, was about to make touch himself, to his own danger. Having slipped out of one trap he almost slipped into another, created mainly by his own miscalculation. For, after steaming west for about twenty minutes, Sear suddenly reversed his direction and steamed east again, to appear out of the mist at about the same point as before. He claimed in his subsequent dispatch that his idea was to strike a second blow so as to keep the initiative, and maintain German prestige. The claim is at his own expense, for no good tactician would steam into the middle of the superior British fleet for such a purpose. The logical hypothesis is that he expected to cross the tail of the British fleet thereby gaining the chance to punish part of it and regaining his path home. For, as already mentioned, he had mistaken Hood's squadron for the van of the battle fleet and so he overestimated the distance that the battle fleet had moved. Hence, when Sear appeared out of the mist at 7.10 pm he was opposite the center of the stepped British line. Its rear squadron, being nearest, opened fire first, at a range of only about five miles. Within the next few minutes the greater part of the British fleet joined in. But with a perhaps excessive fear of partial exposure, Jellicoe ordered his rear squadrons to form astern of him, in non-technical language, to wheel eastward and follow in his wake. Thereby he drew them farther away from the enemy. And at this moment Sear had also decided to go away. Indeed, he was in such a hurry to get out of Jellicoe's jaws that he not only performed a fresh somersault maneuver, less neat than before, under cover of smoke screens and destroyer attacks, but also launched his battle cruisers in a death ride. The destroyers proved the most effective of these agents of his salvation, for seeing their torpedoes loosed, at long range, Jellicoe swung his ships away by two quick turns of two points each. 22.5 degrees in all. This turn away was a long practiced method which the majority opinion in the Navy approved as the best expedient, and only a minority opposed on the score that the torpedo danger was overrated, 
and that its adoption tended to abnegate the offensive value of the battleship. A decision between these opinions is difficult. One can only draw the logical conclusion that if the precaution was essential, it was a confession of the weakness of the battleship, and of the ease with which its offensive movements could be paralyzed by an infinitely less expensive instrument of war. At Jutland the justification for the precaution is that only one British battleship was hit by a torpedo, and the justification for the minority opinion is that this battleship was so little affected that it kept its place in the line. As a means of freeing the German fleet the destroyer attack was not only the most effective but the cheapest, for only one destroyer was sunk, by a counterstroke of the British light cruisers, while the German battle cruisers suffered heavily. The Lutzauer was disabled before the death ride began, and the other four were hit repeatedly in the few minutes before a signal of recall from Sierra reprieved them. The tactical effect of the destroyer attack was that while the German fleet was going west, the British fleet was going the opposite way. A quarter of an hour later, satisfied that the torpedo attack had spent itself, Jellica corrected his turn away, but continued on a course almost due south. Not until 8 p.m. did he turn west. In this delay there seems to be ground for criticism. For to maintain his tactical advantage of being across the enemy's line of retreat, it was desirable both to shepherd him away from his own coast and to keep in touch with him so that he had less chance of slipping past the British mobile barrier in the dark. By one school of criticism, much emphasis has been given to the fact that after sighting the enemy again at 7.40 BT, sent a further wireless signal to Jellico 10 minutes later dash submit van of battleships follow battle cruisers. We can then cut off whole of enemy's battle fleet. But excellent as this sounds, and was its meaning, its historical value is rather diminished by the fact that, before it was decoded and handed to him, Jellicke had already turned the battle fleet west, while Beatty was merely going southwest according to his last message. Moreover, the German fleet was already cut off from its space. Perhaps Beatty meant head off dash his own next order to his light cruisers, to locate the head of the enemy's line which was now steaming south, suggests this explanation. Moreover, he succeeded in heading off the enemy on his own, for when they came under his fire about 8.23 pm, they promptly sheared off to the westward again. And by checking their course south this encounter helped them in slipping past the British tail later. The best, indeed the only, chance of closing with the Germans had passed in the half hour following their 7.20 pm turn away. The great question that remained was whether Jellico could continue to bar their way during the night so that he could re-engage at dawn with a whole day's light before him, and thereby profit from his strategic advantage. Now added to superior strength. When the blanket of darkness spread across the sea about 9 pm it not merely accelerated the haziness of the day, but changed it to blindness. The battleships lost their advantage of range. The torpedo craft gained the advantage of coming to close range with minimum risk. And all ships would have difficulty in distinguishing friend from foe. Jellico wisely rejected the hazard of a night battle, for it would have meant staking his double advantage on a pure gamble. Thus his problem was to prevent the enemy finding an open way home during the five and a half hours before daylight. There were three likely routes, each leading to a swept channel through the minefields which covered the approaches to the Heligoland Bight and the German harbours. One, on the east, was past Horn Reefs and down the Frisian coast, a second, more central, eventually led past Heligoland, the third, in the extreme southwest, was entered near the German coast and led eastward past the mouth of the Ems. The distance to this was 180 miles and being the farthest it was the least obvious choice. Hence Jellico might justly fear that an astute enemy might take it, but for one factor. This was the inferior speed of the German fleet compared with his own. If the Germans had enjoyed equal or greater speed the Ems route would have offered them more chance and scope for evading an uncertain guard during the hours of darkness. Lacking it, they were wise to take the greater immediate risk of the short route. Jellico, however, was unwilling to uncover one completely in order to cover the others more closely. 
and he chose a beat which certainly reconciled as far as was possible the difficulties of covering all. Indeed, it left the Germans only one good chance, that of slipping behind Jellico and taking the Horn Reef's passage. Hence, one would anticipate that Jellico would be specially sensitive to any signs of an attempt to pass astern of him. At 9.17 pm, Jellico ordered the fleet to take up night cruising stations, the battleships being closed up in three parallel columns. The course of the fleet was to be due south and the speed 17 knots. The destroyers were massed 5 miles astern, a disposition which prolonged the moving barrier, protected the rear of the battle fleet against torpedo attacks, and, above all, prevented the risks of mistaken identity in the darkness. If the battleships sighted destroyers, or the destroyers battleships, each would know that the dim shapes were those of an enemy. BT had already taken station with the battle cruisers ahead of and on the western, or enemy, flank of the battle fleet. The historical significance of his night position is that it made impossible any attempt of the Germans to outstrip or pass south of the British, and so might have provided a further cause for sensitive suspicion of an attempt to pass astern. The formation of the Grand Fleet might be likened metaphorically and symbolically to that of the traditional British Lion. Beatty's battle cruisers and light cruisers being the nose and ears, and the destroyers, the lion's tail. The nose was to smell nothing, the ears to hear something, the tail to be twisted, but the lion as an entity to remain as majestically unmoved as those which surround Nelson's column. One preliminary remains to be mentioned, Sears intention. It was simple, not subtle, and to that extent simplified the problem of burying it. Desperation? at the morning's dire prospect, seems to have inspired it. For he took the shortest route home, by Horn Reefs, prepared to lose heavily but determined to break through. Unlike Jellico, he could at least feel that the luck lurking in a night encounter was more likely to be a friend than otherwise to his bold course. To enhance his prospects and safety he posted his lame battle cruisers and old battleships in rear and covered his van with destroyer and light cruiser tentacles. The scene was set. Would the monarchs of the seas, taking the call, clash in blind battle? Thus the anticipation. But only the tinkle of the jester's bell was heard from the darkened stage. And when light came, the stage was empty. The first tinkle came at 9.32 pm when the lion, Beatty's flagship, inquired by flashing lamp of the Princess Royal Dash, Please give me challenge and reply now in force as they have been lost. The reply seems to have been seen, in part, by an enemy ship. For, about half an hour later, several cruisers were sighted by the caster, which was leading one of the British destroyer flotillas. They took the initiative and challenged her by making part of the British secret challenge for the day. As, however, they next switched on their searchlights and opened fire, the caster replied in a similar unfriendly fashion, but several of her attendant destroyers withheld their torpedoes from a natural doubt as to the true identity of the cruisers. But the effect of this mischance, and mischance, can be exaggerated. For, from 10.20 pm to 11.30 pm, the British tail was repeatedly in action with the enemy, who were trying to elbow their way through. At 10.20 pm they elbowed good enough slight cruisers, but sheared off after the light cruiser frame lob had been sunk by a torpedo from the badly battered Southampton. In the next hour the British destroyers suffered the contusion and caused confusion. The light cruiser Elbing was rammed by the battleship Boson and left sinking, while the British destroyer Spitfire acted up to her name by ramming the battleship Nassau. She not only got away with this act of impertinence, but with a long strip of Nassau's plating as proof of her prowess. Once more the German fleet sheared off, but veered in afresh about 11.30 pm and this time broke through although harassed by the British Hornets for more than an hour at the cost of four of their number. They had contributed much gallantry, but little intelligence. The only report of these encounters that came to Jellico was one from good enough at 10.15 pm, and, owing to the Southampton's wireless being shot away this did not reach Jellico until 11.38 pm. For the light craft, hotly engaged, 
there was some excuse for failure to send information, although even those which were not engaged sent no word of what they saw. But Evan Thomas' 5th Battle Squadron was also astern of the main fleet, forming an intermediate link, it was well aware of the constant attacks and its two rear battleships actually saw the leading German battleships in their wake. The Valiant, at 11.35 pm, noted two German cruisers with at least two funnels and a crane amidships, apparently steering eastward at a high speed. The crane identified them so unmistakably as battleships of the Westphalen class, that the mistake of assuming them to be cruisers would be incredible were it not fact. The Malaya, five minutes later, noted enemy big ships, three points abaft the starboard beam, steering the same way as ours. It had evidently sighted the enemy battleships as they were making a momentary swerve in face of the destroyer attack. It noted the conspicuous crane of the leading ship, and drew the correct deduction that it was apparently Westphalen class. Neither the Valiant nor the Malaya reported what they had seen, apparently assuming that the Barham, their flagship ahead, had seen it likewise. How the Barham failed to see it has never been explained. The one clear fact is that no word from the squadron was sent to the commander in chief. Was there, then, no information which might have quickened Jellicoe's suspicion or upon which he might have acted? Two reports reached him from the Admiralty, which had been intercepting German wireless messages. The first, giving the German location at 9 pm, was valueless because, owing to an error, the position indicated was obviously inaccurate. This did not encourage him to accept the second, which was only too accurate. It stated that the German fleet had been ordered home at 9.14 pm and gave the dispositions, course and speed. But, by another fateful slip, it omitted the most significant fact contained in the several enemy messages which it summarized, that Seer had asked for an airship reconnaissance near Horn Reefs at daylight. Here was the unmistakable scent to his bolt hole. This message was received at 11.5 pm and read, after deciphering, about 11.30 pm. One other message reached Jellico, being received at 11.30 pm, and so read later than the Admiralty message. It came from the light cruiser Birmingham, and reported that battle cruisers probably hostile were in sight, steering south and well to the westward. Unfortunately, the Birmingham had sighted them at a moment when they had sheared away from the British torpedo attacks. If Jellicoe already distrusted the Admiralty message, upon which he took no action, it was natural that he should regard the two later reports from the Southampton and Birmingham as support to his doubts. Yet, it is curious, and not easy to explain, that he should have been so insensitive to the definite indication of fighting astern. For, Apart from these two reports, the recurrent firing was heard and the flashes seen both by his flagship and the other battleships. That this fire was obviously from light guns did not, it is true, reveal the presence of enemy battleships, but it was no proof that they were not there, for at night battleships would naturally be using their secondary armament if engaged with British light craft. More curious still is the fact that Jellicoe made only one attempt at 10.46 p.m., to inquire the source of the firing, and the wording of his signal suggests a preconceived idea that it was merely an enemy destroyer attack. Thus, in sum, the conclusion is that while Jellicoe's lack of certain knowledge was due to the neglect of his subordinates, his lack of suspicion is the measure of his own responsibility, and the salvation of Sheer. One more serious contact occurred before the German fleet was at last safely free. In the dim light before dawn it was sighted by Captain Sterling's 12th destroyer flotilla. The exception, when he should have been the rule, Sterling sent a wireless report to Jellicoe at 1.52 a.m., before he engaged the enemy and another during the action. His attack torpedoed and sank the German battleship Pommern, and thereby achieved more than the whole Grand Fleet had done. But his reports did not reach Jellicoe presumably owing to a wireless failure. Thus the British battle fleet continued serenely on its course southward, and the German, on its course homeward. When daylight came Jellicoe turned about, at 2.39 am, and steamed northward.
expecting to see the German fleet and seeing only an empty sea. Then came another Admiralty message to say that the German fleet was close to Horn Reefs, and this time its evidence was accepted. After searching for enemy stragglers, and finding none, the Grand Fleet in turn steamed homeward. Its total loss had been three battle cruisers, three armored cruisers and eight destroyers to the German one battleship, one battle cruiser, four light cruisers and five destroyers. In officers and men. The British had lost 6,097 killed to the German 2,545, and 177 prisoners to none. Thus, the one naval battle of the World War was but a casual item in the Long Butcher's Bill. Its value as a battle was in every sense negligible. To trace to it the ultimate and bloodless surrender of the German fleet two and a half years later is absurd, confounding mere sequence with causation. If Jutland did little to encourage the Germans to provoke a decisive clash at sea it did little to discourage them. They had won the first game, against the battle cruisers, and superior gunnery had yielded the monas above the line, they had been outmaneuvered in the second game, with honors easy, and had scored several tricks in the third before the game had been broken off. As they could not hope to gain the rubber because of their opponent's stronger hand, the interruption left them at least a flattering sense of their own skill. As a new and untried creation the German navy inevitably suffered an inferiority complex in face of a navy which enjoyed a matchless role of victories and the Nelson tradition. Jutland had dissipated this fear of the untried in face of the known unknown. Within twelve weeks the German fleet was to make a bolder bid to take the British at a disadvantage. Covered by airship patrols it advanced close to the English coast on August 19 with the idea of bombarding Sunderland as a bait to draw the Grand Fleet south onto a waiting ambush of submarines. Battle was again balked by caution and an accident. One of Beatty's advanced cruisers was torpedoed and Jellico, suspecting instead a new laid minefield, turned back and steamed north for two hours. When he again came south the German fleet had gone. Fossier had received a report of a strong British force, actually the light force from Harwich, coming up from the south, and hastily assumed that this was the Grand Fleet. If so, it had not only evaded his trap but, turning the tables, threatened to cut him off. Hence he turned for home. For the British Navy, Jutland would better not have been fought at all. However unpalatable the admission, it undoubtedly depreciated British naval prestige in the eyes of allies and the home public more than the inspiring feats of individual gallantry and the fact of Britain's continued supremacy at sea could redeem. That supremacy was to ensure the ultimate downfall of German power to continue the war. But no victorious battle helped, as such a battle might, to shorten the gloomy and costly process of exhaustive slaughter on land. Jutland merely ensured what was already ensured without a battle, so long as the British Navy maintained its passive superiority of strength. Here was the general aspect. On the technical side, Jutland was more significant if not more productive of enthusiasm. It showed that the German standard of gunnery was far higher than complacent or patronizing opinion in England had recognized, and it tended, less fairly, to reflect unfavorably on British gunnery owing to the lapse of some, and the lack of opportunity of other, elements of the fleet. In material, Jutland showed also that the Admiralty and its technical advisers had failed to foresee or profit by experience as well as the Germans. Against the inferior armor-piercing qualities of the British shells must be set, but not offset, the fact of insufficient protection of the British ships against plunging fire and especially against the flash from an explosion in a gun turret passing down into the magazine. This was the probable cause of the mysteriously sudden end of the Queen Mary and indefatigable. More debatable perhaps were the results of the policy of building huge battle cruisers in which a large degree of protection was sacrificed for a small increase in speed. Speed in itself confers indirectly a high degree of protection, but essentially through diminishing the target in the sense of making it more difficult for the enemy to hit. For effective protection in this way a diminution of size is required, 
not merely a diminution of armor for the sake of a few extra knots. The tactical side of Jutland has aroused still more criticism and controversy than the technical side. Criticism of its foundation is less easy to counter than criticism of the actual direction. The naval neglect of tactical study, the absence of tactical textbooks, and the secrecy which by custom had enshrouded the meager instructions, have ever been a source of wonder to soldiers, who know from history and experience that good and flexible tactics in an army are essentially the product of ceaseless reflection and discussion by many minds. La critique est la vie de la science. Students of military history know that the attempt to keep tactics secret defeats its own end, and its own employer. There was no mystery in the tactics by which Alexander's Macedonians, the Romans, the Mongols, Gustavus Swedes, Frederick's Prussians, Wellington's Peninsula Infantry, won their repeated triumphs. Only a matchless harmony of execution through practice and understanding which gave them the advantage no rival and imitator could overtake. Secrecy leads to rigidity of tactics, open discussion and criticism. To flexibility and the well attuned initiative of subordinates when confronted with the unexpected. The basic criticism of naval tactics during the World War period is that they undermine the basis of tactics, elasticity. Moreover, the fleet fought at Jutland as a single body, as did armies in the days before Napoleon developed the system of independent divisions. Tactically, the fleet was an armless body. Thus however skillfully Jellicoe maneuvered his fleet he could not justly hope to paralyze his opponent's freedom of movement. And to pin an opponent is the vital prelude to a decisive maneuver, this dual act gives a double meaning to the old maxim dash divide to conquer. The British fleet was all too truly one and indivisible. Subject to this dominant proviso, Jellicoe's handling of the fleet during the day of May 31st may fairly be adjudged a very able if cautious performance when we take full account of the obscure conditions. In 1916 this obscurity had reached an extreme, for aircraft reconnaissance had not yet been adequately developed as a corrective to the long ranges developed by progress in guns. As for Jellicoe's oft-criticized deployment on the left wing, it was probably the best in the circumstances although praise of it is apt to overlook the fact that it was not free from trouble. For it meant that Beatty's battle cruisers took longer to get clear of the front of the battle fleet and so masked its fire and caused checks, the very objection which has been brought against Churchill's suggested alternative of deploying from the center. The lessons of the night have already been summed up, and the only further question is whether Jellicoe might not have seized the opportunity to forestall the enemy's attempt to break through by using his torpedo craft offensively instead of defensively as his pendant tail. But if, discounting all criticisms, we admit that Jellicoe's handling of the battle fleet was the flawless masterpiece that numerous naval admirers argue, the admission only strengthens the belief that the worst fault of the Jutland battle was that it was ever fought. 7 1917, the Strand despite incessant provocation for two years, since the Lusitania incident, President Wilson held to his neutral policy, and if his excess of patience angered many of his own people it was at least the means of consolidating American opinion and reconciling it as a whole to intervention in the war. Meantime he strove by speech and by the agency of Colonel House, his unofficial ambassador, to find a basis of peace on which the belligerents could agree. This effort was doomed to failure by his misunderstanding of the psychology of the warring peoples and of people at war. He was still thinking in terms of traditional warfare, between governmental policies, while the conflict had long since passed into the wider sphere of the struggle of peoples dominated by primitive instincts and chained by their own catchphrases to the chariot wheels of Mars mechanized. The declaration of the unlimited submarine campaign brought convincing proof of the futility of these peace hopes and of the reality of the German intentions, and when followed by the deliberate sinking of American ships and an attempt to instigate Mexico to action against the United States, President Wilson hesitated no longer and, on April 6, 1917, America entered the war against Germany. Her potential force in manpower and material was illimitable. But, even more unready than Britain in 1914, it must be long in exerting more than a moral influence, 
and Germany confidently anticipated that the submarine campaign would take decisive effect within a few months. How near her calculation came to fulfillment the record of 1917 and 1918 bears witness. The year 1916 had closed in gloom for the Entente. The simultaneous offensive on all fronts, planned a year before, had misfired, the French army was at a low ebb, the Russian still lower, the Somme had failed to produce visible results in any way proportionate to its cost, and another fresh ally had been overrun. At sea the negativeness of Jutland was a disappointment, and although Germany's first submarine campaign had been abandoned a stronger one was threatened. To offset these debits, the Entente could only show the capture of distant Baghdad and the limited Italian success at Gorizia in August, whose value, however, was mainly that of a moral Philip to Italy herself. Among the Allied peoples and their political representatives there was a growing sense of depression. On the one hand it took the form of dissatisfaction with the conduct of the war, and, on the other, of discouragement over the prospects of a victorious conclusion to the war, and a tendency to discuss the possibilities of a peace by negotiation. The first named tendency was the first to come to a head and was signalized in London, the political mainspring of the Allies, by the replacement of Asquith's government on December 11 by one with Lloyd George as its chief. The order of precedence in events had a significant effect. For Lloyd George had come into power as the spokesman of a widespread demand for a more vigorous as well as more efficient prosecution of the war. The second tendency received an impulse from the German peace move of December 12, after the fall of Bucharest, which proposed an opening of peace discussions. This suggestion was rejected as insincere by the Allied governments, but it afforded the opportunity for President Wilson on whose behalf Colonel House had long been sounding the belligerent governments as to the prospects of mediation, to invite these to define their war aims as a preliminary to practical negotiation. The German reply was evasive, the Allied replies were considered by their opponents unacceptable as a basis of discussion, and the tentative peace moves subsided. But while this wave of depression was surging on the home front, the Allied commanders continued optimistic. In November Joffre assembled, at Chantilly, a further conference of the commanders at which it was agreed that the Germans were in great difficulties on the Western Front, and that the situation of the Allies was more favourable than it had ever been. The fighting strength of the British Army in France had grown to be about 1,200,000 men, and was still growing. The fighting strength of the French army had been increased by the incorporation of native troops to some 2,600,000, so that, including the Belgians, it was estimated that the Allies disposed of about 3,900,000 men against about 2,500,000 Germans. Joffre, however, declared that the French army could maintain its strength for one more great battle, and that thereafter it must progressively decline as a France had no longer a sufficient number of men of military age to replace losses. He therefore warned Haag that during the coming year the burden must fall more and more upon the British army. It was also agreed that in view of these factors the relative superiority of the Allies on the Western Front would be greater in the spring of 1917 than at any time which could be foreseen with certainty. In consequence it was decided to take the earliest opportunity of pressing the advantage gained on the Somme, and to continue the process of exhausting the enemy's reserves as preparation for an effort which should be decisive. An alternative proposal was made by General Cadena that the French and British should cooperate in a combined thrust from the Italian front against Austria with the object of knocking this weaker partner out of the war. But it was rejected by the French and British commanders. Despite Lloyd George's espousal of it at the Allied conference held in Rome in January, their objection was that it involved a fresh diversion of strength away from the main front, where alone, they held, success could have decisive results. An offensive towards Vienna would have had formidable difficulties to overcome, especially from the mountainous country, but in judging the objections to it, the historian is compelled to note that the Franco British strategists showed no signs of recognizing a fundamental truth of strategy, 
that a concentration at one place is unlikely to succeed unless an adequate distraction to the enemy's counter concentration is provided elsewhere. In their justifiable conviction that the main effort of France and Britain must be made on the Western Front, they seem to have dismissed too lightly the possibility of helping Italy to create a distraction to their own benefit. Yet, with Russia palpably flagging, the need to develop some fresh channel of pressure had become more urgent. When Robertson dogmatically asserted that the first lesson of history was to concentrate all available force in the main theatre, and that any departure from this rule has invariably proved to be disastrous, he exposed his own ignorance of history. Lloyd George might well have reminded him of the effective way in which the Italian theatre had been used by Eugene, with Marlborough's support, as a lever against France in the War of the Spanish Succession, and by Napoleon Bonaparte, as a lever against Austria in the War of the First Coalition. It was a reflection on modern strategists that, with superior facilities, they treated as insuperable the obstacles of nature which their ancestors had repeatedly overcome. To turn the Italian theatre into an effective distraction in favour of the Western Allies, quality rather than quantity of aid from them was needed. The initial task of breaching the Isonzo front would have demanded the concentration there of heavy artillery from the Western Front, but with a promise of much increased effect in proportion to their number, the subsequent advance would have depended less on weight of numbers than on providing the forces with an adequate spearhead of troops suitable for mountain fighting. In the organization of their respective forces as in the organization of their total resources, a cardinal defect of the Allies in their strategy was that they concentrated by count of numbers instead of concentrating on the most effective utilization of suitable tools. Poverty of thought, not poverty of resources, produced the bankruptcy of the scheme drawn up at the Chantilly Conference. The military cupboard was abundantly stocked with men and munitions, but its shelves were bare of constructive ideas. The proceedings reveal only too clearly the want of any deep understanding of war and knowledge of its history. The Allied peoples were clamoring for something fresh. This instinct was true if their motives mixed. But all that the combined brains of Chantilly offered them was a skeleton swathed in a few moldering platitudes. The Entente plan for 1917 was soon to be complicated by changes in the command. French opinion had tired of the meager results of Joffre's attrition strategy, and the method of the limited objective had fallen into disfavor because of the unlimited losses on the wrong side, which accompanied it without apparent gain. They contrasted the dull course of Joffre's strategy with the brilliant results gained by Mangin at Verdun, in the autumn, under Nivelle's direction, and as a result Joffre gave place to Nivelle, who promised a real breakthrough. His confidence so inspired Lloyd George, the new British Prime Minister, that Haig was subordinated to him for the forthcoming operations, an arrangement which violated the axiom that a general cannot direct one force while exercising executive command of another. For carrying out a plan essentially audacious, Nivelle had two further handicaps, he failed to convert several of his subordinates to the idea, and he was given less reign by the government than his predecessor. Again, while Joffre had intimated that the British must take the chief part, Nivelle changed this policy, and in his desire to conserve the glory for France overlooked how severely the French fighting power had been strained. Joffre's plan had been for a renewal of the Somme offensive on a widened front. The British to attack north of the Somme, including but extending beyond the old battleground, and the French south of it to the Oyeis. This attack was to open early in February and to be followed a fortnight later by a smaller French attack in Champagne, between Reims and Cran. The French had in mind comparatively short distance objectives, hence, unless German resistance unexpectedly collapsed, the bulk of the British forces would subsequently be transferred to Flanders for a fresh offensive there. Analysis of the facts does not tend to support the idea that the chance of early victory for the Allies was forfeited through the abandonment of Joffre's plan. The hard frosts that came in late January would have aided its early development, but it would have been too early for any prospect of a simultaneous offensive in the other theatres, and although it might have disturbed the Germans' execution of their plan, they were better prepared to rally in rear than were the Allies to press home the advantage. Nivelle's plan was more far reaching than Joffre's. 
he intended to deliver a convergent attack on both flanks of the great salient Lens Neuen Reims, with the French striking the main blow in Champagne immediately after the British and French attacks north and south of the Somme had attracted the enemy's attention and resources. In this preparatory offensive, Nivelle's design was to avoid the old Somme battlefield and, instead, to strike on each side of it. Haig's frontage of attack would thus be reduced, and in return Nivelle wished him to take over the French front south of the Somme, as far as Roy, so as to release additional French forces for the main attack in Champagne, where Nivelle hoped to achieve a decisive breakthrough. Haig was rather skeptical of such a possibility, and in favor of a later date for the offensive, but he recognized certain advantages in the new plan, especially the fact that it implied a greater effort by the French. On the other hand, he objected strongly to an extension of his front which would reduce the British forces available for his cherished idea of an offensive in Flanders. This objection produced the first crack in the Nivelle plan. To Nivelle's pressing letter of December 21, Haig made indefinite reply, saying that he could only relieve the French if he himself obtained six additional divisions, and Nivelle, feeling that there was no time to lose, appealed through his own government to the British. In mid-January, as a result, a conference was held in London, here Haig's appeal that they should wait for the Russian and Italian attacks in May was overruled, and the date fixed for not later than April 1st. It was also settled that Haig should relieve the French south of the Somme, and he was promised two additional divisions for the purpose, after further argument he eventually received eight. Haig was instructed to carry out this agreement both in the letter and in the spirit. But the difficulties, especially those of personal feeling, had not been smoothed out. Tension between the French and British headquarters increased, the former complaining of obstruction and the latter of attempted domination. This tension was magnified by British dissatisfaction with the French railway service and on this point Haig now made an appeal to his own government which led to a fresh conference at Calais on February 26. But here, to his surprise, the French seized the opportunity to raise the wider issue of a unified control of operations, and produced a scheme by which, for this purpose, the British armies would be placed under Nivelle, whose orders to them would be issued through a British chief of staff at his headquarters. To this proposal, Haig and Robertson naturally took exception, and after heated discussion a compromise was reached by which Haig agreed to act under Nivelle's direction during the forthcoming offensive, subject to the right of appeal. But the chance of a smooth working arrangement was vitiated by the deep-rooted suspicions of the British higher command, and these in turn were accentuated by the way that some of Nivelle's satellites agitated for Haig's removal. A few days later, Haag, nettled by a rather peremptory letter of instructions from Nivelle, found cause for exercising his right of appeal in the signs of a German withdrawal on the Somme front, laying a perhaps excessive emphasis on the possibility that the Germans might switch troops north and attack him in Flanders, he notified the British government and Nivelle that he might have to reduce his share in Nivelle's offensive and postpone its execution. Nivelle not unnaturally felt that Haig was evading his obligations, so one more conference was called, in London on March 12. Here some further safeguards were inserted in the agreement, but the discussion mainly turned on the form rather than on the substance of Nivelle's instructions, and after a personal talk between the two commanders the trouble over these niceties of phrasing was settled. Nivelle was at last free to concentrate his mind on the plan for the forthcoming offensive. Before it could begin the Germans had dislocated it. Ludendorff's first step had been to set on foot a complete program for the reorganization of German manpower, munitions and supplies. While this was developing, he intended to stand on the defensive, hoping that the new submarine campaign would either decide the issue or pave the way for a decisive blow on land when his reserves of men and material were ready. As a coefficient of safety in face of the Somme offensive, he had previously ordered the new line of defense, of great artificial strength, to be built across the cord of the Arklens Neuen Reims. Early in the new year, anticipating the renewal of the Entente advance on the Somme, Ludendorff hurried on the completion of this rear line and arranged for the utter devastation of the whole area inside the Ark. There was a satirical, 
or satirical, aptness in the code word for this program of destruction dash Alberic, the name of the malicious dwarf in the Nibelung saga. The Crown Prince Roprick thought of resigning rather than carry out these extreme measures, but satisfied his conscience by refusing to sign the order for them. Houses were demolished, trees cut down, and even wells contaminated, while the wreckage was littered with a multitude of explosive booby traps. The rearward move was preceded on February 23rd by a local retirement from the awkward salient in front of Baypalm. This timely step relieved the Germans of British pressure and from the risk of interference. Although it gave the Allies a clear hint of what was in prospect they were not able to take advantage of the warning. Nivelle did not believe that the retirement would extend to his front, while Haag, who did, believed also in caution, that only a carefully mounted attack was feasible under modern conditions. The Germans evaded one such attack by another local retirement in the early hours of March 12. Then on the 16th the main withdrawal began, the German forces marching back unhurried to the new line called by them the Siegfried and by the Allies the Hindenburg Line. A consummate maneuver, if unnecessarily brutal in application, it showed that Ludendorff had the moral courage to give up territory if circumstances advised it. The British confronted with a desert, were cautiously slow in pursuit, and their preparations for an attack on this front were thrown out of gear, limiting them to the sector around Arras, where the front was unchanged. On April 9, Allenby's Third Army opened the spring offensive at this point, taking the long-sought Vimy Ridge, but failed to develop its initial success, and continued the attack too long after the resistance had hardened. This costly action was ostensibly prolonged in order to take the pressure off the French. For the French thrust between the Somme and the Oyes had also been stultified by the German retirement, and the main attack on April 16 east and west of Reims was a worse fiasco with a dangerous sequel. If it was scarcely Nivelle's fault that the foundations of his strategic plan had been upset, he betrayed La Folie de Grandeur in the way he persisted in it when the conditions had vitally changed and his tactical plan, over elaborate and inelastic, had no compensating elements of success against an enemy who was fully forewarned. With a prolonged bombardment giving away any chance of surprise and without first drawing away the German reserves, the idea of a rapid breakthrough was doomed to fail. The high hopes that had been raised caused the greater reaction and the troops were weary of being thrown against barbed wire and machine guns to no apparent effect. Accentuated by service grievances, mutinies occurred in the French armies, and no less than 16 corps were affected. The flame of revolt broke out in a regiment of the 2nd Colonial Division on May 3rd, and although momentarily extinguished soon spread, to the tune of such cries as we will defend the trenches. But we won't attack. We are not so stupid as to march against undamaged machine guns. The fact that the mutinies always occurred when the troops were ordered into the line is clear proof that disgust with their leadership rather than seditious propaganda was the real cause of revolt. A significant sidelight is that cases of desertion in the French army rose from 509 in 1914 to 21,174 in 1917. So general was the rot that, according to the Minister of War, only two divisions in the Champagne sector could be relied on fully, and in places the trenches were scarcely even guarded. The saviour of the situation was General Pétain, and his instrument, a change of policy based on psychology. On April 28 the government had made him chief of the general staff as a break on Nivelle's reckless offensive and on May 15 they took the wiser and more honest step of appointing him to replace Nivel. For a month he travelled along the front by car, visiting nearly every division, summoning both officers and men to voice their complaints. Essentially patriarchal and not familiar, he inspired confidence both in his firmness and in his promises. Tours of duty in the trenches were equalised, regularity of leave ensured, rest camps improved. Within a month calm was restored, at the price of only 23 executions, although more than a hundred of the ringleaders were deported to the colonies. But if the French army was convalescent, Pétain had still to revive its fighting confidence and power.
To this end he first reorganized its training and tactics on the basis that firepower should economize manpower, and then aimed to try his newly sharpened blade in easy tests that should not risk planting it again. Thus, for the rest of the year the British bore the brunt of the campaign. Their strength in France was now at its highest, 64 divisions, supplied with an abundance of artillery and ammunition. The strain on them, however, was increased by the failure of Russia to make any effective contribution to the pressure on Germany owing to the revolution which broke out in March. Haig decided to keep the Germans occupied by carrying out the original plan for an offensive in Belgium, but even if the principle was right the method and choice of sight were opposed to all the experience of history. The initial move was an attack on the Messins Ridge in order to straighten out the Ypres salient and attract the enemy's reserves carried out on June 7 by the Second Army under Plumer, with Harrington as Chief of Staff, it proved a model example of the limited attack, in which the surprise effect of 19 huge mines, simultaneously exploded, and supplemented by an overwhelming artillery concentration, was exploited just as far as, and no further than, the point where the German numbness began to wear off. This coup was tardily followed on July 31 by the main attack at Ypres which, hampered in execution by the heavy rain, was foredoomed by its own destruction of the intricate drainage system of the area. The British command had persevered for two and a half years with the method of a prolonged preparatory bombardment, believing that quantity of shells was the key to success, and that, unlike all the great captains of history, they could forego the aid of surprise. The offensive at Ypres which was finally submerged in the swamps of Pass Kendale in early November, threw into stronger relief than ever before the fact that such a bombardment blocked the advance for which it was intended to pave the way, because it made the ground impassable. The discomfiture was increased by the new German defensive method of thinning the front defences and using the men so saved for prompt local counter-attacks. The defense was built up of a framework of machine guns distributed in concrete pillboxes and disposed in great depth. On the British side the profitless toll of this struggle in the mud was to some extent mitigated by better staff work when the direction of the attack was progressively handed over to Plumer's Second Army. Three months of dreadful struggle came to an end with the British now appreciably nearer their immediate object of driving the Germans from their submarine bases in the Belgian port, and if they had worn down the German strength they had worn down their own still more. The 1917 campaign in the West closed, however, on a note brighter in promise if not in accomplishment. Appreciating from the first days the futility of using tanks in these Flanders swamps, the tank corps headquarters looked around for an area where they could try out a new and different method. They drew up a project for a large-scale raid to scour a canal enclosed pocket near Cambrai, where the rolling down land lent itself to tank movement. The basic idea was the release of a swarm of tanks without any preparatory bombardment to give warning of the attack. When their hopes at Ypres waned, the British command adopted the scheme, but transformed it into a definite offensive with far-eaching aims, for which they had not the resources because of the drain of Ypres. It was to be carried out by Bung's 3rd Army with six divisions, and the date was fixed for November 20. Led by nearly 400 tanks, the attack came as a complete surprise, and despite minor checks achieved a penetration far deeper and at less cost than any past British offensive. But all the available troops and tanks were thrown into the first blow, and no reserves were at hand to exploit the success. The cavalry as always on the Western Front, proved unable to carry out this role. Thus the advance died away, and on November 30 the Germans launched a counter-stroke against the flanks of the salient created by the British advance. In the north it was parried but in the south broke through, and a disaster was narrowly averted. But if Cambrai closed in disappointment it revealed that surprise and the tank were the combination by which the trench barrier could be unlocked. Meanwhile Pétain, after overhauling his instrument, the French army, sought to test its readiness for 1918. In August a stroke by Gilormat's army at Verdun recovered all the remainder of the ground lost in 1916, 
and in October Meister's army flattened the southwest corner of the German front, seizing the Kemende Dames Ridge. The collapse of Russia. The temporary breakdown of the French fighting power was not the worst of the troubles which together crippled the Entente offensive in 1917. The collapse, first partial and then complete, of Russia was a loss which even the entry of America into the war could not possibly compensate for many months, and before the balance was restored the Western Allies were to be perilously near the brink of defeat. Russia's enormous losses, due to her defective machine but incurred in sacrifice for her allies, had undermined the moral even more than the material endurance of her forces. Revolution broke out in March, superficially against the corrupt entourage of the Tsar, but with more deep-seated moral causes beneath. The Tsar was forced to abdicate and a moderate provisional government climbed into the saddle, but without trains. This was only a makeshift, and in May another succeeded it more socialist in tendency and outwardly led by Kierensky. While clamoring for a general peace and undermining discipline by a system of committee control suitable to a trade union but not to the field of battle, Kierensky imagined he could send troops against the enemy by platform appeals. Bruzlov succeeded Alexev in the supreme command, and on July 1 the army gained some initial success against the Austrians, especially in the region of Stanislaw only to stop as soon as real resistance was met, and to crumble directly the Germans counter-attacked. By early August the Russians had been driven out of Galicia and the Bukovina, and only policy halted the Austro-German forces on the frontiers of Russia itself. Since the departure of Hindenburg and Ludendorff in 1916, Hoffmann had been in real control of the Eastern Front. His clever combination of strategy and policy did much to complete the paralysis of Russia, and thus release German troops for use in the West. In September the Germans took the opportunity to practice their new artillery methods, for future use in France. Their surprise attack, under Hutia's command, achieved the capture of Riga with, scarcely a show of opposition. Next month the Bolsheviks under Lenin overthrew the wordy Kierensky imposed their self-constituted rule on the Russian people and sought an armistice with Germany, which was concluded in December. The breakthrough in Italy. The defection of Russia did not end the Entente tale of woe. Each autumn, with demoralizing regularity, Germany had seized an opportunity to eat up one of the weaker allies. In 1915 it had been Serbia's fate, in 1916 Romania's, and now it was to be Italy's turn or so the Germans intended. Ludendorff's decision, taken in September, was determined by the appeals of the Austrian authorities, who felt that their troops could not endure strain of another defensive battle on the Italian frontier. In May, Codino had attacked once more on the Isenzo front but an Austrian counter-attack in the Carso sector had retaken part of the small gains. Losses, however, were more nearly balanced than formerly. The question of Allied cooperation on the Italian front was raised afresh without result, Haig protesting strongly. Cadena, nevertheless, initiated in August an 11th Battle of the Isenzo. Capello's Second Army captured a large part of the Bainsistsa Plateau, north of Gorizia, but a long sustained effort brought no further success and Cadena was forced to break off the offensive after four weeks' struggle. But it had so strained the resistance of the debilitated Austrians that, in Ludendorff's words, it became necessary to decide for the attack on Italy in order to prevent the collapse of Austria Hungary. Ludendorff had a difficult problem to solve. Russia had not yet capitulated, the front there was already weakly held for its extent, and the British offensive in Flanders made impossible a large withdrawal of troops from France. As he could only scrape together six German divisions, and the Austrians' quality was lower than ever, he came to the conclusion that the only chance of decisive results was to pick out a particularly weak sector which coincidentally offered scope for a strategic exploitation of the breakthrough. This was found in the Tolmino Caporetto sector. On October 24, after a short bombardment, the blow was launched and pushed deep down the western slopes of the mountains, imperiling the Italian forces to both south and north. On October 28 the advance reached Udine, the former Italian general headquarters, 
and on October 31st the Tagliamento. Not the least significant feature of this offensive was the way it was prepared, by a moral bombardment. Propaganda had been exploited for months as a means of sapping the Italian discipline and will to resist. But its effect can be exaggerated, the most formidable propaganda, as with the French in April, was that supplied by the attrition strategy of the Italian command, which had sickened the troops by its limited results at unlimited cost. But the result also surprised Ludendorff, who with his slender forces had not calculated on such distant objectives as were now possible of attainment. As the direct pursuit was slowing down he belatedly tried to switch troops from the left wing to Conrad's army which flanked the north of the Venetian salient, but was foiled by the inadequacy of the railways. Even so, Cadena, with his centre broken through, only saved his wings by a precipitate retreat to the line of the Piave, covering Venice, leaving 250,000 prisoners in the enemy's hands. The same day Cadena was superseded in supreme command by Diaz. Italy's allies had begun to rush reinforcements, two army corps, one British and one French, to her aid, and on November 5 their political and military chiefs arrived at Rey Palo for a conference, out of which sprang the Allied Council at Versailles, and ultimately a unified command. The invaders had outrun their transport, and the resistance of the Italians, morally braced by the emergency, succeeded in holding the Piave in face of direct assaults and strenuous efforts by Conrad to turn their left flank from the Trentino. At the beginning of December, the British and French, who had been waiting in reserve in case of a fresh breakthrough, moved forward to take over vulnerable sectors, but the attack was only renewed in the north, and on December 19 it came to an end with the coming of the snows. If Caporetto seriously damaged Italy, it also purged her, and after an interval of recuperation she was to vindicate herself at Vittorio Veneto. The capture of Jerusalem. Once more a distant theatre of war provided the sole triumph of the Entente cause during the year, this time in Palestine. The second reverse at Gaza, in April 1917, had led to a change of command, Murray being succeeded by Allenby who was strong enough and fortunate enough to obtain the adequate force for which Murray had asked in vain. The British government was anxious for a spectacular success to offset the moral depression of the Nivelle failure and the decline of Russia, and the British general staff desired to dislocate the Turks' attempt to recapture Baghdad by drawing away their reserves. Allenby took over in July and devoted the first three months to intensive preparations for an autumn offensive, when the season would be suitable. The command was reorganized, the communications developed, and his own headquarters moved forward from Cairo to the front. By complete secrecy in ruses he deceived the Turks as to the point of attack. The defenses of Gaza were bombarded from October 20 onwards, and an attack followed on November 1 to pin the enemy and draw in his reserves. Meanwhile, as a necessary preliminary to the real blow. The inland bastion of Beersheba was seized by a convergent maneuver on October 31, a prelude to the decisive attack on November 6, which broke through the enemy's weakened center and into the plain of Philistia. Falcon Hain, now in command at Aleppo, had also been planning an offensive, but the better communications of the British decided the race, and although Falcon Hain tried to stem the tide by a counterstroke against Beersheba, the breaking of his centre compelled a general retreat. The pursuit was hampered by lack of water and of initiative. Even so, by the 14th, the Turkish forces were driven apart in two divergent groups, the port of Jaffa was taken, and Allenby wheeled his main force to the right for an advance inland on Jerusalem. He gained the narrow hill passes before the Turks could block them and, after a necessary pause to improve his communications, brought up reserves for a fresh advance, which secured Jerusalem on December 9. By the time the winter rains set in the British had expanded and consolidated their hold on the region. As a moral success the feat was valuable, yet viewed strategically it seemed a long way round to the goal. If Turkey be pictured as a bent old man, the British, after missing their blow at his head, Constantinople, and omitting to strike at his heart, Alexandretta, had now resigned themselves to swallowing him from the feet upwards, 
like a python dragging its endless length across the desert. The difficult process of assimilation, however, was assisted by the spreading paralysis of the Turkish strength under the needle pricks of Lawrence and the Arabs. The clearing of East Africa. The year 1917 witnessed another overseas success. The clearing of German East Africa, although not the close of the campaign. More than a year elapsed after the rebuff at Tanga before a serious attempt was made to subdue the last German stronghold on the African continent. To spare troops from the main theatres was difficult, and the solution was only made possible by the loyal cooperation of the South African government. In February 1916, General Smuts was appointed to command the expedition and formed the plan of a drive from north to south through the difficult interior, in order to avoid the fever rampant plain on the coast. In conjunction with this central wedge, a Belgian force under Toombrus to advance eastwards from Lake Tanganyika, and a small British force under Northey was to strike in from Nyasaland in the southwest. The Germans under Leto Vorbeck were weak in numbers but handled with masterly skill and with all the advantages of an equatorial climate, a vast and trackless region, mountainous in parts and covered with dense bush and forest, to assist them in impeding the invader. From Dar es Salaam on the coast to Ujiji on Lake Tanganyika ran the one real line of rail communication, across the center of the colony. After driving the Germans back across the frontier and seizing the Kilimanjaro Gap, Smuts moved direct on this railway at Morogara, over 300 miles distant, while he dispatched a force under Van Deventer in a wide sweep to the west to cut the railway farther inland, and then converge on Morogara. Letov Orbeck delayed this maneuver by a concentration against Van Deventer, but Smut's direct advance compelled him to hurry his force back, and thus enabled Van Deventer to get astride the railway. However, Letov Orbeck evaded the attempt to cut him off and fell back in September on the Ulagaru Mountains to the south. The Belgians and Northey had cleared the west and the net had been drawn steadily closer, confining Letov Orbeck to the southeast quarter of the colony. Early in 1917, Smuts returned to England, and Van Deventer conducted the final operations which ended with Letov Orbeck avoiding envelopment to the end slipping across the frontier into Portuguese Africa. Here he maintained a guerrilla campaign throughout 1918 until the general armistice. With an original force of only 5,000, 5 5% being Europeans, he had caused the employment of 130,000 enemy troops and the expenditure of pound 72,000,000. The mastering of the submarine. The military side of 1917 is thrown into shadow by the naval, or more strictly the economic, side. The vital issue turned on the balance between Germany's submarine pressure and Britain's resistance. April was the worst month. One ship out of every four which left the British Isles never came home. The Allies lost nearly a million tons of shipping, 60% of it British and although the German Navy's promise of victory by the end of the month was proved a miscalculation, it was clear that, ultimately, the continuance of such a ratio of loss must starve the civilian population and automatically prevent the maintenance of the armies. Britain, indeed, had only food enough to sustain her people for another six weeks. The government sought to counter the menace by the indirect means of rationing, increasing home production, and the expansion of shipbuilding by the direct means of the system of convoys with naval escorts, and a counter-offensive against the submarine, aided by new devices to detect the presence of submarines and the use of thousands of patrol craft. The most effective countermeasure, that of penning the Germans in their bases by close-in minefields, was hindered by the British failure to obtain a real command of the North Sea, through a decisive victory. The British destroyer flotillas daringly laid thousands of mines in the channels left by the Germans through the Holigland Bight, but their ceaseless efforts were largely foiled by the German minesweepers, which were able to work freely under the protection of the German fleet. Nevertheless these mines hindered and delayed the passage of the U-boats and increased the demoralizing nerve strain on the U-boat crews which was, above all, the cause of the decline of the submarine campaign too few submarines and trained crews in proportion to the task, and too great a strain upon them, 
spelt ultimate collapse. But the British crisis of the spring of 1917 was averted less by an offensive than by a defensive method. For the convoy system was the main agent of salvation. The method of patrolled areas had been continued, despite its proven futility of 1916, during the early months of 1917. As Churchill says dash in April the great approach route to the southwest of Ireland was becoming a veritable cemetery of British shipping. And other cemeteries were only small by comparison. Besides 516,000 tons of British shipping, 336,000 tons of Allied and neutral were buried beneath the waves during April, and the direct loss of food and raw materials to the island kingdom was augmented by the growing unwillingness of neutral shipping to take the risk of supplying such a customer. Only the guts of her merchant seamen in going to sea after being several times torpedoed lay between Britain's stomach and starvation. And the blindest blunder of the British Admiralty was in opposing the introduction of the convoy system in face of the futility of their other methods to avert the close looming disaster. At last the advocacy of younger officers was decisively reinforced by Mr. Lloyd George's intervention, and in April voyages under convoy were sanctioned as an experiment on the Gibraltar and North Sea routes. The first left Gibraltar homeward bound on May 10. Crowned by unmistakable success, the convoys were extended to the transatlantic routes when the arrival of American flotillas under Admiral Sims increased the number of destroyers available for escorts. The loss of shipping in such convoys was reduced to a bare 1% and when, in August, the convoys were extended to outward bound shipping the British loss fell next month below the 200,000 ton level. Meantime the offensive campaign, now reinforced by special submarine chasers, aircraft, and the new horned mines, exacted an ever-rising toll of submarines, and by the end of 1917, the menace, if not broken, was at least subdued. If the British people had to tighten their belts, and their food rationing, they were now secure against starvation. During the early months of 1918, the number of German submarines declined as steadily as their losses rose, until in May 14 were lost out of 125 on service, while the effect of those that were operating declined disproportionately to their number. In all, the German war loss totaled 199 submarines of which 175 fell victims to the British Navy. And of the various weapons the mine claimed 42 and the depth charge 31 submarines. Hunted from the narrow seas, the U-boats were even shut out from the ocean during the last phase by a vast mine barrage, laid mainly by the American Navy, across the 180 mile wide passage between Norway and the Orkney Islands. It consisted of no less than 70,000 mines, of which the British laid 13,000. This was a direct counter to the main submarine operations against the ocean brought supplies of Great Britain. The shorter range operations of the small submarines from the Belgian coast were crippled by the perfected barrage across the Straits of Dover, by the daring attack of Admiral Key's force on the night of April 22, 1918 which for a time blocked up the exit from Zebra, and by the progressive demoralization of the U-boat crews. Yet the removal of the menace should not lead to an underestimate of its powers for the future. The 1917 campaign was launched with only 148 submarines and from the most unfavorable strategic position. Great Britain lay like a huge breakwater across the sea approaches to northern Europe and the submarines had to get outside through narrow and closely watched outlets before they could operate against the arteries of supply. And despite these handicaps they almost stopped the beat of England's heart. The economic reinforcement. In restoring circulation America's first aid became a potent factor long before her military assistance. It embraced her provision of light craft to reinforce the British anti-submarine fleet her rapidly developed construction of new mercantile ships and still more her financial aid. By July, 1917, Britain had spent over £5 billion, her daily expenditure had risen to £7 million and the burden of financing her allies as well as her own efforts was straining even her resources, when America's aid came to ease the pressure. 
In the first months after her entry into the war the appeals for loans came as a shock to Congress. Unable from remoteness and inexperience to realize the inevitable costs of the war, a large section of the American public felt that its new associates were trying to dip their hands too freely into the capacious pockets of Uncle Sam. Thus Mr. McAdoo, the Secretary of the Treasury, could satisfy neither the Allies nor the American public, the former feeling that he was stinting them and the latter crying that he was spending the nation's money like a drunken sailor. Hence further loans were vigorously opposed in Congress. Northcliffe graphically, if perhaps hyperbolically, summed up the situation when he cabled dash if loan stops, war stops. Actually, up to mid-July the USA had advanced £229 million to the several allies, with the restriction that this was to pay for supplies bought in the United States while Britain in the same period had added £193 million to the £900 million already lent to her allies, without such restriction. On the top of this fresh strain came the fear of having to sell securities in order to liquidate the early Morgan loan dash with consequent damage to British credit. Mr Balfour, then Secretary for Foreign Affairs was so alarmed that he cabled to Colonel House dash we seem on the verge of a financial disaster which would be worse than defeat in the field. If we cannot keep up exchange neither we nor our allies can pay our dollar debts. We should be driven off the gold basis, and purchases from the USA would immediately cease and the allies credit would be shattered. The danger was met by the action of the United States Treasury in continuing monthly advances, despite opposition until a coordinated inter-allied finance council could be created, by the formation of an official purchasing commission to take over the unofficial functions formerly fulfilled by J.P. Morgan and Company on behalf of the British government, and by sending Lord Reading to Washington as a combined political and financial representative to oil, by frankness and sympathy, the creaking machinery of demand and supply. The overwhelming success of the Liberty Loan campaign was at least an equal asset. Advances to the Allies were authorized at a maximum average monthly rate of $500 million. By the end of the year the problem itself was shifting its basis, for, owing to the vast needs and purchases of the American government for its own forces, the supply of credit to the Allies began to exceed that of the supply of goods. The difficulty of the Allies was now that of obtaining the material they needed for munitions rather than of obtaining the money to pay for it. While America's entry into the war thus secured the position of the Allies, it also conferred one great offensive benefit even before America's armies threw their weight into the scale. No longer was the grip of the naval blockade hampered by neutral quibbles, but instead America's cooperation converted it into a stranglehold under which the enemy must soon grow limp since military power is based on economic endurance. As a party to the war, the United States, indeed, wielded the economic weapon with a determination, regardless of the remaining neutrals, far exceeding Britain's boldest claims in the past years of controversy over neutral rights. Thus the surface blockade of Germany began to tighten coincidentally with the flagging of the submarine blockade of Britain. The air Another new form of action reached its crest at the same time as the submarine campaign. As the submarine was primarily an economic weapon, so was the aeroplane primarily a psychological weapon. The explosive bullet had virtually ended the Zeppelin raids in 1916, but from early in 1917 aeroplane raids on London grew in intensity until by May 1918 the air defences were so thoroughly organised that the raiders thereafter abandoned London, as a target, for Paris. If the stoicism of the civil population took much of the sting from a weapon then in its infancy, the indirect effect was serious, interrupting business and checking output in industrial centres, as well as drawing off, for defence many aircraft from the front. In reply the British belatedly formed a small independent air force, which carried out extensive raids into Germany during the closing months of the war, with marked effect on the declining morale of the home front. Propaganda. The beginning of 1918 witnessed the development and thorough organization of another psychological weapon, when Lord Northcliffe, who had been the head of the British war mission in the United States, 
was appointed director of propaganda in enemy countries, and for the first time the full scope of such a weapon was understood and exploited. Northcliffe found his best blade in President Wilson's speeches, which with idealism if not with entire realism unvaryingly distinguished between Germany's policy and the German people, and emphasized that the Allied policy was to liberate all people, including the Germans, from militarism. This blade, sharpened by the armorer, Colonel House, was trenchantly wielded by Northcliffe with the aim of severing the common ties which held together the enemy nations and their rulers. But these ties were stout enough to turn any blade until they had been frayed by military pressure. In July 1917 the effect of President Wilson's speeches, acting upon war weariness and anti-militarism in Germany, produced a parliamentary revolt and under Erzberger's management the Reichstag passed a peace resolution, which forswore territorial annexations. But the only effect was to break Bethmann Hollweg, the unhappy rope in the tug of war between the military and the political parties. The parliamentary representatives of the German people were as helpless to withstand the iron will of the general staff as was Imperial Austria, now utterly sick of, and only anxious to abandon, the war which she had provoked. These peace movements received small practical response from the enemy democracies, for President Wilson as their spokesman reiterated the declaration that they would negotiate no peace with military autocracy. His encouragement to the enemy peoples to throw off this control was excellent in precept but vain in fact when addressed to those who were so firmly manacled. They were not howed in his dot in January 1918 there was, indeed, a significant attempt at popular revolt, when over a million German workers joined in a general strike, but this was soon quenched and even forgotten in the fresh exhilaration of the great offensive. Only when the military machine itself began to crumble could the slaves of the machines free themselves from the grip, or propaganda help them in loosening it. Perhaps only then did an active will to peace reinforce their mere passive weariness of war. The inner strength of militant patriotism lies in the fact that it is not merely a gag but a drug. Seven scene one the halt and lame offensive, Arras, April, 1917 on April 9, 1917. The British armies in France entered upon what they had hoped was to be the final and decisive campaign of the World War. To the ordinary observer the day was a brilliant contrast to all previous offensives but it proved yet another mirage in the military desert. This was perhaps inevitable before zero hour. The Arras offensive had its roots deeply embedded in the battles of the Somme, 1916. Its strategic conception sprang from the Somme, for, in conjunction with the other attacks, stillborn or prematurely deceased, planned for the spring of 1917, it was an effort to complete the overthrow of German power and manpower which it was believed that only the onset of winter had prevented on the Somme. Its strategic failure was the outcome partly of the situation produced by the Somme and partly of the inability of the higher command to forget the barren methods employed on the Somme. And the germ of the Arras plan dated from the time of the Somme. For as early as June, 1916, a plan known as the Blair of Ill project had been drawn up for a blow near Arras to take place as a supplement to the Somme offensive. Postponed because of the immense casualties on the Somme, which drew off all available forces to that human sump pit, it was revived and extended in October as part of the spring plan. The gradual British advance eastwards on the Somme had left a German-held bulge between it and Arras, a bulge of which Gomcourt formed the westernmost point. This bulge seemed to offer the opportunity for a right and left hand blow on the respective sides. Converging towards Cambrai. If successful this might not only cut off the German forces holding the bulge, but create a gap too wide for the German reserves to block, and so pave the way for an advance towards Valenciennes and against the enemy's line of communications and retreat through the Belgian trough. On November 18, 1916, the Allied commanders in chief met at Chantilly to discuss their plans for 1917, and the outcome was that early in February the British 4th and 5th armies should resume their Somme offensive on the southern side of the Gomcourt bulge, while the 3rd Army, Allenby, 
struck on the northern side from Arras. After gaining Montgillary Oxalanby was to push southeast to close the German lines of retreat along the Kogil Valley, and, if possible, the Sensi Valley also. In conjunction, the First Army, Horn, was to attack immediately north of the Third and form a defensive flank, and the French to attack south of the Somme. Three weeks later the French blow was to be launched in Champagne, an undue delay if the two main blows were to react on each other. But the whole scheme was dissolved by a combination of French action, British hesitation, and German anticipation. The French action took the form of dismissing their commander-in-chief, Joffre, whose bubble reputation had been pricked by the unconcealable evidence of ill-preparedness at Verdun and, less justly, by the lack of success on the Somme. He was replaced by Neville, the popular hero of the Verdun Reposts, whose appointment caused a change in the plan for 1917, towards greater aims and also towards giving the French a more spectacular role. In consequence the British had to take over more of the front, to the impairment of their own offensive projects. Tactlessness on one side and sensitiveness on the other produced a time-wasting series of arguments that caused a delay in the Allied offensive. And before it could begin the Germans had disrupted its foundation, by a strategic withdrawal not merely from the Gomcourt bulge, but from the whole of their old and indented front between Arras and Soissons. An absurd attempt was made to picture this as a British triumph and the fruit, even if a little late in garnering, of the Somme offensive. It was the fruit, but not in the sense which the British command suggested, for the method of petty limited attacks pursued throughout the autumn had given the Germans ample opportunity to dig, literally and metaphorically, a pit for their assailants. Straightening their front by retiring to the newly built Hindenburg line, they left the British to follow laboriously through the intervening desert which, with immense thoroughness of destruction, they had created. By nullifying the Allies' preparations for attack this withdrawal restricted them to the sectors on the two flanks of the evacuated area. The main role in the British attack thus fell to the Third Army under Allenby. If he could break through the old defences just to the north of where the Hindenburg line ended, he would automatically take this line in flank and rear. But in anticipation of such a move the Germans had dug a switch line from Quiant, near the northern end of the Hindenburg line through Drocourt, covering the rear of the old defences north of Arras. Thus Allenby's whole chance of strategic success depended on whether he could reach and break through this partially completed switch line, some five miles behind the front system, before the German reserves could arrive in strength. Surprise was the only key which could open this gate. Because of this the real drama of the Arras offensive lies in the preliminary discussions and preparations even more than in the battle itself. Surprise had been discarded in the Somme offensive, except on July 14. Indeed, this master key of all the great captains of history had been rusting since the spring of 1915. The two means by which surprise could be obtained, and the Drocourt Quiant switch reached in time were by launching a mass of tanks or by a hurricane bombardment, brief but intense. The first means became impossible owing to the slowness in delivering new tanks after the discouraging reports made upon them in 1916, so that sixty old machines were all that could be scraped together. Allenby and his artillery adviser, Holland, were anxious to have the shortest possible bombardment, and originally proposed that it should last only 48 hours. If this, according to later standards, was more than 40 hours too long, it was a tentative step in the direction of surprise. But the higher command was faithful to the theory of prolonged bombardment, and had a deep-rooted distrust of such an innovation. Nevertheless Allenby stood firm until General Headquarters hit upon the deft device of promoting his artillery adviser to another sphere and replacing him by one who shared their view. Then the plan of a five days bombardment, proceeded by three weeks of wire cutting, was adopted. This, together with the two visible preparations, spelt the doom of surprise. In the bombardment 2,879 guns, 989 heavy, took part, 
a gun to every nine yards. The most vivid impression of the British disregard for surprise at Arras is perhaps to be found in the German account of the counter preparations which they were able to make during the three weeks' notice. They were so clearly given dash field and heavy artillery in long columns awoke the approach roads of the hinterland, flying corps formations and machine gun units. Responded to the call. Innumerable crowds of working parties labored day and night. At the repair and deepening of the defense system. Night and day in unbroken sequence trains from the homeland laden with material and munitions reached the main depots. Mountains of shell were piled up in the ammunition dumps. The construction of the defenses and the organization of the troops was completed. The enemy could come, the troops had now the word. Ludendorff himself visited the sector and was satisfied that although the British might break into the forward positions, if they liked to pay the price, they would then be held up by his new system of defense in depth. The difficulties, however, were not all of German manufacture. General Charteris, the head of Haig's intelligence service, has provided a significant sidelight in his diary notes at the time. Allenby shares one peculiarity with Douglas Haag, he cannot explain verbally, with any lucidity at all, what his plans are. In a conference between the two of them it is rather amusing. D. H. hardly ever finishes a sentence, and Allenby's sentences, although finished, do not really convey exactly what he means. They understand one another perfectly. Dash other evidence throws a doubt on this point. Dash but as each of their particular staffs only understands their immediate superior, a good deal of explanation of details has to be gone into afterwards. At these army conferences, no one dares to interfere. In smaller points, Allenby still sought for surprise, notably in linking up the underground sewers and quarries of Arras, S.D. Sauvre, and Renville in order to shelter two divisions which were to pass underground and leapfrog through the leading divisions. Another feature of the plan was that after the three assaulting corps of the Third Army had broken the enemy's first system of defense, the Cavalry Corps, Kavana, and 18 Corps, Max, were to pass through in the center between the human buttresses, and drive forward towards the switch line. Partly for concealment, the daring risk was taken of moving this pursuit force through the city of Arras, whose houses extended almost up to the front line. This plan, refreshingly ingenious, was vitiated, however, not only by the absence of initial surprise, but by the comparatively narrow front of the opening attack, about 12 miles. Thus the central bottleneck was, in turn, so narrow that its end could be easily stopped. Ludendorff in his Vilna offensive in the autumn of 1915 had revealed a better method, a dual penetration by two horns goring their way into the enemy's front, while through the wide gap between the horns the pursuit force unexpectedly issued. A fundamental defect of the Arras plan, moreover, was the width of its base compared with its fighting front, the routes of supply and reinforcement all converging on Arras with the result that the narrow mouth of this bottleneck became utterly congested. When the initial attack failed to make the progress anticipated, this congestion was increased by the arrival of the cavalry in the forward area, although the experience of 1915 and 1916 had shown that such advance was futile unless and until a wide path had been swept clear of the enemy. Yet if the strategic object was practically forfeited before zero hour on April 9, the tactical success was at first a vivid and enheartening contrast to all previous British offensives. The new British gas shell was most effective in paralyzing the defending artillery, for it not only compelled the gun crews to keep on their gas masks for hours at a time, but by killing off their horses like flies prevented ammunition being brought up. The attack was delivered by the 7. Vian 17 Corps of the 3rd Army and the Canadian Corps of the 1st Army. On the extreme right, or south, lay Snow 7 Corps, with the 21st Division near Croy Isles forming a pivot on which the rest of the Corps, the 14th, 30th and 56th, 1st London, Divisions, advanced. To their left lay Haldanes Vi Corps, with the 3rd, 12th and 15th Divisions attacking and the 37th Division waiting to leapfrog through and seize the key position of Monchilary Ux. 
the Marsi Valley of the Scar, the boundary between the Vicor and its neighbours, separated the British right and left wings. North of the Scarp the attack was entrusted to Ferguson's 17 Corps, composed of the 9th, 34th and 51st Divisions, with the 4th to leapfrog through the 9th on the Corps right. Farthest north of all, Bunn's Canadian Corps was to assault the Elome and Vimy Ridge, which had so long proved an impregnable barrier to the Allied forces. The capture of a large part of the ridge on April 9 gained all the greater éclat from the fame, or, to the Allies, ill fame, which this ridge had acquired. The Canadian's feat was as finely prepared as it was executed. Yet it is but just to recognize that in one important condition the task was easier than farther south, for the very fact of attacking uphill gave the attackers here better artillery observation and drier ground than those who had to traverse the sodden or marshy area near the scarp. At 5.30 am the assaulting infantry moved forward on the whole front, covered by a superbly timed creeping barrage, and in less than an hour almost the whole German first line system was captured. North of the Scarp the success continued, and after the leading divisions had gained their three successive objectives, the 4th Division passed through on the core right, and by seizing Fampu breached the last German line in front of the Drocourt Quint switch. But south of the Scarp the German resistance, first at the railway triangle and telegraph hill, then on the one court Fuki line, helped by machine guns from Monchillery Ux Hill was so strong that it badly delayed, although it could not stop, the advance of the 12th and 15th Divisions. Thus the reserve 37th Division could not pass through that day, and behind them the cavalry had moved up not only in vain but to add to the congestion. The results of the opening day had been greater and quicker, both in prisoners and progress, than in any previous offensive, yet they had extinguished the dim hope of a strategic breakthrough. A contributory factor was the misuse of the tanks. With only 60 machines available it would have been wiser to have concentrated them in aid of the vital effort to gain Monchillery Ux instead of spreading them over the front. The error was repeated in the next phase, whereas, if all available tanks had been concentrated on the south side of the salient formed by the first day's attack, they could have taken the German resistance in enfilade and might have rolled it up. So on April 10 the 3rd Army butted direct at a stiffening resistance, with its guns too far back to support the infantry. Not until the morning of April 11 did the arrival of four tanks help a battalion of the 37th Division to seize Monchillery Ux, driving in a wedge which was, however, too narrow and too late. That same morning, part of Goff's 5th Army launched a converging assault from the south against the Hindenburg Line in an attempt to relieve the pressure of German opposition to the Third Army. It was a desperate remedy for a despairing situation. For this army, after painfully toiling over the evacuated area, had neither been able to make the preparations nor to bring up the artillery necessary for a normal trench attack, far less an assault on the massive defences of the Hindenburg Line. The difficulty led to a novel expedient which contained the germ of the method which was triumphantly successful later at Cambrai. But instead of 381 tanks as at Cambrai, only 11 could be gathered. As artillery support was deficient, this handful of tanks was to act as a mobile barrage and wire destroyer, leading the 4th Australian Division against the Hindenburg line near Bullcourt. The gamble failed, the preparations were too hasty, the resources inadequate and the front too narrow. For a few hours there was an illusion of success. If the tanks arrived too late for their intended role, they at least helped to distract the enemy's attention, and caused a panic which sent part of the German garrison fleeing across the countryside. The Australians broke into the Hindenburg line, but then became the target of counter-attack from all sides while the illusion of a sweeping advance prevented the artillery from protecting them. With better security the gain might have been held, but the British could hardly have done more, as the obstinate German resistance at Henninland One Court, to the right of the Third Army, prevented any chance of the two armies joining hands. Next morning a gallant assault by the 21st and 56th, 1st London, divisions conquered these two bastions, 
but the increasing intensity of German counterattacks brought the first and main phase of the offensive to a close on April 14. If strategic success had been missed, 13,000 prisoners and 200 guns had been taken. The next phase had little result to put in relief against the depressing total of British casualties. The French offensive of April 16 on the Aisne, to which Arras had been the prelude, proved a worse downfall, shattering Nivelle's extravagant hopes and predictions, and burying his career in its ruins. The British were not ready to resume their offensive until a week later, and although Haig decided to continue the full pressure of the British offensive. In order to assist our allies, there was by then no French advance to assist. On April 23rd and 24th, Allenby pushed forward his line, at heavy cost and against heavy pressure, to include Map and Gavril. At a conference of the army commanders on April 30th, Haig showed that he placed little faith in the possibility of a further French offensive, but decided to continue his own attacks, to move steadily forward up to a good defensive line. Despite fruitless assaults and sacrifices on May 3rd and 5th, bald headed assaults which showed more obstinacy than imagination or care, this line was not reached, and the offensive which had been prolonged to so bitter a conclusion was at last broken off. The British offensive centre of gravity was then transferred to the north, to open as brilliantly at Messines on June 7, and to fade out still more miserably in the swamps of Pass Kendale in October. 17 to the siege war masterpiece, Messines on June 7, 1917, took place a battle which on the morrow was hailed as a brilliant military achievement, and which today, unlike so many historically tarnished masterpieces of 1914-18, stands out in even higher relief. For we appreciate now that the capture of the Messines Ridge by General Plumer's Second Army was almost the only true siege warfare attack made throughout a siege war. It was also one of the few attacks until late in 1918 in which the methods employed by the command completely fitted the facts of the situation. But if today its abiding historic interest lies in its perfect suitability of method, at the time this was overshadowed, and rightly, by its value as a moral tonic. Perhaps this was almost too strong a stimulant to those not in direct charge of the operation leading them to place too high hopes in the subsequent operations at Ypres, where the conditions were different and the methods also. But such a reflection does not dim the value of Messines, which came as a tonic badly needed after the depressing end of the spring offensive at Arras and on the Aisne. While Pitain was striving to rally and rejuvenate the French army, Haig decided to transfer the weight of his attack to Flanders, and, as a preliminary step to his main action at Ypres, to fulfill his long-formed plan of securing the high ground about Messines and Wicke Eat as a flank bastion to the April advance. For while in German possession it gave the enemy complete observation of the British trenches and forward battery positions, enabled them to command the communications up to the April salient, and to take in enfilade, or even reverse, the trench positions therein. Preparations had been begun nearly a year before although their real development dated from the winter. Thus, when Haig asked Plumer, on May 7, when he would be ready to deliver the Messon's attack, Plumer was able to say, a month from today dash and keep his promise exactly. The calm confidence of this business-like statement betrays no sign of the anxiety suffered, nor does it do justice to the willpower demanded of Plumer in carrying through his purpose. The key factor in the success was the simultaneous explosion of 19 great mines, containing 600 tons of explosives and involving the tunneling of 8,000 yards of gallery since January, in the face of active countermining by the enemy. A couple of months before the attack it was reported to Plumer that the Germans were within 18 inches of the mine at Hill 60, and that the only thing to do was to blow it. Plumer was firm in his refusal, and equally staunch under the wearing strain of ominous rumours and reports throughout the following weeks. His justification came at 3.10 am on June 7, when this mine went up along with 18 others, only one out of twenty had been blown up by the Germans. Another example of his willpower was in withstanding strong and insidious pressure from General Headquarters to change his artillery advisor. 
before the Arras offensive the same thing had happened with the Third Army, and Allenby's artillery plan had been radically modified, to the loss of all hope of surprise, by the removal of his artillery advisor to another sphere and his replacement by one who gave a different opinion. But before Messins, Plumer resisted all attempts at a change, and finally quelled them by saying flatly that as long as he was responsible he intended to have his own men. If Plumer could be strong in resisting expert advice at need, no commander was more keen to secure it from all sources, and none weighed it more carefully, as a foundation for his own decision. In Harrington, he had a chief of his general staff of blended intelligence and sympathy. And their happy combination was a symbol of the cooperation which was diffused throughout the Second Army staff and through them to the fighting troops. Trust and receptiveness to ideas and criticisms were the keynotes of the Second Army. They were instanced in the schools and courses behind the front, where free questioning and criticism were encouraged, while an answer and a reason to any point raised was always forthcoming. They were also marked in the preparation of an attack, where other high commanders were apt to lay down a series of objectives which their troops must gain. Plumer's method was to suggest certain provisional lines, and then to discuss them, and each fraction of them, with the corps and divisional commanders concerned, adjusting the several objectives to the local conditions and opinions until a final series was pieced together like a mosaic, on which all were agreed. Further, the impartial common sense of his judgment was shown by the fact that, although he could oppose technical advice from general headquarters when it conflicted with reality, he welcomed it when it coincided. The Western Front in 1914-18 was pre-eminently an engineer's war, yet historians will be perplexed at the small part played by engineers in its direction, and the overweening influence of cavalry and infantry doctrine in the attempt to solve its problems. Messins, however, was in sharp contrast, for here the methods and the training were largely based on a manual, SS 155, compiled by the engineers from their special knowledge and experience of siege warfare. For Messens was to be a strict siege operation, the capture of a fortified salient at the minimum cost of lives by the maximum substitution of mind, in preparation, and material, in execution, for human bodies. Mines, artillery, tanks, and gas all played their part. But a contrary wind curtailed most of the scheme of gas projection, and the effect of the mines and artillery was so overwhelming that the tanks were hardly needed. On a front of just over nine miles a total of 2,338 guns, of which 828 were heavy, were concentrated. There were also 304 large trench mortars. Thus the artillery strength here was approximately one gun to every seven yards of front, or 240 to the mile, five and a half tons of ammunition were thrown on each yard of front. The fact that the attack would converge against a salient increased its chances, but it complicated the staff, troop and artillery organization of the attack. For the sectors of each attacking corps were of varying depths and contracted more and more in width up to the final objective which was the cord of the arc forming the salient. As, however, it was a siege operation, without any attempt at exploitation or a breakthrough, it was easy to avoid the congestion which had occurred at Arras. And the problem was further simplified by the plan of so alerting sectors that five of the divisions had sectors of equal breadth from front to rear, while the four which filled the interstices had smaller tasks. Further, when the main ridge was captured, fresh troops were to leapfrog through to gain the final lowest Tivan line across the base of the salient. Dot meticulous organization and forethought marked every stage of the preparation, but this was based on personal touch, staff officers continually visiting the units and trenches, not on paper reports and instructions. Another feature was the special intelligence scheme, whereby the information obtained from prisoners ground and air observation and reconnaissance, photography, wireless interception, and sound ranging, was swiftly conveyed to an army center, established for a fortnight at Lorca Chateau, and then sifted and disseminated by summaries and maps. The bombardment and wire cutting began on May 21, were developed on May 28, and culminated in a seven days intense bombardment, 
mingled with practice barrages to test the arrangements. The consequent forfeiture of surprise did not matter in the Messin's stroke, a purely limited attack, in contrast to that at Arras, where it had been fatal to the hope of a breakthrough. For although there was no surprise there was surprise effect, produced by the mines and the overwhelming fire, and this lasted long enough to gain the short-distanced objectives that had been set. The point, and the distinction between actual surprise and surprise effect, are of significance to the theory of warfare. It was fortunate, however, for the British that the Germans played into their hands. When the attack preparations were suspected, Ruprecht's chief of staff, Kull, had made the suggestion to evacuate the salient and withdraw behind the Lys. But the corps commanders maintained the traditional belief in the value of commanding positions, and their opinion prevailed. Obsessed by the soldierly conviction that ground should never be given voluntarily, they even insisted on holding the forward positions in strength. Thus German stupidity made possible the success of the British plan, preventing the short step to the rear that would have nullified the British mines and wasted the labor devoted to them. In the British plan nine infantry divisions, with three more close up in reserve, were to advance to the assault. On the right, or south flank, was the two Anzac Corps, godly, composed of the 3rd Australian, New Zealand, and 25th Divisions, with the 4th Australian Division behind. In the centre came the 9 Corps, Hamilton Gordon, the attack here being led by the 36th, 16th, and 19th Divisions, with the 11th in reserve. On the left was the X Corps, Moreland, composed of the 41st, 47th, and 23rd Divisions, backed up by the 24th. At 3.10 am on June 7, the 19 mines were blown, wrecking large portions of the Germans' front trenches. Simultaneously, the barrage fell. When the debris and shock of the mines subsided, the infantry advanced, and within a few minutes, the whole of the enemy's front line system was overrun, almost without opposition. Resistance stiffened as the penetration was deepened, but the training of the infantry and the efficiency of the barrage, based on the finest shades of calculation, enabled continuous progress to be made, and within three hours the whole crest of the ridge was secured. The New Zealand division had cleared the intricate fortifications of Messins itself, here the pace of the barrage was regulated to 100 yards in 15 minutes instead of the general pace of 100 yards in 3 minutes. The garrisons of Wikaeet and the White Chateau held out for some time, but the first village was captured after a fierce struggle by troops of the 36th, Ulster, and 16th, Irish, divisions in a combined effort, a feat of symbolical significance. Perhaps the most difficult sector was that of the 47th. 2nd London, Division, which had not only to overcome the highly fortified position of the White Chateau, but had the Ypres Cummins Canal as an oblique interruption across its line of advance. The Londoners, however, overcame both and by 10 a.m. the objective of the first phase was reached along the whole attacking line. While it was being consolidated, over 40 batteries were moved forward to support the next pounce. At 3.10 pm, the reserve divisions and tanks leapfrogged through, and within an hour almost the whole of the final objective was captured. Some 7,000 prisoners had been taken, apart from dead and wounded, at a cost to the attacker of only 16,000 casualties. The success had been so complete that only feeble counterattacks were attempted that day. When the expected general counterattack was launched on the whole front on the morrow, it failed everywhere against defences that had been rapidly and firmly organised, and in the recoil yielded the British still more ground. The peculiar glory of the Messon's attack is that, whereas in 1918 the decline in the German power of resistance brought the conditions to meet the methods almost as much as the methods were developed to meet the conditions, on June 7, 1917, the methods were perfectly attuned to a resisting power then at its height. 17 3 The road to pass Kendaly on July 31, 1917, began what is termed the Third Battle of Ypres. And it is symbolical of its course and its issue that it is commonly spoken of by the title of Pass Kendale, 
which in reality was merely the last scene of the gloomiest drama in British military history. Although called the Third Battle, it was not a battle, but rather a campaign, with the fighting more defined than the purpose, of the nature so familiar in the military annals of Flanders. And the Low Countries generally? And, like its German forerunners of 1914 and 1915, it achieved little except loss, in which, again, it repeated the earlier history of this theatre of war. So fruitless in its results, so depressing in its direction was this 1917 offensive, that Paskendale has come to be, like Walcher a century before, a synonym for military failure, a name blackboarded in the records of the British Army. Even the inexhaustible powers of endurance and sacrifice shown by the combatants, or the improved executive leadership which did much in the later stages to minimize their sufferings, tend to be not merely overshadowed, but eclipsed in memory by the futility of the purpose and result. What was the origin and what the object of Third Ypres? An offensive in this sector had formed part of Haig's original contribution to the Allied plan for 1917. Its actual inauguration had been postponed by the unfortunate turn of events elsewhere. When the ill success of the opening offensive in the spring at Arras and in Champagne was followed by the threatened collapse of the French army as a fighting force, Haig's first aid treatment was to allow the British offensive at Arras, by the Third Army, to continue for some weeks longer with the general object of keeping the Germans occupied, and with the local object of reaching a good defensive line. When successive thrusts, against an enemy now fully warned and strengthened, failed to reach this line, Haig decided to transfer the main weight of this effort northward to Flanders, as he had originally intended. An intense conviction of the importance of giving the enemy no respite inspired him to press on with an offensive policy, even though French cooperation was lacking. His remarks, at the conference of the army commanders on April 30, show that in his own mind he had practically written off the French share as a bad debt on the balance sheet of 1917. It is right to emphasize that, at this moment, Haig's opinion of the strategy to pursue was supported by the Prime Minister, who was in favor of continuing the offensive provided that the French took a vigorous part in it. But it soon became clear that this essential condition would not be fulfilled and thenceforward he tried in vain to restrain Haig. If the need to distract the enemy's attention from the French, the crisis at sea caused by the submarine campaign, and the need to second the still possible Russian offensive, combined to justify Haig's decision in May, the situation had radically changed before the main offensive was actually launched on July 31. In war all turns on the time factor. By July the French army, under Pitain's treatment, was recuperating, if still convalescent, the height of the submarine crisis was past, and the revolutionary paralysis of the Russian army was clear. Nevertheless, the plans of the British High Command were unchanged. The historian may consider that insufficient attention was given to the lessons of history, of recent experience, and of material facts in deciding both upon the principle of a major offensive and upon its site. The axis of the attack diverged from, instead of converging on, the German main communications, so that an advance could not vitally endanger the security of the enemy's position in France. Haag curiously was to adopt here the same eccentric direction of advance which a year later his advice prevented Fock and Pershing from taking on the other flank of the Western Front. Thus an advance on the Belgian coast offered no wide strategic results and for the same reason it was hardly the best direction even as a means of pinning and wearing down the enemy's strength on a profitable basis. Moreover, the idea that Britain's salvation from starvation depended on the capture of the submarine bases on this coast has long since been exploded, for the main submarine campaign was conducted from German ports. The story of how this delusion was fostered is a curious one. In the middle of June, Haig was called home to see a cabinet which had grown uneasy over his offensive schemes. Its members were agreed in wishing to postpone serious operations until the French had recovered and the Americans had arrived on the scene, 
and to save up their strength for 1918. Haig marshaled his arguments, and committed himself to the definite opinion that if the fighting was kept up at its present intensity for six months Germany would be at the end of her available manpower. Here he went beyond even the estimate of his optimistic intelligence service, which had at least made its forecast dependent on Russia's continued efforts. As the cabinet were growing skeptical of military arithmetic, Haig's arguments failed to make the impression he had hoped. Suddenly, the Admiralty came to the rescue of his plans, by telling the cabinet that the navy could not keep going unless the Germans were turned out of the Belgian coast. Even in high military quarters, as the chief of Haag's intelligence staff has admitted, no one really believed this rather amazing view. But it served as a welcome lever to make the cabinet give way, as was the result. The real source of the offensive, more potent than any of the arguments with which he buttressed his case, seems to have been Haig's optimistic belief that he could defeat the German armies single handed, in Flanders. In large measure, it was to be a battle fought for British prestige. If such a single handed design had little support in the history of war, the geography of Flanders offered still less. A plan that was founded on faith rather than on reason, both plan and faith were to be sunk in the mud of Flanders. Fock, himself the past exponent of faith healing strategy, forecast the verdict when he deprecated the British offensive as a duck's march and expressively remarked Botch is bad and Boo is bad, but Botch and Boo together. Haag adopted the plan in face of formidable facts. His meteorological advisers had collated weather statistics, based on the records of 80 years, which showed that he could not hope for more than a fortnight, or at the best three weeks, of fine weather. Worse still, the Ypres offensive was doomed before it began, by its own destruction of the intricate drainage system in this part of Flanders. The legend has been fostered that these ill-famed swamps of Pascandale were a piece of ill luck due to the heavy rain, a natural and therefore unavoidable hindrance that could not be foreseen. In reality, before the battle began, a memorandum was sent by Tank Corps headquarters to General Headquarters pointing out that if the Ypres area and its drainage were destroyed by bombardment, the battlefield would become a swamp. This memorandum was the result of information from the Belgian Pontset Chaucis and local investigation. The facts had, indeed, been brought to light by the engineers in 1915, but apparently forgotten. The area had been reclaimed from marshland by centuries of labor, and in consequence, the farmers of the district were under penalty to keep their dikes clear. Land used for pasture was such because it was subject to flooding and too wet for cultivation. In the disregard of this warning is epitomized the main and inevitable cause of the barren results of the Passchendaele offensive. Perhaps the very brilliance of the preliminary stroke at Messins on June 7 had helped to raise unfounded expectations over what was in conception and purpose a totally different operation. Nearly two months passed before the preparations for the main advance were completed, and during that interval the Germans had ample warning to prepare countermeasures. These comprised a new method of defence, as suited to the waterlogged ground as the British offensive methods were unsuited. Instead of the old linear systems of trenches they developed a system of disconnected strong points and concrete pillboxes, distributed in great depth, whereby the ground was held as much as possible by machine guns and as little as possible by men. While the forward positions were lightly occupied. The reserves thus saved were concentrated in rear for prompt counter-attack, to eject the British troops from the positions they had arduously gained. And the farther the British advanced the more highly developed, naturally, did they find the system. Moreover, by the introduction of mustard gas the Germans scored a further trick, interfering seriously with the British artillery and concentration areas. Thus, when the fully expected blow fell. The Crown Prince Ruprecht was so far freed from his usual pessimism as to record in his diary dash my mind is quite at rest about the attack, as we have never disposed of such strong reserves, so well trained for their part, as on the front attacked. This actual front was held by the troops of the German 4th Army, 6th von Arnim. The certainty that the Germans were aware of the coming offensive, and would be moving up reserves, 
led the chief of Haig's intelligence staff to urge that the attack should be advanced by three days in spite of the fact that our preparations were not fully completed, it was a choice of evils. But the army commanders pressed for delay, and Haig reluctantly accepted their view. There was also a difference of view over the extent of the initial aim. Here Goff, like Rawlinson on the Somme, wished to make a series of limited advances, but Plume urged that after so long a preparation they should go all out dash and Haig once again inclined to a breakthrough aim. The main role in the attack was given to Goff's 5th Army, with one corps of the 2nd Army playing a subsidiary part on the right flank, and a French corps on the left. The British artillery strength totaled 3,091 guns, of which 999 were heavy, an average of one gun to every six yards. During the bombardment, four and a quarter million shells were fired, 22 million pounds worth. It meant that four and three quarter tons were thrown for every yard of the front. The bombardment proper opened on July 22 and continued for 10 days until at 3.50 am on July 31st the infantry of 12 divisions advanced on an 11 mile front to the accompaniment of torrential rain. On the left substantial progress was made, Bix Scoot, St Julian, and the Pilkham Ridge being gained, and the line of the Steenbeek reached. The Green Line, third objective, was attained in most places, an advance of nearly two miles. But on the right, in the more vital sector round the Menin Road, the attack was held up, short of the second objective. And the rain continued day after day, postponing the next major attempt, and hastening the conversion of the undrainable ground into a swamp in which first the tanks and ere long even the infantry were bogged. Even the ardent Goff informed the commander in chief that tactical success was not possible, or would be too costly, under such conditions and advised that the attack should be abandoned. But Haig was too determined, and still too optimistic, to be thus dissuaded. And it would seem that none of the army commanders ventured to press contrary views with the strength that the facts demanded. One of the lessons of the war, exemplified at Pass L, is certainly the need of allowing more latitude in the military system for intellectual honesty and moral courage. As it was, Haig continued to send home to the War Office confident reports that the enemy were fast approaching the exhaustion of their forces, actually, Ludendorff was making preparations not only to attack the Russians at Riga but to crush the Italians by sending eight or ten divisions to reinforce the Austrians. Haig's report, indeed, had gone much further than those his intelligence furnished. The second blow, on August 16, was a diminished replica of the first in its results. The left wing was again advanced across the shallow depression formed by the little valley of the Steenbeek and past the ruins of what had been Landmark. But on the right, where alone an advance might have a strategic effect, a heavy price was paid for naught. The tally of prisoners shrank from six to a mere two thousand. Nor did men feel that the enemy's skillful resistance and the mud were the sole explanation of their fruitless sacrifice. Complaints against the direction and staff work in Goff's army were general and bitter, and their justness seemed to receive recognition when Haig extended the Second Army's front northward to include the Menin Road sector, and thereby entrusted to Plume the direction of the main advance towards the ridge east of Ypres. It was a thankless task at the best, for the experience of war attested the futility of pressing on in places where failure had already become established, and it seemed heavy odds that the laurels earned by Messons must become submerged in the swamps beyond deeper. Yet, in the outcome, the reputation of Plumer and the Second Army Staff, headed by Harrington, was enhanced, less because of what was achieved in scale than because more was achieved than could reasonably have been expected in so hopeless a venture. Applying, as at Messins, siege warfare methods to a task that was more a siege than a battle. Their plan was that of a series of shallow advances, not pressed beyond the point where the artillery support was outrun, and leaving both the infantry fresh enough and the artillery close enough to deal with the inevitable counter attacks. Bad weather and the need for preparation delayed the resumption of the offensive until September 20, but that morning the Second Army attack, on a four mile front, 
achieved success in the area of previous failure, on either side of the Menin Road. Six divisions, two being Australian, were used, but infantry were kept down to the minimum with artillery at the maximum. Plumer had 1,295 guns, a gun to every five yards. Of these 575 were heavy, which meant one to every 12 yards compared with one to 18 on July 31. The infantry advanced at 5.40 am, by 6.15 am the first objective was gained almost unopposed, and, with the exception of one or two strong points, the third and last objective was gained soon after midday, and the counter-attacks were repulsed by fire. A fresh spring on September 26, and another on October 4, the last a larger one on an eight-mile front, by troops of eight divisions, four Anzac, in the Second Army, and of four in the Fifth Army on the left flank, gave the British possession of the main ridge east of Ypres, with Galuveld, Polygonwood, and Brood Sind, despite torrents of rain, which made the battlefield a worse morass than ever. And on each occasion the majority of the counter-attacks had broken down under fire, a result which owed much to the good observation work of the Royal Flying Corps and the quick response of the artillery. Some 10,000 prisoners were swallowed in the three bites, and this widening more frightened the enemy into modifying his elastic tactics and strengthening his forward troops, to their increased loss under the British artillery fire. These attacks had at last done something to restore prestige, if they could have little strategic effect on a campaign which was foredoomed, and in which both the time and the scope for extensive penetration had long since vanished. Unhappily, the higher command decided to continue the pointless offensive during the few remaining weeks before the winter, and thereby used up reserves which might have saved the belated experiment of Cambrai from bankruptcy. For having wasted the summer and his strength in the mud, where tanks foundered and infantry floundered, Haig turned in November to dry ground, where a decisive success went begging for lack of reserves. At Ypres, the comparative success of the late September attacks produced an unfortunate intoxication. On the evening of October 4, the chief of the intelligence staff expressed the opinion that there were no fresh enemy reserves within immediate reach of the battlefront. Actually, fresh German divisions began to take over the line next day. Before the next attack on October 9, the whole of the battered front was held by fresh troops, and an extra division had been inserted, even the sober Second Army staff seemed to have been momentarily carried away, and at a conference with the war correspondents Harrington said that the crest of the ridge was as dry as a bone. The Australian official history records the impression of one who was present. I believe the official attitude is that Pass Kendale Ridge is so important that tomorrow's attack is worth making whether it succeeds or fails. I suspect that they are making a great, bloody experiment, a huge gamble. I feel, and most of the correspondents feel, terribly anxious. I thought the principle was to be hit, 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 whenever the weather is suitable. If so, it is thrown over at the first temptation. The anxiety of the correspondents was to prove more justifiable than the hopes of the military chiefs. There had been rain each day since October 4, and on the afternoon of the 8th it became torrential. The meteorological experts said that no improvement could be expected. Yet Haig decided to press on, and his army commanders, although dubious, did not care to protest. So next morning the attack was launched, again on an eight-mile front, and proved a tragic fiasco, except in the low ground on the left. The curious nature of military judgment is illustrated in the diary of Haig's chief intelligence officer, October 8, with a great success tomorrow, and good weather for a few more weeks, we may still clear the coast and win the war before Christmas. October 10, D.H. sent for me. He was still trying to find some grounds for hope that we might still win through here this year, but there is none. Nevertheless, a fresh attack was ordered for the 12th, with still deeper objectives. Goff doubted its wisdom, but Plumer had decided that an attack was practicable, and he gave the order on the 10th. At this moment little was known of the true experiences and results of the recent fight, Australian official history. 
there was still time to find out, but this duty seems to have been neglected. After a nude rain on the 11th, Goff, to his credit, telephoned to Plumer to suggest a postponement. But after consulting Godly, the Corps commander mainly concerned, Plumer preferred to continue. Next day the would-be dash for pass Candel ended with the attacking troops, save those who perished in the mud, back almost on their starting line. Heg now seems to have realized there was no foundation for anticipating a great strategic success. But he was determined to reach pass Candel, and for this purpose brought up the Canadian Corps. Meantime a combined attack by the 5th Army and the French was tried, with small result on October 22nd. On the 26th the Second Army made its fresh effort with the Canadians and suffered a fresh disappointment. They tried again on the 30th, while the 5th Army loyally yet skeptically struggled to advance alongside Dash 300 yards or so being the limit. Progress so trifling, save in its cost, was largely explained by the exhaustion caused in pushing forward over a morass and to the fact that the mud not only got into and jammed rifles and machine guns, but nullified the effect of the shell bursts. The attacker's troubles were augmented by the enemy's increasing use of mustard gas, and by his renewed adoption of his tactics of holding the bulk of his troops well back for a counter-attack. Thus, when on November 4, a sudden advance by the 1st Division and 2nd Canadian Division gained the empty satisfaction of occupying the site of Pass Kendale Village. The official curtain was at last rung down on the pitiful tragedy of Third Ypres. It was the long overdue close of a campaign which had brought the British armies to the verge of exhaustion, one in which had been enacted the most dolorous scenes in British military history, and for which the only justification evoked the reply that, in order to absorb the enemy's attention and forces, Haig chose the spot most difficult for himself and least vital to his enemy. Intending to absorb the enemy's reserves, his own were absorbed. He was lured on by a lofty optimism that extended even to the cost. After the disappointing attack of July 31st, he advised the government that the enemy casualties exceeded the British not improbably by a hundred percent and in his final dispatch he still declared that it was certain that the enemy's loss considerably exceeded ours. That optimism was nourished by ignorance of the situation, due in part to the failure, a moral failure, of his subordinates to enlighten him. Perhaps the most damning comment on the plan which plunged the British army in this bath of mud and blood is contained in an incidental revelation of the remorse of one who was largely responsible for it. This highly placed officer from General Headquarters was on his first visit to the battlefront, at the end of the four months' battle. Growing increasingly uneasy as the car approached the swamp like edges of the battle area, he eventually burst into tears, crying, Good God! Did we really send men to fight in that? To which his companion replied that the ground was far worse ahead. If the exclamation was a credit to his heart it revealed on what a foundation of delusion and inexcusable ignorance his indomitable offensiveness had been based. The only relief to this sombre review is that a bare fortnight later was enacted, on a different stage, and with a technique suggested in early August, a curtain raiser which was to be developed into the glorious drama of autumn. 1918.7 scene for the tank surprise at Cambrai in November 19. 1917, the German troops in front of Cambrai were contemplating with undisturbed minds the apparent normality and comparative tranquility of the British lines opposite them, contrasting their own security in the massively fortified and comfortable trenches of the Hindenburg line with the unsavory lot of their comrades struggling in the shell-churned mudholes of the Ypres salient, indulging in self-congratulation not only on the impregnability of their famous line, but on the pertinacity of the unteachable English who had so engulfed themselves at Ypres that there could surely be no danger of any other assault elsewhere before winter came. On November 20, 381 tanks, followed by a relatively small proportion of infantry, rolled forward in the half light upon the astonished Germans without even the courtesy of a preliminary bombardment to announce their coming. Always good hosts. 
the Germans might well feel aggrieved at the omission of a warning which had customarily given them four or five days notice to prepare a suitable reception. On November 21st the bells of London rang out in joyous acclaim of a triumphant success that seemed the foretaste of victory, perhaps at no distant date. And Ludendorff, back at the German Supreme Command, was hurriedly preparing emergency instructions for a general retreat. Both the Bells and Ludendorff were premature, although prophetic, by some nine months. For on November 30th came a German retort so full of menace that the public thereafter showed a strong distaste for premature celebrations. Applause changed to reproaches, the cause of the disasters was the subject of inquiry, and in public opinion the name of Cambrai came to be associated more with the ultimate reverse than with the initial success. Actually, however, the fuller knowledge now available suggests that the black date in the national calendar should be the 20th, and not the 30th, of November. Yet gloomy as is this page of World War history, it forms one of the most striking examples of the proverb that every cloud has a silver lining. If November 20th, 1917, is in itself a tragedy of errors, its eventual effect on the fortunes of the Allies was beneficent pointing and paving the way to the victorious method of 1918, and, to take a still longer view, it is seen to be one of the landmarks in the history of warfare, the dawn of a new epoch. Thus we may say that the joy bells, if immediately wrong, were ultimately right. In contrast, the Germans failed to profit by the warning and later paid the penalty, as their official historians recognize. While the more far-sighted German officers urged the necessity of replying in kind to the new British method others argued that the further mechanization of the battle would impair the moral qualities of the troops. And their fervent traditionalism fathered the thought that the tank terror was more of a phantom than a real danger. The success of the counter-offensive was a support to men who did not care to face an unconventional reality, and the weight of conservative opinion prevailed as so often in the history of armies. Thus it was left for the post-war historians of the German army to record, in bitterness of soul, that the outwardly brilliant German offensive battle held within a deep tragedy. These eleven days form perhaps the most dramatic of all episodes in the World War. Yet, sensational as was their course in its abrupt change of fortune, the real story of Cambrai lies beneath the surface. First is the question of its origins, of paramount importance because it ushered in a new cycle of warfare. Its initial source is to be found nearly two years, and its immediate source nearly four months, earlier. The guiding idea of those who sponsored the tank in infancy had been to release it unexpectedly in a large concentration, and this idea had, as we have seen, not only been formulated but worked out in detail as early as February, 1916 seven months before a driblet of tanks was launched on the Somme under conditions which violated all the essentials therein laid down. Fortunately, in 1917, the headquarters of the tank corps in France, although unlike general headquarters they had not seen this memorandum, had come by experience to similar ideas. Further, the eternal yet too often underrated principle of surprise was deeply rooted in their minds and thus when insight apprised them in the very first days of Third Ypres, the Paskendale offensive, that the mudlark was futile, an alternative project was quick to blossom. The Chief General Staff Officer, Colonel Fuller, on August 3, 1917, drew up a plan for a great tank raid in a more suitable sector. In the preface to it this significant example of prevision may be read. From a tank point of view the Third Battle of Ypres may be considered dead. To go on using tanks in the present conditions will not only lead to good machines and better personnel being thrown away, but also to a loss of morale in the infantry and tank crews, through constant failure. From an infantry point of view, the Third Battle of Ypres may be considered comatose. It can only be continued at colossal loss and little gain. Then came the alternative proposal, in order to restore British prestige and strike a theatrical blow against Germany before the winter, it is suggested that preparations be at once set on foot to take St. Quentin. It was further pointed out that the operation was strategically a sound one as a preparatory step to an advance towards Lacat, 
and then Valanchine, the following year. Discussion of this project brought out the objection that it required a combined British and French operation, which might lack the simplicity and smooth working essential for the novel method to succeed. Therefore, on August 4, a second project was framed, for a tank raid south of Cambrai. The word raid should be stressed, for, as originally conceived, the object was to destroy the enemy's personnel and guns, to demoralize and disorganize him, and not to capture ground. As the preliminary notes stated, the duration of the raid must be short, 8 to 12 hours, so that little or no concentration of the enemy may be effected for counterattack. Had this been followed there would have been no need to lament the 30th November. The whole operation may be summed up as advance, hit, retire. Big raids of this description will not only reduce the enemy's fighting power, but will reduce his initiative with reference to any big battle which at the time may be in progress. Apostrophe for this raid a force of three tank brigades of two battalions each, and one, or better, two, divisions of infantry or cavalry, with extra artillery, was suggested, operating on an 8,000 yard front. The object, as proposed, was to raid the re-entrant formed by the Les Cortes T. Quentin Canal between Ribecourt Creveco Bantux. The raiding force was to be divided into three groups, the main one to scour the country in this canal enclosed pocket, while smaller groups formed offensive flanks on each side to protect the main operation. The essence of the entire operation is surprise and rapidity of movement. Three hours after zero the retirement might well begin. The tanks and aeroplanes operating as a rearguard to the dismounted cavalry retiring with their prisoners. The proposed sector lay in the area of the Third Army, under General Sir Julian Bung, and on August 5 the detailed project was taken informally to him by one of the tank corps brigadiers. Bung was receptive to the idea, although inclined to expand it from a raid into a breakthrough attack to gain Cambrai. Next day he went to general headquarters, saw Haag, and suggested a surprise attack with tanks at Cambrai in September. The commander-in-chief was favorable, but his chief of staff, General Kigel, offered strong objections on the ground that the army could not win a decisive battle in two places at once, and should rather concentrate every possible man in the Ypres sector, which, incidentally, he never visited until the campaign was over. Thus the enlarged idea helped to postpone the raid, as the refusal to recognize reality at Ypres postponed the attack at Cambrai until too late for decisive results to be possible. The historian, while respecting Kigel's emphasis on the principle of concentration, may doubt whether Ypres was a suitable site for the fulfillment of this principle, and may also hold that distraction of the enemy's force has ever been an essential complement to concentration of one's own effort. Kigel's objections sufficed to dissuade Haag who still valued the tank as only a minor factor. Thus the Cambrai project was postponed indefinitely, while the High Command persevered with their hopeless efforts in the past Kendale swamps. But neither Bung nor the tank corps were willing to let the idea drop, and certain opinions at general headquarters were in accord, so that as the April offensive became a more palpable failure, a readier ear was lent to an alternative which promised to redeem British prestige. Finally. In mid-October, the Cambrai plan was sanctioned, and fixed for November 20. But now the situation had changed for the worse, for, if the plan were crowned with success, that success must be barren for want of reserves to reap the harvest. The reapers were engulfed at Pass Kendale. It is just to recognize that if General Headquarters had missed the opportunity, General Headquarters had now perhaps a surer appreciation than the Third Army Command of the limitations imposed by their lack of means. Kigel urged that Blon Hill merely should be the first objective, followed by a lateral exploitation northward, and Haig put a time limit on the operation. But the Third Army orders were more ambitious in scope and objectives, despite the fact that all their available infantry divisions and tanks were being thrown into the initial breakthrough effort. Bung's plan was, 1, to break the German defensive system, the famous Hindenburg line, in the neck between the Canal de l'Escort and the Canal du Nord, 
2, to seize Cambrai, Blonwood and the passage over the river Sensee, 3, to cut off the Germans in the area south of the Sensee and west of the Canal du Nord, and, 4, to exploit the success towards Valenchine. The force allotted for this ambitious plan comprised the three, Pulteney, and four, Walcombe, Corps, each of three infantry divisions, the Cavalry Corps, Kavana, of three divisions, plus one under four corps, a total of 381 fighting tanks, and roughly 1,000 guns. Thus of the original project only the fundamental idea, the tank method, and the locality remained. Otherwise there were marked alterations, and in these lay the germ of disaster. The raid had been transformed into a large-scale offensive, with far-reaching aims. Instead of securing a pocket and withdrawing, an organized advance was to be made up a narrow lane, bounded by two canals. A protection to a raid, these became a danger to such an attack, circumscribing the action of the tanks and preventing the formation of tank offensive flanks. Otherwise the ground was good, mostly rolling down land, excellent for tank movement, it was marked by two features, the Flesquiers Havrin Court Ridge and Blon Hill. The fundamental weakness of the general plan, however, was not topographical, but the complete lack of reserves, unless the four cavalry divisions can be considered such, and the futility of so regarding them was amply shown in their fresh inability, in face of modern weapons, to influence the action. The six divisions employed in the initial attack were all that the third army commander had at his disposal, for a plan that visualized a penetration beyond Cambrai to Valenchine. It is extremely difficult to understand what was in mind as to the future, for without reserves complete success could only mean the creation of an excessively deep and narrow salient, requiring scores of divisions to hold it. It is true that the guards and one or two other divisions could be made available and were ultimately brought to the scene, but they were too far away for a prompt intervention. The situation, indeed, had some reminder of Luz. The French also moved a court to the Seine-Lesperon area just before the attack, but after the first day were told that they were no longer required. The best comment on this lack of reserves is contained in a story of General Francia Despera e, which won his on the authority of the officer to whom the words were spoken. A long motor ride, in search of information, brought him to a British headquarters at Albert. Entering, he interrogated a senior general staff officer, flinging at him a string of crisp questions as to the progress of the attack, its frontage, depth. Then came the final, the vital question, and where were your reserves? Mon general, we had none. The French commander exclaimed, Mon dieu turned on his heel and fled. Turning now to the tank plan, the problems were to gain surprise, to cross the wide and deep obstacle of the Hindenburg line and to ensure cooperation between the infantry and tanks for their common security. Careful organization and the absence of a preliminary bombardment contributed to the accomplishment of the first object. The difficulty presented by the Hindenburg line was overcome by devising super fascines huge bundles of brushwood, which were carried on the nose of each tank and released on reaching the edge of the Hindenburg trenches, the tanks, working in sections of three, had thus the power to cross three successive obstacles. Thirdly, a strictly drill attack was worked out and practiced by which in each section an advanced guard tank moved about 100 yards ahead of the two main body tanks keeping down the enemy's fire and protecting the main body as they led the infantry forward. The infantry, moving in flexible file formations, followed immediately behind the main body tanks. While the tanks cleared away for them through the deep belts of enemy wire and subdued the hostile machine gun fire, the infantry acted as moppers up to the tanks and were also ready to protect them from the enemy's guns at close quarters. The one fault of the tank plan was that, Against expert advice, the tanks attacked on the whole frontage instead of against selected tactical points, with the result that no tank reserves were kept for use in the later stages. The preparations for the battle were made with great skill and secrecy, while to mislead the enemy as to the scale and frontage of the attack, gas and smoke attacks, dummy attacks with dummy tanks, 
raids and feints, were carried out on a wide front both north and south of the real sector of attack. Nevertheless, one man nearly undid the secrecy of a multitude. A prisoner from an Irish regiment gave information of the coming attack, and of the concentration of tanks, but fortunately he was not believed and the German army commander, General von der Marwitz, reported on the 16th that there was no likelihood of an attack. But on the 19th a British telephone message, Tuesday Flanders, was overheard near Bullcourt, and, as it sounded like a combined date and code word, quickened German suspicions. That night the troops were ordered to be specially alert, and Marwitz hastily utilized a division, just detraining from Russia, to strengthen his defenses. But if the Germans now anticipated an attack they also expected the usual preliminary bombardment 11, and its absence assured the British attack the essential surprise effect. That effect was accentuated by an early morning mist, as in almost all the successful thrusts of the war. At 6.20 am on November 20 the tanks and infantry moved forward to the attack on roughly a six mile front and gained a demoralizing initial success at all points save in the left center in front of Flesquiers. The main cause of this one serious check was that the commander of the 51st Division, Harper, preferred a method of his own instead of conforming to the formations devised by the tank corps, and adopted in all the other divisions. His advance tanks were called rovers, and went much farther ahead and the infantry formations were not as well fitted for close cooperation with tanks as those laid down. The separation seems to have been inspired by his expressed feeling that the whole Cambrai plan was a fantastic and most unmilitary scheme dash when on the staff of general headquarters he had resisted the development of machine guns, and now was equally skeptical of tanks. The result was that the infantry were too far behind the tanks, lost the gaps in the wire, and were stopped by machine gun fire. An officer who examined the battlefield afterwards could only find three small heaps of machine gun cartridge cases, from which it would appear that a handful of machine guns held up a whole division, a fact which sheds a striking light on the future of infantry action in open country. The loss of touch between the infantry and tanks lay also at the root of the losses which befell the tanks when they came over the ridge and under the close fire of several German batteries, for infantry accompanying them could have picked off the gunners. Here occurred the famous incident of the solitary German artillery officer who was reputed to have knocked out 16 tanks single-handed. It must go into the catalogue of historic legends for only five derelict tanks were to be seen at this point after the attack had moved on, and an intelligence officer who examined the ground found marks which showed clearly that three batteries had been in position there to engage the tanks. It is possible that all save one gun, and one gunner, had been silenced, as was claimed, but impressions in the heat of battle are sometimes misleading. The feat has, however, an ironical significance in the fact that it was blazoned to the world by the British General Headquarters. The incentive of a mention in dispatches was not accorded to enemy feats performed at the expense of the infantry or cavalry. The effect of this battlefield incident has also been magnified. On the right, the 12th, 20th, and 6th Divisions secured their objectives rapidly, though the 12th had severe fighting at Late Wood. The 20th Division passed through and captured Masniers and Marcoing, securing the passage of the canal at both and even the bridge intact at the latter. On the left of the 51st the 62nd Division made a brilliant advance, advancing by nightfall as far as Annux, over two miles in the rear of Flesquiers. The Flesquiers resistance was thus only annihilated, cut off and overlapped by the waves which swept round its flanks and on to Marcoing. Annux and even to the edge of Blonwood. A penetration of five miles had been made, the equivalent of months of heavy fighting and heavy losses on the Somme and at the Third Battle of Ypres. Decisive success was within the grasp of the British forces, the enemy's three main lines of defences had been overrun, only a half-finished line and the open country lay beyond. But the tank crews were exhausted, the infantry showed little capacity to make progress on their own 
and apart from one squadron of the Canadian Fort Garry Horse the two cavalry divisions could contribute nothing towards fulfilling their role of exploitation. The German official monograph emphasizes the fact that a wide gap remained open for many hours, completely unoccupied, between Massniers and Creveco. It was great luck, as no reinforcements could be expected to reach the before evening. The Germans also had luck in that a relief division from Russia had just arrived when the attack came, by midday on the 20th part of it was in position to cover the direct path to Cambrai. With notable promptness the German command began moving five reserve divisions to the scene from other parts of the front, and six more were warned to follow. It was thus a race with time, and to the joy of the anxious Germans, their assailants seemed astoundingly dilatory. The British failed to utilize the afternoon and evening, they might at least have surrounded the German forces still holding out in flesh squares. The defense seems to have deprived the 51st Division of all initiative. As for the British cavalry, it is remarked that they appeared late and were easily stopped by enfilade fire. On November 21, local reserves made some further progress. Flesqueers was evacuated by its surviving defenders in the early hours, and after dawn the 51st and 62nd Divisions pressed on, clearing the German salient formed by this resistance on the first day and carrying the tide of the British advance as far as Fontaine Notre Dame, one and a half miles beyond the high water mark of November 20. Owing to the British penetration into Blonwood and Fontaine, there was a three mile wide breach between Walters and Moses Corps. But, by German witness, the British lapsed into inactivity at the moment of supreme opportunity. On the right, little ground was gained during the day, and, by evening, three of the enemy's reinforcing divisions were on the scene. The opportunity had been forfeited. Haig's time limit of 48 hours had now expired, but owing to the menace of the uncaptured Blonde Hill to the new British position, as well as the hope of an enemy withdrawal and the desire to relieve the enemy pressure on Italy, he decided to continue the offensive and, somewhat belatedly, placed a few fresh divisions at the disposal of the Third Army. But the tank corps, the essential cause of the early success that had apparently surprised the British as much as the German command, was tired out, men and machines. All had been staked on the first throw. The fresh attacks met with more failure than success against an enemy now braced to meet the danger. On November 22, the Germans recaptured Fontaine Notre Dame. On the 23rd, the 40th Division with tanks captured the whole of Blonwood, but the attempts on Blonde Village and Fontaine Notre Dame failed. Bitter and fluctuating fighting followed, both villages were won, and lost again. And meanwhile the Germans, with prompt initiative and consummate skill, were preparing a deadly counterblast. Unfortunately there seems to have been a disposition in the superior command, with certain exceptions, to discredit the numerous warning signs of the gathering storm, and even to find amusement in the anxiety displayed by those whose clearer vision was soon to be attested. This attitude was apparently due to overconfidence partly induced by the easy success of November 20, and partly due to a belief that the pass Kendale offensive had absorbed all the enemy's reserves. The effect of pass Kendale, indeed, was always overrated. In contrast, General Snow, commanding the Seven Corps on the southern flank of the wedge driven into the German front, had forecast both the place and date of the counterstroke nearly a week before. His subordinate commanders, particularly in the 55th Division, Judwine, which adjoined the three corps, bad reported a host of corroborative evidence, that the enemy artillery were registering on spots never bombarded before, that German aircraft were flying over the lines in large numbers, and that the British reconnaissance machines were shelled off certain areas where the enemy could concentrate under cover. Late on November 29 the 55th Division was so convinced of the imminent menace that Judwine asked that the neighboring three corps might put down a counter-preparation with heavies on the Bantux ravine just before daylight next morning, but his request was refused. The gathering enemy themselves were surprised that nothing was done to disturb the German preparations. And next morning they repaid the tank surprise by one which was similar in principle if different in method. 
unheralded by any long artillery preparation, a short, hurricane bombardment with gas and smoke shell paved the way for the infiltrating advance of the German infantry, the prototype of the German offensive method of spring, 1918, as the British attack had been the prototype of the Allied offensive method of summer and autumn, 1918. Emerging from the sheltered assembly position of Bantux and 22 ravines at the very moment when the unfulfilled counter preparation would have opened, the German stream trickled through the weak points in the British line, then, expanding into a broad torrent which submerged the villages of Gonali and Villas Gislane, swept over gun positions and headquarters, and surged forward to Goose Court. The menace of disaster was immeasurable, but, fortunately, the complementary attacks on the north of the salient, round Blonwood, were brought to a standstill, and the emergency declined with the recapture of Goose Court by the superb counter-attack of the Guards Division and a later effort of the 2nd Tank Brigade. For a time, indeed, there was a chance to redouble and score heavily off the Germans, disordered by this success and hampered by their narrow penetration. But rejecting Snow's plea for a flank repost by the cavalry, the army commander directed his cavalry head on against the Germans, and they were soon held up. Thus the invaders were able to consolidate their hold and even to resume their erosion of the British position. During the next few days continued German progress, especially towards Villers Pluige, and British lack of reserves rendered the British position in the Masnier's Blonde salient so precarious that the greater part of the original gains had to be evacuated. A sombre sunset after a brilliant sunrise. One shadow which still lingers is that undeservedly thrown on the regimental officers and men by superior officers anxious to exculpate themselves. The official court of inquiry pinned the blame on the troops, ascribing the surprise to their negligence and also asserting, contrary to facts, that they had failed to send up SOS flares. Even Bond declared Dash I attribute the reason for the local success on the part of the enemy to one cause and one alone, namely, lack of training on the part of junior officers and NCOs and men. Haag, however, who had been kept in the dark as to the warnings, was an exception to the general rule. In sending his report home, he generously assumed the whole responsibility. Although he also sent home several of the subordinate commanders. It is thus due for history to record, from the records, that many of the junior leaders were acutely alive to the danger and gave vain warnings to their superiors. And as for their resistance, it was more than anyone had a right to expect of troops who had been kept in action continuously since their attack on November 20. For military history, indeed, the lesson of Cambrai is that the welcome renaissance of the essential principle of surprise was offset by a fundamental breach of the principle of economy of force, both in adjusting the end to the means and in appreciating the capacity and limits of human endurance. Seven scene five Caporetone the chill and sodden gloom of an autumn morning amid the mistreathed peaks of the Julian Alps came a rumbling. Before its echoes finally subsided, the Allied cause had been shaken to its foundations. The first rumors of disaster, which were far from exaggerating the reality, came like a thunderclap to the Allied peoples, if not to all their leaders, for 1917 hitherto had seen the Allies on the offensive in all theaters. The year had begun with the expectation of a sure progress towards victory, of a vast combined offensive culminating in the overthrow of the Central Powers, and if the mirage of early victory had been slowly fading before the evidence of stubborn resistance and heavy losses, the public were still unprepared for a definite change of role from attack to defense. More especially was this unexpected in Italy, for while there was obvious ground for qualms over Russia, the Italians had been attacking during August and September, and the cables had given the impression that the tide of battle was flowing strongly in their favor. And for once, in a war when the output of fiction was greater than that of fact, these reports were correct. If the gain in ground was small, the moral and material effect on the already war rotted Austrians was large, and, as Ludendorff records, the responsible military and political authorities of the dual monarchy were convinced that they would not be able to stand a continuation of the battle and a twelfth attack on the Isenzo. 
thus in the middle of September it became necessary to decide for the attack on Italy in order to prevent the collapse of Austria-Hungary. So urgent was the need that Ludendorff was forced to abandon his preparations for the offensive in Moldavia, which he had intended as the coup de grace to Russia's crumbling resistance. Even so, where could he raise sufficient troops for converting the Austrian defensive into an effective offensive? The British pressure at Passchendaele and the mere length of his immense fronts in France and Russia absorbed his resources until he could force peace on Russia. All he could spare was his slender general reserve of six divisions, which had already been his instrument in countering the Kierensky offensive, Russia's final flicker, and in the coup which captured Riga. His advisor in the strategic design of operations, Major Wetzel, was however of the opinion that the application of even this small force at a soft spot, such as the sector between Flitsch and Canal, would suffice to lame if not to break the Italian menace. The result proved him right, the trouble was that it unduly exceeded the most sanguine expectations. And it was due to the fact that it was expanded to a more ambitious plan, without increase of means, than was originally intended in the germ scheme, which Waldstetten, of the Austrian general staff, had brought to the German command on August 29. This original scheme was for a breakthrough at Tolmino, followed merely by rolling up the Isons of front. Caporetto and Cambrai were to have a curious kinship. Ludendorff sent General Kraft von Delmensingen on a special mission to reconnoiter the ground and report on the scheme. Kraft had led the Alpine Corps in the Romanian campaign, and was thus an expert in mountain warfare. He found that the Austrians had managed to retain a small bridgehead on the west bank of the Isonzo at Tolmino, and this afforded a jumping off point for the projected attack. Guns were got up mostly by hand and at night, the infantry came up by seven night marches, taking no vehicles, but carrying their ammunition, equipment, and supplies on the men or on pack animals. Thus the twelve assault divisions and three hundred batteries concentrated undiscovered by the Italians, owing partly to able precautions, partly to the country, and partly to the inadequate air reconnaissances of the enemy. What of the Italians? The commander-in-chief, Cadena, was undoubtedly a man of more than ordinary ability, but, like certain other famous commanders, his intellectual power was offset by his lack of touch with and understanding of the fighting troops. With such men, also, their mental remoteness is often accentuated by the natural isolation in which those in high military position are placed. Considering the comparatively slender weight of the attack, he had enough men and guns to withstand it successfully, but his distribution of them was unsuited to the conditions of the various sectors. Troops already too highly tried were kept too long in the positions of greatest strain. Thus, the combination of faulty distribution with the enemy's unerring eye for the vulnerable spot produced, with other factors, an Austro-German success out of all proportion to the means. Capello, commanding the Second Army, dissatisfied with the defensive suitability of the positions on which the Italian offensive had stopped, had wished to forestall the attack by a flank thrust northwards from the Bainz's plateau, but was overruled by Cadena, who was not only conscious of his shortage of reserves but had belatedly come to doubt the value of offensive methods. In this he was at least wiser than his subordinate who, alike in offensive spirit, in his manner as a commander, and as the victim of the Germans' new offensive method, was the goff of the Italian army. Codino had full warning of the enemy's intention from his intelligence and from deserters, Czech and Transylvanian officers, but he did not feel sufficiently sure of the real direction of the enemy's attack to justify him in committing his reserves beforehand. Yet it is at least curious that, as information specifically pointed to the Caporetto sector, on its 15 mile frontage there were only posted two battalions to the mile compared with eight to the mile farther south. The very fact that this had long been a quiet sector, where both sides sent troops to rest, might have aroused the suspicions of the Italian command. But Capello actually refused the appeal of his left wing here for reinforcements. Perhaps he was the less patient towards arguments because he should have been a patient in hospital. Instead, with misguided pertinacity he stayed in bed at his headquarters, 
and only yielded the reins of command the day after his front collapsed. The Italian frontier province of Venezia formed a tongue pointing towards Austria. It was flanked on the south by the Adriatic and on the east and north by the Julian and Carnic Alps, beyond which lay the Austrian Trentino. The six German divisions, with nine Austrian, formed the attacking 14th German army, under General Otto von Below, with whom was Krifter's chief of staff and guiding brain. These troops were to climb the mountain barrier at the tip of the tongue, while two Austrian armies, under Borovic, were to advance along the stretch of lower ground near the Adriatic Shure. The difficulties of organizing and deploying an attack in the mountains were ably overcome, and after four hours gas shell and one hour's general bombardment, the attackers moved forward in the drizzle of snow and rain, and in many places rapidly overcame the resistance of infantry who, owing partly to the breakdown of telephone communication, were but fitfully supported by their own artillery. But the misty conditions were the greater factor in the success, as next march in France, they provided the element of surprise which proved the only and indispensable key to open a way through the enemy's front. Although the right and left wings of the attacking army were delayed by sturdy resistance in the rear positions, the center group, four divisions, under Stein penetrated completely at Caporetto, and through this breach reserves were pouring by evening. The effect was to make the whole defensive position untenable and to ease the task of the attacking right wing, three and a half Austrian divisions, under Kraus. Which now pushed forward almost unchecked down the Valduxia, the shortest line to turn the river barrier of the Taglimento. This enveloping advance nullified Cadena's efforts to dam the breach efforts which also broke down owing to the difficulty of pushing reserves up the narrow mountain roads already congested by troops which had no stomach left for fighting. This convinced Cadena of the necessity of ordering a general retreat to the Taglimento, as Capello had earlier urged, and it was successfully achieved after two critical days, October 30 and 31 St. Fortunately the pursuing enemy had suffered from hitches in movements and supply as well as an increasing friction between the German and Austrian commanders. Their attempt to achieve a surprise capture of the crossings was foiled, and although in a deliberate attack one of Krauss' Austrian divisions got across at Cornino on November 2, Codino had a breathing space to make preparations for a further retreat to the Piave. Although large bodies of troops were cut off by the enemy's pincer-like advance, the main armies succeeded in reaching the Piave by November 10, thus refugging their line. Yet its links were very thin. Nearly 600,000 men had been lost, and the second army, which had suffered the direct blow, was practically out of action as a force. At this juncture Cadena gave place to Diaz, whose supreme value was that he understood the mind of the soldiers, and knew how to reinvigorate their morale, playing, in fact, the same role as Bataan in France earlier that year. Three days later, a fresh menace developed. On November 12, when Conrad's troops, Austrian 10th and 11th armies, sought to move down from the Trentino on the Italian rear. But here, Cadena's preparations for defence had been long initiated and were well matured, so that the threat was frustrated. Ludendorff, too late, tried to switch reinforcements round to Conrad but was foiled by the inadequate rail communications and deficiency of motor transport, if, fundamentally, by the limited horizon of the original plan. Meanwhile, French and British divisions had been hurriedly railed to Italy, their coming preceded by the arrival of Fock and Sir Henry Wilson, but they took some time to concentrate, and were then at first held back in reserve so that the interval before they relieved divisions of their severely strained ally was a time of grave stress. The most serious attack came in the sector between the Piave and the Brenta, but here, after five days of struggle, Ladici's Italian IX Corps brought the attack to a halt, and at the beginning of December was relieved by the French, while the British, under Lord Plumer, took over the Montello sector. Contrary to expectation, both were left in peace and during the remaining months of the campaign the enemy's attack was confined to renewed efforts by Conrad and Kraus farther to the northwest, 
in the Azago and Grappa sectors. If these imposed a fresh tax on the weary Italians, it was psychologically worthwhile, for this successful and stalwart resistance by its vindication of their fighting power laid the moral foundations for the Italian revenge of 1918. Reviewing the drama of Caporetto in the clearer light of history, there is reason to think that excessive emphasis was placed on the effect of enemy and seditious propaganda, and that the major reason of the crumbling resistance early was the same as in France that spring that the troops were morally tired, and that the result of being hurled endlessly against machine gun defenses had worn down their fighting spirit. The presence of imminent disaster to their country set a new light upon the position, and gave a sacrificial impulse to a duty which on the P of line, fighting with their backs to the wall, they honorably and gallantly fulfilled. Strategically, however, the most critical stage was passed with the passing of Taglimento. For henceforth what Claus Witz called the friction of war so upset the attackers' communications that their power and speed fell off badly. Some of the causes have been mentioned. But one, which was to operate again next spring in France, deserves emphasis. The well-filled supply depots of the Italian army were too great a temptation to the undernourished enemy, the desire to eat quenched the desire to pursue and sudden congestion of the stomach accelerated the congestion of the advance. It is significant that even a German divisional commander, General Lequies, could exult more at the capture of two or three chickens apiece by his men than of many prisoners, and regarded the possession of a few pigs as the height of human felicity. Seven Panorama at war in the air to relate the action of aircraft in the military sphere is not possible for it formed a thread running through and vitally influencing the whole course of operations, rather than a separate strategic feature. But a brief outline of the evolution of aircraft action in the field may help to complete the strategic picture. Military appreciation of air values was a slow growth, and the advocates of aircraft had an uphill struggle for recognition. Until the Italians used aircraft extensively against the Turks in Tripoli, 1911-12, General military opinion was aptly represented by General Fox comment when watching the circuit de l'Est dash that is good sport but for the army the aeroplane is worthless. Even in 1914 the proportion of military aircraft was puny, and their application more limited than with the Italians two years earlier. In the first month of the war visual reconnaissance was the only role allotted and no provision was made for air combat or bombing. For the inadequacy of its air service and lack of information the German army paid a heavy price during the invasion of France. But the Royal Flying Corps, although bringing only 63 machines across the channel, twice rendered invaluable service. One reconnaissance unmasked the initial attempt to outflank the British army at Mons, and another discovered Kluck's historic swerve towards the Marne. In September, the sphere of air cooperation was enlarged to embrace observation of targets for the artillery, communication being at first by colored lights and eventually by wireless telegraphy. In September, also, photography from the air was tried but its potential value was not recognized by general headquarters until 1915. By March a special aeroplane camera was supplied, and air photography henceforth developed continuously, although long handicapped by dependence on captured German lenses for the large-scale cameras. A fresh form of cooperation was tried in 1915, although not fully applied until 1916. This was the contact patrol, whereby commanders were informed of the situation of their own infantry during battle, and of threatened counter-attacks by the enemy. The pursuit of this air cooperation by both sides simultaneously, as well as the desire to baffle the enemy's observation, had naturally led to air fighting, and this, in turn, to a struggle for supremacy in the air. Rifles and pistols were the only weapons available at the outset so that air combat bore the appearance of an exhilarating and uncertain new form of game shooting. Soon, however, light machine guns were fitted, although the fighting role was mainly restricted to pusher-type aeroplanes, as, on a tractor type, the propeller hindered fire in a forward direction. In May, 1915, 
the Germans produced a new and fast Fokker fighting machine equipped with an interrupter gear which enabled the gun to fear through the orbit of the revolving propeller without risk of hitting the blades. The Fokkers inflicted heavy losses amongst the British machines, and, for a time, gained their superiority for the Germans. The Allies replied to this menace not only by new machines but by new methods, settled in joint conference. The fighters were concentrated in special squadrons, instead of being distributed among all, and these squadrons were to seek out their opponents behind the opposing front, thus enabling their own reconnaissance and artillery machines to work undisturbed. This method of offensive patrols was successfully tried by the French at Verdun in February, 1916, and developed by the British on the Somme, where for some weeks the Germans were almost driven out of the air. The offensive was also extended to the enemy's aerodromes, an extension which recalled the historic naval maxim that the enemy's coasts were the frontiers of Britain. Already, in October, 1914, British naval aircraft operating on the Belgian coast had raided their Zeppelin sheds at Dusseldorf and Cologne, destroying one airship, another was destroyed next month in a raid from Belfort on Friedrichshafen. Although the raids on aerodromes from 1916 onwards did not often succeed in inflicting serious material damage, they had a marked moral effect, for once pilots were safely back in their own aerodrome they were apt to feel that their share of risk was complete. An unforeseen addition was all the worse to bear when the nerve tension had been relaxed, and when they were taken at a disadvantage on the ground. The Allied air supremacy of 1916 was not long maintained. The Germans challenged it with improved types of single seater fighting machines and with the so called circus system, whereby special fighting squadrons were formed, under a picked leader who picked his own pilots and were successively switched to any part of the front where the higher command desired their superiority to be gained. The most famous of these circuses were those of Bulk and Baron von Richthofen. By their superior strategy the Germans regained the upper hand early in 1917, although the total British fighting machines outnumbered theirs by three to one. And the British tragically helped to swell the enemy's bag by sending out swarms of partially trained young pilots from England, under pressure from GHQ. But the Allies soon retorted with fresh machines and gradually, if expensively, won back a superiority in the air which was never lost again, although never so marked as in the summer of 1916. Because of the three dimensional conditions of air warfare, a command of the air could never be attained in the sense that a command of the sea was possible, and the object became a superiority, which should ensure a local and temporary command of the air over a static front when needed. The year 1917 was marked also by an increasing development of the method of fighting and flying in formation, which tended to replace the Homeric combats of individual champions whose mounting score of victims had been followed with the excitement that formerly awaited the return of a Red Indian scalping expedition or the news of a test match. Henceforth, knight errantry yielded to tactics and air fighting gradually assumed the more developed forms of warfare, although carried out on a different plane. By the end of the war an attack was often delivered by formations of 50 or 60 machines which maneuvered, the actual squadrons compact, with the aim of breaking up the enemy's formation. Thus they became cavalry of the air, and the resemblance was heightened by another new form of air action, used with great effect in the later stages of the war. This was the attack on ground troops. So long as the rival armies were firmly embedded in trenches, air attack had small scope, although occasionally it came to the relief of hard pressed packets of infantry. But when the British front broke in March, 1918, all the available fighter squadrons, French as well as British, were concentrated to strike at the advancing enemy. Their overhead counter-attacks during this crisis were an important factor in stemming the German non-rush, and one that has been inadequately recognized by military historians. Still greater opportunities came when the enemy tide ebbed in the autumn. After the breaking of the Bulgarian, Turkish, and Austrian fronts alike, Air attacks on the retreating columns both hastened and completed the breakup of the enemy armies. Air attacks on the communications, supply depots, ammunition dumps, 
and billets of the armies, had been developed much earlier. The Battle of Neuve Chapelle in March, 1915, marked the first organized attempt to prevent the arrival of enemy reinforcements, and at Luz in September, a more extended bombing plan was applied against the German railways. Results were small, however, owing to lack of experience, deficiency of equipment, and the want of machines to maintain the intensive bombardment essential for causing an effective stoppage. If a railway was damaged before the battle it could be repaired in time for the passage of reinforcements, and, unless repairs were hindered by continuous bombing, supplies and ammunition would reach the enemy troops before they began to run short. The first lesson was learnt and applied in the later battles of the war, when the bombing of communications played a regular part, but the second lesson was never fully applied owing to lack of bombing aircraft. The very eagerness with which the armies had eventually embraced aircraft as immediately auxiliaries, for reconnaissance, artillery observation, and the protection of these duties, limited the supply of aircraft for roles of indirect cooperation, and curtailed their exploitation of the bombing weapon. Moreover, their very concentration on these auxiliaries blinded the armies to the greater possibilities of crippling their opponents by hunger. The Germans, especially, neglected opportunities of inflicting decisive injury, as a senior staff officer of the British Second Army revealed a few years ago. This army received the bulk of its supplies from Calais and Boulogne, and in front of these bases was held only three days reserves of food and ammunition, apart from three days supplies with the fighting troops. To serve the front there were two double lines and one single, to meet the normal needs of the troops 71 trains a day were needed, three quarters of the total capacity of the three lines. With this narrow margin of safety, the blocking of one line would have sufficed to dislocate the whole system, while the blocking of more than one line would have brought a catastrophe. To cause such a block would have been the easier because outside Calais there was a junction of two of the lines and near Estioma two converged. Moreover, a block at Ax, near Estioma, would even have cut off the troops from the three days reserves, which lay in depots farther back along the two lines which converged at this point. It is not difficult to picture the situation which would have arisen if an effective and sustained bombing attack had been launched in April, 1918, to coincide with the German army's attack when this area was congested with British and French troops who were trying to dam the breach in the front. The Allied commanders, also, on the Western Front, were unwilling to spare sufficient aircraft for a real test of the effect of bombing communications. Yet, there was a significant hint of its potency, when on July 16, 1918, the bombing of an ammunition train at Thunville Station stopped all traffic along this important section of the German communications for 48 hours, the 48 hours before the Allied counterstroke on the Marne which turned the tide of the war. At sea, the Germans, relying on their submarines, fortunately failed to explore the possibilities of air attacks on merchant shipping, or on the ports where that shipping had to unload its freight. And the Allies could not as their enemy had no shipping in use. There was one fleeting glimpse of such action, as early as August 12, 1915, a British seaplane, launched from a seaplane carrier near the Dardanelles, gained the distinction of being the first to torpedo a ship. The most valuable service rendered by naval aircraft during the war was in anti-submarine patrolling and escorting convoys a purely protective role. Yet seven months before the Battle of Jutland, Commodore Sueter of the Naval Air Service had begged the Admiralty to sanction the construction of 200 torpedo-carrying aircraft. His persistence merely led to his removal, to the Adriatic. The year after Jutland, the new Commander-in-Chief of the Grand Fleet asked for that very number to be produced as early as possible. It was too late. The unwanted offspring of Sueta's vision might conceivably have made that one ineffective naval battle decisive. Moreover, a further chance had been forfeited through the oversight by which the Campania, a large aircraft carrier, was left behind when the Grand Fleet sailed from Scarpa Flow. It was the Naval Air Service, however, which first proposed, and attempted, to strike at the sources of the enemy's power to make war. 
his industrial centers. The way was blocked by the narrow view of the army command. The idea nevertheless made headway, and in October 1916 was reinforced by the arguments of Colonel Bears, of the French Air Service, on a visit to London. The Admiralty representative on the air board then suggested that the Navy should keep a force of 200 bombers in France for this purpose. But, according to the official history, the proposal drew a strong letter of protest from Sir Douglas Haig. He stated that the views attributed to Colonel Bears were unsound in theory and should not be accepted in practice. Haig's opposition killed the scheme, which might have checked the stream of shells that were being hurled at his troops. In 1917, out of 50 air squadrons in France, only two were for bombing, and those were confined to local targets. Not until late in the war was there any attempt on the Allied side to attack the enemy's home front save for spasmodic raids by a handful of British naval aircraft, as well as by the French. Nor, in the light of human nature, was independent air action likely to be developed so long as this new weapon was handled by and divided between the land and sea forces. The essential fusion between the two parts was delayed until April, 1918, when the Royal Air Force was created. As a sequel, the Independent Air Force was formed in June, and placed under Trenchard, who had been the dynamic leader of the military air arm in France, if also, ironically, a determined opponent of independent air action. In the few months that remained, the repeated and expanding raids of the new force accelerated the moral disintegration of Germany, and, by their moral effect at least, hampered the production of munitions in the Rhineland. Even so, the significance of this force was more in promise than fulfillment, for it was barely a quarter of its intended strength when the armistice came. Similarly, the effect of the German air raids on England should be assessed in the light of the fact that the largest raid was carried out by less than 40 bombers. What might have been achieved is suggested by the fact that the seven principal munition centres in the Ruhr, as well as those in the Rhineland, were all within air range of the British front. Essen, 173 miles, Germany's main arsenal, was only as far as the German machines flew in bombing London from their base near Ghent. Again, one factory at Hagen, 175 miles, produced two-thirds of the German submarine accumulators. Two of the largest chemical factories were less than 100 miles from the Allied front. Yet this immense opportunity of crippling the munition supply of the German armies was sacrificed in favor of air fighting over the trench front, sacrificed, in fact, on the battle altar of Clausewitz in the air. Even when the independent air force was at last formed, in face of vehement opposition from GHQ, its strength was curtailed to a mere hundred machines, about 2% of Britain's total air force, and more than half its raids were directed against tactical, instead of industrial targets. Apart from what was then achieved, a sidelight on its wider indirect effect is shed by the fact that, in the month of August alone, one shell factory, which was never even bombed, received 53 false alarms and suffered an output deficit of 3,000 tons. There is also a paradoxical reflection on the GHQ doctrine of concentration on the battlefront in the fact that the menace of these raids drew off no less than 20 German squadrons from the front, three or four times as many machines as were engaged in the exclamation mark 8 1918. The break of middle years of the World War had been, in a military sense, a tussle between a lean Hercules and a bulky Cerberus. The Germanic alliance was weaker in numbers but directed by a single head, the Entente stronger in numbers but with too many heads. Owing to their own excessive losses, diffusion of effort and the collapse of Russia, the Entente at the end of 1917 were faced with the grim fact that the numerical balance had been reversed and months must elapse before the prospective stream of America's new divisions should tilt the scales once more in their favor. The emergency paved the way for the creation of a unified command but it still needed disaster to bring it into being. At the conference at Ray Palo in November, the formation of a Supreme War Council was decided upon, to be composed of the principal ministers of the Allies, with military representatives, and to sit permanently at Versailles. 
if a fundamental defect was that it merely substituted a formal for an informal committee, a further flaw was that the military representatives had no executive status. In the economic sphere, where deliberation rather than instant action was necessary, it led to a real improvement in the combination of shipping, food and munition resources. Militarily, it was futile, for it set up a dual advisorship, the Versailles representatives on the one hand and the chiefs of the national general staffs on the other. Yet it is fair to add that this dead end was due to a British obstruction. Both the Americans and the French desired to give this committee executive power and an executive head, and Badain logically supported the proposal, which came from Colonel House and General Bliss. But the fundamental offset to its wisdom was that it eliminated the essential control of strategy by the statesman, while the suggested composition of the council repeated the error of the Nivel era for it was to consist of the national commanders-in-chief and chiefs of staff, and thus whichever member was chosen as president would have his freedom of judgment and execution hampered by his responsibility to and for his own national army. Moreover, in fulfillment, the proposal would mean that the council would have a French chief, as the French realized when they supported, and the British when they opposed, the proposal, in rejecting it Lloyd George was guided not only by a wise objection to a purely military council but by his feeling that British opinion was not ripe for it, and that Haig's resistance to another nivel solution would be supported by the public at home. Moreover, the suggested inclusion of the chiefs of staff introduced a personal complication, for the last thing that Lloyd George desired was to strengthen the influence of Sir William Robertson upon the conduct of the war. Rather was he hoping to sidetrack Robertson, whom he held responsible for the futile and costly strategy of 1917, in favor of Sir Henry Wilson, his nominee for the Versailles Committee. And while he sought to make Versailles independent of the narrow purview of the British general staff, Clements was equally intent to make it merely a microphone for the French general staff, to amplify its voice. In default of agreement the military representatives, now Generals Wagand, Wilson, Bliss, and Cadena, were merely technical advisers. But as the menace of the German attack grew closer, and with it the need for common action, this advisory body was converted into a military executive committee to handle an interallied general reserve, a fresh compromise which set up a dual control, the commanders-in-chief and the Versailles Committee. Only an enlargement of mind and goodwill could make it workable. Time was too short. Since early in November the stream of German troop trains from the eastern to the western front had been steadily swelling. When the 1917 campaign opened, there had been a proportion of nearly three allies to two Germans, actually in March 178 British, French and Belgian divisions against 129 German divisions. Now the Germans had a slight advantage, with the likelihood of augmenting it. But the Allied statesmen, recalling how often their own offensive had failed with equal or greater superiority of force, were naturally slow to appreciate the gravity of the menace or to respond to the sudden fall in the temperature of military opinion. Nor could they agree to draw reinforcements from the other fronts. The Italians strove against any withdrawal of the Allied contingents from their front and the French opposed any reduction of the Salonika force. Lloyd George urged an effort to complete the success in Palestine, this was sanctioned on the understanding that no reinforcements went there from France, though it also meant that none came from there to France. Meantime, the German strength had increased to 177 divisions by the end of January, and 15 more in March. The Allied strength by the dispatch of divisions to Italy and the breaking up of others owing to the French shortage of drafts, had fallen to the equivalent of 173, counting as double the four and a half large size American divisions which had arrived. For the French and British had been constrained to follow the Germans in reducing their divisions from 12 to 9 battalions each. Internal friction among the Allies increased their handicap. In part it was due to the difficulties of a fair settlement as to the length of front which each should hold. In the 1917 campaign the British, bearing the burden of the offensive, had been in charge of barely 100 miles of line, while the French, on the defensive, 
had held 325 miles. At the close of the campaign Haig had come to an agreement with Badain that he would extend his line to Barisis, just south of the Oyais, which made a total of 125 miles. In view of his change to a defensive attitude, the extension can hardly be considered exacting, although his heavy losses made it a greater strain than it would have been on the 1917 basis of strength. But before this extension was complete, Clemens, the new French premier, intervened with a demand that the British should take over an additional 30 miles, as far as Berriobac. Clemens threatened to resign if this demand were not met, but eventually agreed to submit the case to the Versailles Committee, which proposed a compromise whereby the British should take over approximately half the distance in dispute. Thereupon Haig threatened to resign, this threat threw the Supreme War Council and its advisory committee into the melting pot from which the Executive Committee emerged. Meantime Haig went direct to Badain and reached a settlement by which he was merely to complete his extension to Barisis, according to the original agreement. This was a noteworthy concession on Badain's part, which did honor to his spirit of helpfulness. And the Supreme War Council on February 2 accepted this private settlement between the two commanders in chief, wisely swallowing the affront to its own dignity. It is astonishing, in view of this fact, that the legend should still persist that Haig was forced by the politicians to extend his line against his will, and likewise the argument that such extension was the cause of the subsequent breakthrough. The just proportion between the respective fronts is hardly less difficult to determine now, in retrospect, than it was to agree upon them. With 99 divisions the French had to hold 300 miles, while the British with 58 divisions, of somewhat greater rifle strength, took charge of 125 miles, after the extension to Barisis. Of the French line, however, the half from St. Mihiel eastwards was of secondary importance. If, even so, the French had cause for complaint on any mileage basis, the British could fairly claim that they had more vital objectives to cover. Less room to fall back and a higher proportion of the enemy already on their front. But the French, in turn, could point to the fact that the main mass of the German reserves was so placed that it might intervene on either front. To weigh a question compounded of such diverse elements required a strategic mind of the purest scientific detachment, whereas it had to be resolved by men whose determined character and strong sense of nationality made it difficult for them to see the other man's point of view. Lloyd George was an exception, but to his endowment with a wider outlook was linked a tendency to be impatient with the point of view of his own men, especially when this seemed to him parochial or obstructive. Disagreement between him and Sir William Robertson, his official military adviser, had increased throughout 1917, Robertson being suspicious of political interference with military plans and of Lloyd George's unorthodox ideas while Lloyd George felt that Robertson's sole idea in strategy was to support Haig blindly and frustrate any alternative schemes. The results of this blank check policy at Pass Kendall made the Prime Minister more anxious to provide himself with alternative advice, a desire that had influenced him in setting up the Supreme Council with its military committee, and in appointing to it Sir Henry Wilson, whom he regarded as a soldier of more sympathetic and larger outlook. But when the new organ was converted into an executive committee, Robertson insisted that he, as chief of the Imperial General Staff, should be the British military member. The Prime Minister objected that the combination of the two posts in one man would vitiate the whole principle, maintaining the sectional instead of the detached view. Robertson's stand brought the long growing dissension to a climax. The Prime Minister went part of the way to meet him by appointing him the Versailles representative, while Wilson was to become chief of the Imperial General Staff at home with reduced functions. Sprung on Robertson as a surprise, this proposal provoked his refusal. After several days of discussion and domestic crisis, Robertson was offered his former post on the new terms. His refusal to accept them produced his enforced resignation and relegation to at home command. Wilson succeeded him, 
and Rawlinson was appointed to Versailles. Such conflicts of view, if unavoidable in human nature and in an alliance, weaken the common front. And as soon as one difficulty was overcome, other sources of dissension came to the fore. The prolonged waste of soldiers lives in the swamps beyond Ypres had led Lloyd George and his cabinet to withhold reinforcements for fear of encouraging fresh squandering. This undoubtedly weakened Haig's initial power of resistance to the German onslaught, yet it is just to point out that it was weakened more, in quality as well as quantity by the 400,000 British casualties suffered in the offensive of the later part of 1917. Moreover, we should not forget that the government had the heavy responsibility of being the trustee for the lives of the nation. The real ground of criticism is that it was not strong enough to make a change in, or place a check upon, a command which it did not trust, while supplying the reinforcements necessary for defence. And for this lack of moral strength the public must share the blame for they had already shown themselves too easily swayed by clamour against political interference with the generals, and too prone to believe that the politician is invariably wrong on such occasions. The civilian public, indeed, is apt to trust soldiers too little in peace, and sometimes too much in war. These political handicaps, and the accompanying tendency of politicians to work deviously towards what they dare not demand openly were also seen in the project for a unified command. The Prime Minister, indeed, had gone so far in November as to disclaim faith in his own long-sought cure. Instead he sought a palliative in the Inter-Allied Executive Committee, under Fox chairmanship, which should control a common reserve of thirty divisions, one-seventh of the total forces. This scheme was derisively annulled by Haag, who, when called on by Fock for his contribution of nine divisions, replied that he could spare none. He preferred to make an arrangement with Badain for mutual support. When the test came, a week later, this broke down, and Haig then took a foremost part in hastening and facilitating the appointment of a generalissimo, which he had formerly opposed. His change of attitude had simply an immediate purpose. Dash the whole and sole object is to override Bataille and get the French to send reinforcements to prevent the British and French armies being separated. Charteris for the actual breakdown, the blame has been commonly thrown upon the French, and there is no question that Haig understood from Bataille on March 24 that if the Germans continued their rapid progress, the French reserves would have to be used to cover Paris. But in fairness it is essential to add that, whereas the original compact had only pledged the aid of some six French divisions, Badain actually sent nine by March 24, and 21, including four of cavalry, by March 26. If these reinforcements were perhaps slower coming into action than in dispatch, it does not affect the fact that the original pledge was amply exceeded. Thus the fundamental fault would seem to lie in trusting to an arrangement for such slender support by either ally. The German plan. On the German side the submarine panacea for victory had been replaced by a military panacea, and hopes were perhaps exaggerated by the unexpected collapse of Russia. But although Ludendorff promised victory in the field, he did not disguise the fact that a western offensive would be a far harder task than the conquests in the east. He realized also that it would be a race between the effect of Germany's blow and the arrival of American reinforcements, although he hoped to win the race. To secure a rear of his offensive, a definite peace was wrung from the Bolshevik government of Russia by a military demonstration, and also forced on Romania. And to secure, if possible, the economic base of his offensive the Ukraine was occupied for its wheat supplies with little resistance except from Czechoslovak troops who had formerly been taken prisoners from the Austrian army. Ludendorff's next problem was to decide his first point of attack. The sector between Arras and St. Quentin was chosen, on the western face of the great salient formed by the German front in France. The choice was governed by tactical reasons, this sector was the enemy's weakest point and the ground offered fewer difficulties than elsewhere, although Ludendorff had in mind the possibility of separating the Allied armies and driving the British back against the Channel coast, where they would be too closely penned in to evade his blows. 
From the experience of the vain allied attacks Ludendorff had drawn the deduction that tactics had to be considered before purely strategical objects which it is futile to pursue unless tactical success is possible. Hence he formulated a strategical plan based on the new, or resurrected, principle of taking the tactical line of least resistance. Presumably he hoped by firm control to guide these tactical movements to a strategic destination. If so, he failed. Where did the fault lie? The general view at the end of the war was that the tactical bias had led Ludendorff to change direction and dissipate his strength. That if the Franco British command had previously erred by aiming at the strategically correct target without enough attention to the tactical difficulties, the German command had followed it with an equal if opposite error by concentrating on tactical success at the expense of the strategical goal. But a closer examination of the German documents since available, and of Ludendorff's own orders and instructions, throws a different light on the question. It would seem, indeed, that the real fault was that Ludendorff failed to carry out in practice the new principle he had adopted in theory, that he either did not grasp, or shrank from, the full implication of this new theory of strategy. For in fact he dissipated too large a part of his reserves in trying to redeem tactical failures and hesitated too long over the decision to exploit his tactical successes. Ludendorff's strategy in the East had been so forceful and so far-sighted that his indecision and short sight in the West is difficult to explain. Perhaps he himself was feeling the strain of directing so many vast operations, perhaps it was that he missed the strategical insight and balanced view of Hoffman who, after being at his side throughout the 1914-16 campaigns, had stayed in the East when Ludendorff went to the Supreme Command. The modern vice of seniority prevented Germany making the fullest use of the man who perhaps approached nearer to military genius than any other general of the war. In any case, the campaign leaves the impression that Ludendorff had neither his former clearness as to the goal, nor the same grip on the changing situations. But in the organization of the attacks, his powers were at their highest level. Surprise was to be the key which should open a gate in the long locked front. The most thorough arrangements were made for concealing and for exploiting the attacks, and the surprise effect of the short but intense bombardment was increased by lavish use of gas and smoke shell. Further, while Ludendorff had settled to strike first on the Somme sector, to which blow the code name Michael was given, he also began preparations for successive attacks at other points, which besides being in readiness for the future helped to mystify the enemy. Two were on the British front and one on the French dash, St. George I against the Lys sector, St. George II apostrophe against the Ypres sector, and Blucher in Champagne. The Michael attack was to be made by the German 17th, 2nd, and 18th armies, 63 divisions in all, on the 43 mile front Arras St. Quentin Lafayette, but its main force was intended to be exerted north of the Somme, and, after breaking through, the 17th and 2nd armies were to wheel northwest and press the British army against the coast, while the river and the 18th army guarded their flank. The assault was launched on March 21, and the surprise was greatly helped by an early morning mist. But while the thrust broke through completely south of the Somme, where the defence, but also the attacking force, was thinnest, it was held up near Arras, a check which reacted on all the attack north of the river. Ludendorff, violating his new principle, spent the following days in trying to revive his attack against the strong, and strongly held bastion of Arras, maintaining this direction as his principal line of effort. Meantime he kept a tight rein on the 18th Army which was advancing in the south without serious check from its opponents. As late as March 26 he issued orders which restrained it from crossing the Aver and tied it to the pace of its neighbour, the second which in turn was held back by the very limited success of the 17th Army near Arras. Thus we see that in reality Ludendorff was bent on breaking the British Army by breaking down its strongest sector of resistance in a direct assault. And because of this obsession he failed, until too late, to throw the weight of his reserves along the line of least resistance south of the Somme. The intended wheel to the northwest might have come to pass if it had been made after passing the flank, 
and thus being directed against the rear, of the Aras Bastion. On March 26 the attack north of the Somme, by the left wing of the 17th Army and the right of the 2nd Army, was visibly weakening as the price of its hard-earned gains. South of the Somme the left of the 2nd Army reached, and was now to be embarrassed by, the desert of the old Somme battlefields, a break on progress and supply. The 18th Army alone was advancing with unslackened impetus. This situation led Ludendorff to adopt a new plan, but without relinquishing his old. He ordered for March 28 a fresh and direct attack on the high ground near Arras, by the right of the 17th Army, to be followed by a 6th Army attack just to the north between Vimy and La Bassie. But the promising situation south of the Somme led him to indicate Amiens as an additional main objective. Even so, he restrained the 18th Army from pushing on to turn the flank of the Amiens defences without further orders. On March 28 a fresh Arras attack was launched, unshielded by mist or surprise, and failed completely in face of the well-prepared resistance of Bonn's 3rd Army. Only then did Ludendorff abandon his original idea and direct his main effort, and some of his remaining reserves, towards Amiens. But meantime he ordered the 18th Army to mark time for two days. When the attack was renewed it made little progress in face of a resistance that had been afforded time to harden, and Ludendorff, rather than be drawn into an attrition struggle, suspended the attempt to reach Amiens. He had, however, missed vital arteries and decisive results by the narrowest of margins. By March 27 the advance had penetrated nearly 40 miles and reached Montdidier, cutting one railway to Paris. By March 30 the German flood was almost lapping the outworks of Amiens. 80,000 prisoners and 975 guns had been taken. Once the crust was broken, the very elaboration of the methods of communication built up during three years of static warfare caused the greater flux behind the front. The extent of the retreat was primarily the measure of the loss of control by the British commanders. Disaster had driven the Allies to an overdue step, and on Haig's appeal and Lord Milner's intervention, Fock had been appointed on March 26 to coordinate the operations of the Allied armies. In this hour of crisis, Fock's decisive manner and exuberant promises created confidence. Yet, in actual fact, his appointment made little difference to the flow of reinforcements. And although on April 14 he secured the title of Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Armies, it gave him no real power of command. By this time a fresh German menace had developed, though not intended as such. With a large part of his reserves holding the vast bulge south of the Somme, Ludendorff turned, if without much confidence and merely as a diversion, to release, on April 9 his St. George I attack. Its astonishing early success against a weakened front led him to convert it bit by bit into a major effort. The British were desperately close to the sea, but their resistance stopped the German tide, after a ten-mile invasion, just short of the important railway junction of Hersbruck, and an attempt to widen the front towards Ypres was nullified by Haig swinging his line back just before and by the gradual arrival of French reinforcements. Haag complained strongly that Foch was too slow in sending French reserves northwards, but the event justified Foch's reluctance to commit himself thither and his seeming excess of optimism in declaring that the danger was past. Ludendorff had doled out reserves sparingly usually too late and too few for real success, so apprehensive that his new bulge would become another sack, that after the capture of Kemmel Hill, when opportunity opened its arms, he stopped the exploitation for fear of a counterstroke. Thus Ludendorff had fallen short of strategic results, on the other hand he could claim huge tactical successes, the British casualties were over 300,000. The British army had been badly mauled and although fresh drafts to the number of 140,000 were hurried out from England and divisions brought back from Italy, Salonica and Palestine, months must elapse before it could recover its offensive power. Ten British divisions had to be broken up temporarily, while the German strength had now mounted to 208, of which 80 were back in reserve. A restoration of the balance, however, was now in sight. 
a dozen American divisions had arrived in France and, responding to the call, great efforts were being made to swell the stream. At the crisis in March, Pershing, the American commander-in-chief, even relaxed his inflexible opposition to partial or premature use of the American troops so far as to declare that they were at Fox's disposal for use wherever required. It was an inspiring gesture, although in practice he continued to keep a tight hold on his troops and, with rare exceptions, only allowed them to take over parts of the front as complete divisions. For Germany the sands were running out. Realizing this, Ludendorff launched his Blutcher attack between Soissons and Reims, on May 27. Falling by surprise with 22 divisions against 11, it swept over the Aisne and reached the Marne on May 30, where its impetus died away. This time the German superiority of force had not been so pronounced as before nor so well aided by nature's atmospheric cloak. It would seem that the extent of the opening success was due in part to the strategic surprise the greater unexpectedness of the time and place of the blow, and in part to the folly of the local army command in insisting on the long exploded and obsolete method of massing the defenders in the forward positions, that to be compressed cannon fodder for the Germans massed artillery. But once again Ludendorff had obtained a measure of success for which he was neither prepared nor desirous. The surpriser was himself surprised. The attack had been conceived merely as a diversion to attract the Allied reserves thither preparatory to a final and decisive blow at the British front in Flanders. But its opening success attracted thither too large, yet not large enough, a proportion of the German reserves. Blocked frontally by the river, an attempt was made to push west, but it failed in face of Allied resistance, notable for the appearance of American divisions at Chateau Thierry where they gallantly counter-attacked. Ludendorff had now created two huge bulges, and another smaller one, in the Allied front. His next attempt was to pinch out the Kampkentung which lay between the Amiens and Marne bulges. But this time there was no surprise, and the blow on the west side of the tongue, June 9, was too late to coincide with the pressure on the east. A month's pause followed. Ludendorff, Though anxious to strike his long cherished decisive blow against the British in Belgium, considered that their reserves here were still too strong, and so again decided to choose the line of least tactical resistance, hoping that a heavy blow in the south would draw off the British reserves. He had failed to pinch out the Kampkentung on the west of his Marne salient, he was now about to attempt the same method on the east, by attacking on either side of Reims. But he needed an interval for rest and preparation, and the delay was fatal, giving the British and French time to recuperate, and the Americans to gather strength. The British divisions previously broken up had now been reconstituted, and as a result of an urgent appeal made to President Wilson in the crisis of March, and the provision of extra shipping, American troops had been arriving at the rate of 300,000 a month since the end of April. By mid-July seven American divisions were ready to help in resisting the next, and final, German stroke. Five more were being acclimatized to frontline conditions away on the Alsace-Lorraine sector, and five with the British, while another four were assembled in the American training area. The tactical success of his own blows had been Ludendorff's undoing. Yielding too late to their influence, he had then pressed each too far and too long so using up his own reserves and causing an undue interval between each blow. He had driven in three great wedges, but none had penetrated far enough to sever a vital artery, and this strategic failure left the Germans with an indented front which invited flanking counterstrokes. The turning of the tide. On July 15 Ludendorff launched his new attack, but its coming was no secret. East of Reims it was foiled by an elastic defence, and west of Reims the German penetration across the Marne merely enmeshed them more deeply to their downfall, for on July 18 Foch launched a long prepared stroke against the other flank of the Marne salient. Here Pétain, who directed the operation, turned the key which Ludendorff lacked, using masses of light tanks to lead a surprise attack on the Cambrai method. The Germans managed to hold the gates of the salient open long enough to draw back their forces into safety and straighten their line, but their reserves were depleted, 
Ludendorff was forced, on the 20th, to postpone, if not yet to abandon, the offensive in Flanders, and the initiative definitely and finally passed to the Allies. Fox's first concern was to keep it, by giving the enemy no rest while his own reserves were accumulating. To this end, he arranged with Haag, Pitain, and Pershing for a series of local offensives, aimed to free the lateral railway communications and to improve the position of the front ready for further operations. To Haig, he proposed an attack in the Lys sector but Haig suggested instead the Somme area as more suitable. Rawlinson, commanding the British Fourth Army in front of Amiens, had already submitted to Haag a plan for a large surprise attack there, and Fock agreed to this in place of his own proposal. He also placed under Haig the French First Army, Debony, to extend the attack to the south. Rawlinson's army was doubled, and by skillful precautions the enemy were kept in the dark until, on August 8, the attack was delivered, with 456 tanks. The blow had the maximum shock of surprise, and south of the Somme the troops of the Australian and Canadian Corps rapidly overran and overwhelmed the German forward divisions. By August 12 when the advance came to a halt through reaching the tangled wilderness of the old 1916 battlefields, if also through lack of reserves, the 4th Army had taken 21,000 prisoners at a cost of only 20,000 casualties. Great, if not fully exploited, as a material, it was far greater as a moral success. Ludendorff has said, August 8 was the black day of the German army in the history of the war. It put the decline of our fighting power beyond all doubt. The war must be ended. He informed the Emperor and the political chiefs that peace negotiations ought to be opened before the situation became worse, as it must. The conclusions reached at a Crown Council held at Spa were that we can no longer hope to break the war will of our enemies by military operations, and the object of our strategy must be to paralyze the enemy's war will gradually by a strategic defensive. In other words, the German command had abandoned hope of victory or even holding their gains and hoped only to avoid surrender, an insecure moral foundation. On August 10 Fock issued fresh directives for the preparation of an advance by the British Third Army in the general direction of Bapaum and Perun. Meantime he wished Haig to continue the Fourth Army's frontal pressure, but Haig demurred to it as a vain waste of life and gained his point. Economy of force was henceforth to be added to the advantages of the new strategy now evolved. Thus the momentum of the 4th Army had hardly waned before the 3rd Army moved. From then on Fock beat a tattoo on the German front, a series of rapid blows at different points, each broken off as soon as its initial impetus waned, each so aimed as to pave the way for the next, and all close enough in time and space to react on each other. Thus Ludendorff's power of switching reserves to threatened spots was restricted as his balance of reserves was drained. On August 10 the French 3rd Army had struck to the south, then on August 17 the French 10th Army still farther south, next on August 21 the British 3rd Army, followed by the British 1st Army on August 26. Ludendorff's order to the troops holding the list salient to retire was hastened in execution by the attacks of the reformed British 5th Army and by the first week in September the Germans were back on their original starting line, the strong defences of the Hindenburg line. And on September 12th Pershing completed the series of preliminary operations by erasing the St. Mihiel salient, the first feat of the Americans as an independent army. Pershing had originally intended to make this a stepping stone to an advance towards the Brie coal fields and the eastern end of the Germans' main lateral railway near Metz but the project was abandoned for reasons that will be referred to later. Thus no exploitation of the success was attempted. The clear evidence of the Germans' decline and Haig's assurance that he would break the Hindenburg line where the German reserves were thickest, persuaded Fock to seek victory that autumn instead of postponing the attempt until 1919. All the Allied armies in the West were to combine in a simultaneous offensive. The collapse of Bulgaria before this attack developed, an event occurred in the Balkans which, in the words of Ludendorff, sealed the fate of the Quadruple Alliance. 
he had still hoped to hold fast in his strong lines in the west, falling back gradually to fresh lines if necessary, and with his strategic flanks in Macedonia and Italy covered, while the German government was negotiating for a favorable peace. At the same time there was alarm as to the moral effect of the Western Front defeats on the German people, their willpower already undermined by shortage of food, and perhaps also by propaganda. But on September 15 the Allied armies in Salonika attacked the Bulgarian Front, which crumbled in a few days. Gilormat, who had succeeded Sarail in December 1917, had prepared the plan for an offensive. When recalled to France in the crisis of June as governor of Paris, and potential successor to Pétain, he won over the Allied governments to consent to the attempt. His successor in Salonika, Francia Despera e, concentrated a Franco-Serb striking force, under Machic, on the so-called Dobropoli sector, west of the Varna, where the Bulgarians trusted to the strength of the mountain ridges and were weak in numbers. On September 15 Machic attacked and by the night of the 17th the Serbs had penetrated 20 miles deep, while the breach had been expanded to a width of 25 miles. On the 18th the British attack on the Doyeran front was a tactical failure, but it at least helped to pin the enemy's reserves. Meantime the whole of the enemy's front west of the Vardar had collapsed under the converging pressure of the Serbs and French, whose pursuit drove on towards Uskab. And on the 21st the Bulgarian forces east of the Vardar began to fall back in turn. This gave the British aircraft an opportunity, and by bombing the narrow Kostrino Pass they largely contributed, on that side, to turn the Bulgarian retreat into a disorderly flight. With their army split into two parts the Bulgarians, already tired of the war, sought an armistice, which was signed on September 29. Francia Despera E's achievement not only severed the first route of the Central Alliance, but opened the way to an advance on Austria's rear. The first peace note. The capitulation of Bulgaria convinced Ludendorff that it was necessary to take a decisive step towards securing peace. While he was scraping together a paltry half dozen divisions to form a new front in Serbia, and arranging a meeting with the political chiefs, Fox grand assaults fell on the western defences. September 26 to 28, and the line threatened to crack. The German Supreme Command lost its nerve, only for a matter of days, but that was sufficient, and recovery too late. On the afternoon of September 29, Ludendorff was studying the problem in his room at the Hotel Britannique at Spa, a nominously named choice of headquarters. Examination only seemed to make it more insoluble and in a rising outburst of fear and passion he bemoaned his troubles, especially his lack of tanks, and berated all those whom he considered as having thwarted his efforts. The Jealous Staffs The defeatist Reichstag, the two humanitarian Kaiser, and the submarine-obsessed Navy. Gradually he worked himself into a frenzy, until suddenly, with foam on his lips, he fell to the floor in a fit. And that evening it was a physically as well as mentally shaken man who took the precipitate decision to appeal for an armistice, saying that the collapse of the Bulgarian front had upset all his dispositions dash troops destined for the western front had had to be dispatched there. This had fundamentally changed the situation in view of the attacks then being launched on the western front for though these had so far been beaten off their continuance must be reckoned with. This remark refers to Fox General Offensive. The American attack in the Musargon had begun on September 26, but had come practically to a standstill by the 28th. A Franco-Belgo-British attack had opened in Flanders on the 28th, but if unpleasant did not look really menacing. On the morning of the 29th, however, Haig's main blow was falling on the Hindenburg line, and the early news was disquieting. In this emergency, Prince Max was called to be Chancellor to negotiate a peace move, with his international reputation for moderation and honor as its covering pledge. To bargain effectively and without confession of defeat he needed, and asked, a breathing space of ten, eight, even four days, before I have to appeal to the enemy. But Hindenburg merely reiterated that the gravity of the military situation admits of no delay, 
and insisted that a peace offer to our enemies be issued at once, while Ludendorff plaintively chanted the refrain I want to save my army. Hence on October 3rd, the appeal for an immediate armistice went out to President Wilson. It was an open confession of defeat to the world, and even before this, on October 1st, the Supreme Command had undermined their own home front by communicating the same impression to a meeting of the leaders of all political parties. Men who had so long been kept in the dark were blinded by the sudden light. All the forces of discord and pacifism received an immense impulse. While the German government was debating the conditions for an armistice and questioning Ludendorff as to the situation of the army for further resistance if the terms were unacceptable, Fock continued his military pressure. The breach of the Hindenburg line. The plan of the general offensive embraced a series of convergent and practically simultaneous attacks colon 1 and 2. By the Americans between the Meuse and the Argonne Forest, and by the French west of the Argonne, both in the direction of Meziers, beginning on September 26th. By the British on the St. Quentin Cambrai front in the general direction of Morberge, beginning on September 27th. By the Belgian and Allied forces in the direction of Ghent, beginning on September 28. The general aspect was that of a pincer like pressure against the vast salient jutting south between Ypres and Verdun. The attack towards Meziers would shepherd that part of the German armies towards the rather difficult country of the Ardennes and away from their natural line of retreat through Lorraine. It was also dangerously close to the hinge of the Antwerp Meuse line, which the Germans were preparing in rear. The attack towards Morberge would threaten the other main line of communication and retreat through the Liege Gap, but it had farther to go. In these attacks, the Americans had the hardest natural obstacle, the British had to face the strongest defences and the heaviest weight of enemy troops. Pershing's attack opened well, adding surprise to its superiority in numbers, approximately 8 to 1 but soon lost impetus owing to the difficulties of supply and exploitation in such country. When it was eventually suspended on October 14, after bitter fighting and severe losses, the American army was still far distant from the vital railway. A new force, it was suffering the growing pains which the British had passed through in 1915-16. Pershing's difficulties were enhanced by the fact that he had waived his own proposal for an exploitation of the St. Mihail success towards Metz in view of Haig's objection to a move which, however promising in its ultimate aim, would diverge from the general direction of the other Allied attacks. Fock's original plan for the general offensive had accordingly been readjusted, and in consequence Pershing had not only a more difficult sector, but a bare week in which to prepare his blow. The shortness of time led him to use untried divisions instead of switching the more experienced divisions used at St. Mihail. But in the outcome, Haig's insistence was proved unnecessary, for the British attack broke through the Hindenburg line before the Meuse-Argonne attack had drawn away any German division from his front. Haag, by pushing forward his left wing first, facilitated the attack on his right on the strongest section of the Hindenburg line, the Canal du Nord and by October 5 the British were through the German defence system, with open country beyond. But on this front the attackers had actually fewer divisions than the defenders, 12 their tanks were used up, and they could not press forward fast enough to endanger the German retreat. Within a few days the Supreme Command became more cheerful, even optimistic, when it saw that breaking into the Hindenburg line had not been followed by an actual breakthrough of the fighting front. More encouragement came from reports of a slackening in the force of the Allies' attacks, particularly in the exploitation of opportunities. Ludendorff still wanted an armistice, but only to give his troops a rest as a prelude to further resistance and to ensure a secure withdrawal to a shortened defensive line on the frontier. By October 17 he even felt he could do it without a rest. It was less that the situation had changed than that his impression of it had been revised. It had never been quite so bad as he had pictured it on September 29. But his first impression, and depression, had now spread throughout the political circles and public of Germany, as the ripples spread when a pebble has been dropped in a pool. The combined pressure of the Allied armies, and their steady advance, 
were loosening the willpower of the German government and people. The conviction of ultimate defeat, slower to appeal to them than to the army chiefs, was the more forcible when it was realized. And the indirect moral effect of military and economic pressure was accentuated by the direct effect of peace propaganda, skillfully directed and intensively waged by Northcliffe. The home front began to crumble later, but it crumbled quicker than the battlefront. The collapse of Turkey. The offensive planned for the spring in Palestine had been interrupted by the crisis in France and the consequent withdrawal of most of Allenby's British troops. The depletion was made up by reinforcements from India and Mesopotamia, and by September Allenby was again ready to take the offensive. He secretly concentrated, on the Mediterranean flank, the mass of his infantry, and behind them the cavalry. Meantime Lawrence and his Arabs, appearing out of the desert like unseen mosquitoes, menaced the enemy's communications and distracted their attention. At dawn on September 19 the western mass attacked, rolling the Turks back northeast towards the hilly interior, like a door on its hinges. Through the open doorway the cavalry passed, riding straight up the coastal corridor for 30 miles, before swinging east to bestride the Turkish rear. The only remaining way of retreat was eastwards across the Jordan and this was closed with shattering effect by the British air bombers. Completely trapped. The main Turkish armies were rounded up, while Allenby's cavalry exploited the victory of Mejda by a swift and sustained pursuit which gained first Damascus and finally Aleppo. Defenseless and threatened with a direct advance of Milan from Macedonia on Constantinople, Turkey capitulated on October 30th. The collapse of Austria. The last Austrian attempt at an offensive on the Italian front, in conjunction with the German assaults in France had been repulsed on the Piave in June. Diaz waited until conditions were ripe for an offensive in return, until Austria's internal decay had spread and she was without hope from Germany. On October 24 Given's army moved to seize the crossings of the Piave, and on October 27 the main attack opened, driving towards Vittorio Veneto to divide the Austrians in the Adriatic plain from those in the mountains. By October 30 the Austrian army was split in two. The retreat became a rout, and the same day Austria asked for an armistice, which was signed on November 4. Th. The curtain falls on the Western Front. Already on October 23 President Wilson had replied to the German request by a note which virtually required an unconditional surrender. Ludendorff wished to carry on the struggle in hopes that a successful defense of the German frontier might damp the determination of the Allies. But the situation had passed beyond his control, the nation's willpower was broken, and his advice was in discredit. On October 26 he was forced to resign. Then, for 36 hours, the Chancellor lay in coma from an overdose of sleeping draught after influenza. When he returned to his office on the evening of November 3, not only Turkey, but Austria, had capitulated. If the situation on the Western Front was felt to be rather easier, Austrian territory and railways were now available as a base of operations against Germany. Several weeks before, General von Galwitz had told the German Chancellor that such a contingency, then unrealized, would be decisive. Next day revolution broke out in Germany, and swept rapidly over the country. And in these last days of tremendous and diverse psychological strain the reddening glare behind was accentuated by a looming cloud on the Lorraine front, where the renewed American pressure, since November 1st, was on a point more sensitive than other parts, a point where they must not be allowed to advance if the Antwerp Meuse line was to be held any longer. If this continued the Rhine and not the frontier would have to be the next line of resistance. But hourly the revolution was spreading, fanned, as peace negotiations were delayed, by the Kaiser's reluctance to abdicate. Compromise with the revolutionaries was the only chance, and on November 9 Prince Max handed over to the socialist Ebert. Germany had become a republic in outward response to President Wilson's demand and in inward response to the uprising of the German people against the leaders who had led them into disaster. The German fleet had already mutinied when their commanders sought to send them out on a forlorn hope against the British. 
and on November 6 the German delegates had left Berlin to treat for an armistice. In the days previous to their arrival the Allies had been anxiously debating the terms, but here the voice of Fock was clear, and decisive, for President Wilson suggested that the terms should be left to the decision of the military chiefs. Haag, supported by Milner, urged moderation dash Germany is not broken in the military sense. During the last weeks her armies have withdrawn fighting very bravely and in excellent order. Therefore, it is necessary to grant Germany conditions which she can accept. The evacuation of all invaded territories and of Alsace-Lorraine is sufficient to seal the victory. The British also feared the danger of guerrilla warfare and considered that the German army should be kept and demobilized as a safeguard against the spread of Bolshevism. Fock agreed that the German army could undoubtedly take up a new position, and that we could not prevent it. But he disagreed with Haig's conditions and insisted not only that the Germans must hand over a third of their artillery and half their machine guns but that the Allies must occupy the Rhineland with bridgeheads on the east bank of the Rhine. Only by holding the Rhine would the Allies have a guarantee that Germany could not subsequently break off the peace negotiations, whereas Haig's proposals would facilitate the German withdrawal to and consolidation of a new position of resistance. Fock also intimated privately to Clements that the occupation would serve as a pledge for security as well as for reparations. Pershing went even further than Fock and protested against granting any armistice. Fock, however, answered such objections logically dash war is only a means to results. If the Germans now sign an armistice under our conditions those results are in our possession. This being achieved, no man has the right to cause another drop of blood to be shed. The real results he sought by his terms went, however, beyond the armistice. Once the German army was out of the way France might then be able to frame the peace on her terms and not on those of President Wilson. Thus the ironical result of the President's action in allowing the soldiers to settle the armistice conditions was that he nullified the peace conditions set out in his 14 points and gave Germans a just complaint, if not a realistic objection, that they had been entrapped to their doom by his promises. The next point of difference was whether reparations should be mentioned in the armistice. The British objected, but the French insisted. Clements cleverly and disarmingly argued dash I wish only to make mention of the principle, and advocated the vague but comprehensive formula reparations for damages while the French finance minister strengthened its potential effect by inserting the innocent-looking reservation that any future claims or demands on the part of the Allies remain unaffected. With greater innocence Colonel House swallowed this clause and through his support it was added to the terms. The next question was that of the naval terms, and here the national positions were reversed. Fock, having made his own terms so severe was anxious to lighten the naval terms and to demand merely the surrender of submarines. He asked somewhat scoffingly dash as for the German surface fleet, what do you fear from it? During the whole war only a few of its units have ventured from its ports. The surrender of these units will be merely a manifestation, which will please the public but nothing more. But Sir Eric Geddes, the first Lord of the Admiralty, reminded Fock that it was the British fleet which held in check the German fleet, and pointed out that if the latter was left intact the war strain on the former would continue until peace was settled. Lloyd George suggested that as an effective but less humiliating compromise the naval terms should demand the internment and not the surrender of the German surface ships. This solution was agreed upon, although the Admiralty only gave way under protest, and the final demand apart from the surrender of 150 submarines, was for the internment in neutral port, or failing them, allied ports of ten battleships and six battle cruisers, besides light craft. Owing to the difficulty of finding an adequate neutral port, their ultimate destination became the British base of Scarpa Flow. One important effect of this prolonged discussion was that the terms to Germany were not settled until Austria had capitulated an effect which, as Lloyd George shrewdly foresaw, enabled the Allies to put stiffer terms to Germany with less chance of refusal. The Germans' acceptance of these severe terms was hastened less by the existing situation on the Western Front than by the collapse of the Home Front, 
coupled with exposure to a new thrust in rear through Austria. The Allied advance in the west was still continuing, in some parts seeming to gather pace in the last days, but the main German forces had escaped from the perilous salient, and their complete destruction of roads and railways made it impossible for supplies to keep pace with the advancing troops. A pause must come while these communications were being repaired, and thus the Germans would have breathing space to rally their resistance. The advance reached the line Ponte Moussen Sedan Mestuas Mons Ghent by November 11, the line of the opening battles in 1914, but strategically it had come to a standstill. It is true that, to meet this situation, Foch had concentrated a large Franco American force to strike below Metz directly east into Lorraine. As the general Allied advance had almost absorbed the enemy's reserves, this stroke, if driven in deeply and rapidly, promised the chance of turning the whole of this new line of defence along the Meuse to Antwerp and might even upset his orderly retreat to the Rhine. But it is unlikely that this Lorraine thrust, prepared for November 14, would have solved the hitherto insoluble problem of maintaining the initial momentum of advance after an initial breakthrough. Fock did not think so. For when asked how long it would take to drive the Germans back across the Rhine if they refused the armistice terms, he replied dash maybe three, maybe four or five months. Who knows? And his post-war comment on this Lorraine offensive was dash its importance has always been exaggerated. It is regarded as the irresistible blow that was to fell and administer the knockout to the botch. That's nonsense. The Lorraine offensive was not in itself any more important than the attack then being prepared in Belgium. On the list. More truly significant was the decision on November 4, after Austria's surrender, to prepare a concentric advance on Munich by three Allied armies, which would be assembled on the Austro German frontier within five weeks. In addition, Trenchard's independent air force was about to bombble in on a scale hitherto unattempted in air warfare. And the number of American troops in Europe had now risen to 2,085,000 and the number of divisions to 42, of which 32 were ready for battle. The internal situation and the obvious external developments which could be calculated were the factors which produced Germany's decision to capitulate, not any single and hypothetical blow on the strongest part of her front. With revolution at home, the gathering menace on their southern frontier and the continued strain on their western, the German delegates had no option but to accept the drastic terms of the armistice, which was signed in Fox Railway carriage in the forest of Kampen at 5 a.m. on November 11. And at 11 o'clock that morning the World War came to an end. Eight, scene 1 The first breakthrough at 4.30 a.m., on March 21, 1918, the sudden crash of some 4,000 German guns heralded the breaking of a storm which, in grandeur of scale, of awe, and of destruction, surpassed any other in the World War. By nightfall a German flood had inundated 40 miles of the British front, a week later it had reached a depth of nearly 40 miles, and was almost lapping the outskirts of Amiens and in the ensuing weeks the Allied cause itself was almost submerged. These weeks rank with those of the Marne in 1914 as the two gravest military crises of the World War. In them Germany came desperately near to regaining that lost chance, and best chance, of victory, which she had forfeited in early September, 1914. And to the people of Britain at least the risk seemed even worse because more fully realized and because their stake was greater. No episode of the war is so studded with question marks as that on which the curtain rose, March 21, 1918. Why, when the Allies had been attacking with superior force for two years, were they suddenly fighting with their backs to the wall? Why, after the public had been assured that inter-allied cooperation was assured and a generalissimo unnecessary? was one urgently demanded and appointed. Why, when the Allies had made so little visible impression on the German front in two years of constant offensive, were the Germans able to tear a huge hole in the Allied front within a few days? Why, as this breach so far exceeded in size the dream aims of its Allied forerunners, did it fail to obtain any decisive results?
in seeking the answers to these several wise lies the main interest of March 21st for history. The primary cause of the sudden British change from the offensive to the defensive lay in the fact that the German fighting strength on the Western Front was increased by 30% between November, 1917, and March 21st, 1918, while the British strength fell by 25%, compared with the previous summer. The bulk of these fresh German troops was transferred from the Russian front, where Ludendorff, as a preliminary to his great bid for victory in the West, had wrung a definite peace from the Bolshevik government, and also from Romania. But if these facts explain the change, the causes of its abruptness and extent lie beneath the surface. Chief among them was that the British command had dissipated its credit, both in balance of manpower and with the government. This doubly unfortunate result was due to the strategy which can be summarized adequately in a single word, manifold in its element significance. Pass Kendall. Conscious of his responsibility to the nation, and personally distrustful of Haag's judgment, Mr. Lloyd George placed a firm check on the flow of reinforcements to France lest they should be poured down another offensive drain pipe. Friction between the two was almost inevitable because of their extreme contrast of temperament and training. The one a volatile Welshman, and the other a stubborn and taciturn Scot. The one with a magnetic power of drawing even the unwilling to him, the other with an impregnable capacity for holding even the most willing at a distance. The one infinitely adaptable, the other inflexibly consistent, and persistent. In the one, speech and thought so closely coincided that they became fused while with the other the opening of the mouth automatically cut out the action of the brain. Anecdotes of Haig's inarticulateness, to the point of unintelligibility, are many. One of the best is of the occasion when, presenting the prizes to an oldish shot cross-country team, all that he could get out was dash I congratulate you on your running. You have run well. I hope you will run as well in the presence of the enemy. Again. Lloyd George was as receptive to ideas as he was critical of the pretensions of hierarchical wisdom, and he constantly sought to gather a variety and diversity of opinions as a broad basis for judgment. Haag, as his own admiring biographer, General Charteris, confesses, had not a critical mind, and neither knowledge of, nor interest in, affairs outside his own military work and he took over the command genuinely convinced that the position to which he had now been called was one which he, and he alone in the British army, could fill. When to his rigidly disciplined outlook was added this feeling of divine right, it raised an almost impassable barrier of character between him and the Prime Minister. Neither made much effort to surmount it, and growing distrust on both sides, a distrust of Haig's military and Lloyd George's personal methods, steadily heightened it. Throughout the months following past Kendall and preceding the German offensive, Lloyd George was assiduously seeking to create a power above Haag, as dismissal would have raised a political storm. His solution was the Supreme War Council in control of a general inter-allied reserve. But the scheme was thwarted by Haig's action. For, having no belief in the method of battle control by committee, he shattered it by his refusal to contribute his small quota of nine divisions. Whatever the just strength of his objection to the method on principle, his action is not easy either to understand or to justify. For, convinced as he was that the German attack was coming on his front, and conscious of his shortage of reserves, it seems curious that he should not risk a contribution of nine divisions in order to draw from a pool of thirty. He chose, instead, to rely on an arrangement with Badain for mutual support, whereby in case of need he might be reinforced by six to eight French divisions. This was far less than Haig could hope for from the general reserve, if formed. Moreover, Haig's distrust of French fulfillment of such promises had for years been so marked, his tongue so caustic about them, that it is astonishing that he should have pinned his faith to a small and purely French promise when he could have had a much larger promise from a board on which there was a British representative. This excessive trust on the part of the British command, like the government's withholding of reinforcements, may well have been due to an apparently well-grounded belief in the power of their defence to stop a German attack. 
Why should the Germans succeed where the British had so often failed? The only close approach to a breakthrough by the British had been at Cambrai, with the tanks, and Haig knew that it was almost impossible for the Germans to have built tanks in quantity. But in his defensive calculations, as in his offensive actions throughout the past two years, he seems to have underrated the infinite value of surprise, which for 3,000 years of recorded warfare has proved the master key to victory. The real significance of the Cambrai attack on November 20 previous had been that it had revived the use of such a key, forging it from an amalgam of armor and the caterpillar track. Unhappily, the effect of this tank key was largely lost because when inserted in the lock Haig had not the power to turn it fully, through exhausting his strength in the pass Kendall Mud. In the counter-attack of November 30 the Germans had used a key similar in principle if different in design, a short sharp bombardment with gas and smoke shell, followed up by an inrush of infantry, specially trained in the new infiltration tactics. It would seem that by the following March the British had not sufficiently taken this lesson to heart. For, though the Fifth Army's subsequent excuses of weak numbers and a long line had some justification, Goff had expressed confidence beforehand in his power to resist the onslaught. But when Goff's original front was forced, an inadequate preparation and coordination of the measures to block the enemy's path farther back was revealed. He had failed to arrange for the blowing up of certain causeways, and general headquarters had not given him a definite order. Worse still was the confusion caused by the fact that in the case of the more important railway bridges, this duty was entrusted to the French railway authorities instead of the Fifth Army, and in this way the vital railway bridge at Perrin was allowed to fall undestroyed into German hands. A similar haziness appeared in the GHQ instructions for the conduct of the defensive battle, for in one place Goff was told we should make our preparations to fight east of the Somme and in another it may well be desirable to fall back to the rearward defences of Perrin and the Somme. To reconcile these alternatives was not easy. It would have been simpler to have forestalled the Germans' attack by a withdrawal similar to their own in 1917, accepting the necessary sacrifice of ground, although political considerations and military sentiments tended to hinder such a course. Adaptation of plan to circumstance may be necessary and often more advantageous, but it is the hardest test of generalship, and thus demands the clearest thought among those who attempt it. The fog of war is bad enough without being thickened by obscure phrasing, battles may be lost by lack of lucidity as well as by lack of tenacity. The effect of these instructions to the Fifth Army was that labor had to be divided between the alternative defense lines, without time for the satisfactory organization of either. Moreover, a withdrawal to the line of the Somme while the battle was actually in progress demanded a high capacity for rearguard action, and for this the officers and men of the 5th Army as a whole were neither prepared nor practiced. To quote from among many witnesses, Colonel Roland Fielding has recorded, a retreat was the one possibility that had never occurred to us. And, unfortunately, it involves a kind of maneuvering in which we are unversed, in spite of all our experience. There is indirect proof of this statement in the fact that no fewer than 500 guns were abandoned to the enemy in the first two days. The chance of avoiding a retreat was diminished, as its execution was endangered, because of the scarcity of reserves behind Goff's front and of the way the general headquarters refused his request to move these nearer the front before the battle and when it opened he was told that he would have to wait for one extra division until the first four available had been sent to the third army. These facts give point to his remark dash it is impossible for me to say that GHQ showed a full understanding of the circumstances and progress of the battle. And a chance of improving it was lost because dash during the whole eight days battle, the only member of GHQ who came to see and hear things for himself was Haig. He came and saw me once, on Saturday, 23rd. We did not go at all into details of the situation, nor of the action of the Third Army. On the eve of the German onslaught, only three out of the 18 British divisions in reserve were disposed behind the Fifth Army front. Six were behind the Third Army, 
and the rest were still farther north, where no attack came or was by then expected. Haig's justification for keeping his reserves in the north until he was absolutely certain of the German aim lay in the narrowness of the space that there intervened between the front and the channel ports. But it is not a complete explanation of his attitude. That was influenced to some extent by his prolonged doubt of the German intentions, at a conference of his army commanders on February 16 he expressed the view that the main blow, if the Germans attacked early, would probably be made against the French. Indications from the British front are that no attack in strength in Flanders is possible at the moment, and that there are at present no signs of any big offensive being imminent on the rest of the British front. A small attack on the First Army front near Lens was a possibility. GHQ was certainly slow to react to the warnings furnished by air reports and by the Fifth Army. At a further conference on March 2 the likelihood of early attack was recognized but with no greater object than that of cutting off the Cambrai salient and drawing in our reserves. And even on March 8 it was stated that there were no indications of an enemy attack south of St. Quentin. Higgs sense of the key importance of the Arras Bastion was justified by the event. But, in keeping the bulk of his reserves in the north, he risked the security of the already thin Fifth Army in order to have ample insurance against a less probable risk to the Channel ports. One reason was that he felt he could better afford to yield ground in front of Mians than elsewhere. Another was a confidence, which the event unhappily refuted, that the German advance would not go far enough to become a menace to the general situation. Calculated risks are inherent in generalship. The questions that linger in the mind are whether Haig's miscalculation was avoidable and whether he did all that was possible to cover the risks that his dispositions involved. It is at least clear that he preferred to risk his junction with the French rather than his hold on the channel ports, and that his dispositions eased the task of the enemy more than they could have expected. If this was good luck for the Germans, their thorough and skillful preparations for the initial assault had earned them success, although here again fortune favoured them. For the effect of the gas gained surprise was immensely increased by nature which in the early hours of March 21 provided a thick mist that cloaked the infiltrating assailants as much as it masked the defending machine guns. Without this aid it is questionable how far the German tactical surprise would have succeeded, and in this lay the essential inferiority of the German means of surprise, compared with that at Cambrai, and later, on August 8, 1918 which was achieved by armoured machines. These not only formed the main material from which the key was manufactured but provided the power to press it home and turn it. In contrast, Ludendorff had to depend on unarmoured infantry to exploit the opening created by the brief but intense bombardment with gas shell. For he had failed to grasp the significance of the tank and neglected to develop it in time, only in August, 1918. When it was used to strike him a mortal blow did he put it in the urgent class of war material. But the German plan was distinguished by a research for tactical surprise more thorough and far-reaching than in any of the earlier operations of the war. The Germans significantly record that Haig's dispatches dealing with the attacks of 1917 were found most valuable, because they showed how not to do it. To Ludendorff's credit he realized that the obvious is an obstacle that superior weight cannot compensate, and, once created, can rarely overcome. And he sought to effect and develop surprise by a compound of many deceptive elements. It is to his credit also that, unlike Falk and Hain, who merely wanted officer clerks, he surrounded himself with able assistants. Captain J compiled the new training handbooks, while Colonel Brutchmuller had emerged from retirement to become the famous artillery battle piece producer. With a prophetic play upon his name he was known as Dirch Brutchmuller-Breakthrough Muller. Under his superintendence the masses of artillery were brought up close to the front line in concealment, and opened fire without previous registration through the method he had introduced. The infantry were trained in new infiltrating tactics, of which the guiding idea was that the leading troops should probe and penetrate the weak points of the defense while the reserves were directed to back up success, not to redeem failure. 
Special reconnaissance parties were assigned simply for the task of sending back early news of progress. The ordinary lines of attacking infantry were preceded by a dispersed chain of storm groups, with automatic rifles, machine guns and light mortars. These groups were to push straight through wherever they could find an opening and leave the defenders strong points to be dealt with by the succeeding lines. The fastest, not the slowest, must set the pace, and no effort was made to keep a uniform alignment. Further the inclination of leaders to assemble their troops and get them in hand after a certain objective has been reached must be suppressed. If the troops know the instructions of the commanders they can go on of themselves. The assaulting divisions were brought up overnight, those of the second line to a position only about a mile behind the first, and the third only ten miles back. All reserves started moving forward at zero, so as to be at hand when wanted and when a second line division was so used it came under the control, not of a higher commander sitting in rear, but of the first line division commander, who had his finger on the pulse of the battle. On November 11th at Mons, prophetic date and place, the German leaders had met in conclave to decide on the date and place of the forthcoming offensive. Naturally, according to German custom, the issue was thrashed out, not between the nominal commanders, but between their chiefs of staff, Ludendorff, Kull, Crown Prince Rupprechts, Schulenberg, German Crown Princes, together with Ludendorff's own strategical advisor, Major Wetzel. Kull and Schulenberg each wanted the attack to be made on the front of their own army groups, Kull indicating Flanders and Schulenberg the Verdun sector. Wetzel was inclined to support Schulenberg, arguing that an attack on the flanks of Verdun, a salient, would forestall any future Franco-American offensive at that delicate point, and, after defeating the French, the whole German strength could be turned against the British. Ludendorff, however, rejected this scheme on the score that the ground was unfavorable, that a breakthrough at Verdun would lead nowhere decisive, and that the French army had recuperated too well after nearly a year's undisturbed convalescence. He laid down as a first principle that the British must be defeated, and thought that the drain of Paskendale would make them an easy prey. But he disagreed with Cull's proposal to strike, between Ypres and Lens, towards Hasbrook as it would meet the main mass of the British, and this low ground would be long in drying. He favoured instead an attack around S.D. Quentin, although Wetzel contended that it would be slowed down in crossing the old devastated area on the Somme and was within easy reach of French reinforcements. A final decision was put off and Ruprecht noted in his diary Ludendorff underestimates the toughness of the British. In December, Wetzel tried to reconcile, and sagely combine, the two projects, by dividing the offensive into two acts, first, a wide front attack on both sides of S.D. Quentin, and, second, a fortnight later, a breakthrough in Flanders towards Hasbrook. The first act was only to be carried far enough to draw the British reserves southward. Wetzel summed up we shall not, in my opinion, succeed in obtaining our object by one great attack at one place, however carefully it is prepared. We can only shatter their front by a clever combination of successive, definitely related, mutually reacting attacks on different parts of the front. Finally in the direction of Hasbrook. It was to be left to Fock to adopt his method without acknowledgement. For, after further conferences, Ludendorff decided on January 27 in favor of the St. Quentin attack, known by the code name Michael, and against the Hasbrook attack St. George which was only kept in mind and not in immediate readiness. A further complication arose. The front from the Belgian coast to St. Quentin was under uprocked and for political as well as personal reasons it was considered necessary to give the German crown prince a chance of redeeming the credit he had lost in the struggle at Verdun in 1916. Hence he was given a share in the offensive by employing the 18th Army, Cusier, which belonged to his army group, on the southern flank of the main offensive. It is a moot question whether he could not have helped better, if less gloriously, by using it for a diversion at Verdun, in order to draw the French reserves away from, instead of towards, the intended breach in the British front. In a broad sense, 
Ludendorff's chosen sector, which extended from Arras to Lafayette, fulfilled his new principle of taking the line of least resistance, for it was the weakest in defences, defenders, and reserves. Moreover, it was close to the joint between the French and British armies, and so lent itself to a separation. But although it was true, as a generalization, that this sector was comparatively weak, the classification was loose and inaccurate. The northerly third of it was strong and strongly held, by Bonn's third army, with fourteen divisions, six in reserve, while the bulk of the British reserves were on this flank, which also could and did receive support more quickly from the other British armies which lay to the north. The remaining two-thirds of the sector upon which the German blow fell was held by Goff's fifth army. The central part facing Marwitz's army was held by seven divisions, two in reserve. The southern part facing Hutia's army was also held by seven divisions, one in reserve. But Ludendorff gave Below's army near Arras 19 divisions for the initial attack, by its left wing only, on a nine and a half mile frontage. South of it came Marwitz's army. As the British salient towards Cambrai was not to be attacked directly, but pinched out, this four mile stretch was adequately occupied by two German divisions, and Marwitz had eighteen divisions for his nine and a half mile attack frontage. On the extreme south, either side of S. D. Quentin, came Hutia's army. Ludendorff gave it only twenty four divisions to attack on a twenty mile frontage. Hence we see that it had only half the proportionate strength of the other armies. Despite his principle, he was distributing his strength according to the enemy's strength and not concentrating against the weakest resistance. The direction given in his orders emphasized this still more. The main effort was to be exerted north of the Somme for, after breaking through, below and Marwitz were to wheel northwest, rolling up the British front, while the river and Hutier formed a screen to cover their flank. Hutier's army was merely an offensive flank guard. This plan was to be radically changed in execution, and to have the appearance of following the line of least resistance, because Ludendorff gained rapid success where he desired it little and failed to gain success where he wanted it most. What of the British meantime? As the result of a war game played at Versailles Sir Henry Wilson had forecast that the enemy attack would come on the Cambrai lens sector, but that the Germans would wait to deliver it until about July 1st when their training and accumulation of forces would be complete. Wilson was somewhat outside the mark in place and still more out in time. Haig's intelligence was more accurate, although it did not foresee the full southward extension of the attack. As the time drew near signs multiplied sufficiently to enable Haig to calculate the date. On March 18, German prisoners captured near St. Quentin gave the date as the 21st, and on the evening of the 20th Max's 18 Corps was able through raiding to establish the certainty of the morrow's attack. Thus it is true to say that no strategic surprise was obtained. Nor was it even obtainable under the conditions of 1918 in France. But with the opposing armies spread out in contact along the far-flung line of entrenchments, a quick breakthrough followed by a rapid exploitation along the line of least resistance might promise such a decisive upset as normally is only attainable by choosing the line of least expectation. The hurricane bombardment opened at 4.30 am on the 21st, concentrating for two hours on the British artillery and then, reinforced by mortars, turning on the trenches. Almost all telephone cables were severed and wireless sets destroyed while the fog made visual signaling impossible. Thus the troops were made dumb and the commanders blind. At 9.40 am, or in some parts earlier, the German infantry advanced under cover of a creeping barrage, supplemented by low-flying aircraft. The British outpost zone was overrun almost everywhere by midday, but this was inevitable and had been foreseen. But the northern attack met such stubborn resistance against the right of Bong's army that it had not seriously penetrated the main battle zone even by the night of the 22nd, and, despite putting in successive reinforcements, the capture of Volk's Varaukot was then the high water mark of its progress. On most parts of Goff's army front the battle zone resistance was just as firm, 
but the flood found a way through on the 21st near Lafia, on the extreme right, at Essini and at Ronsoy. The resistance of the 21st Division at Epi for a time checked this last breach from spreading northward, but it began to crumble so deeply that the neighboring sectors were affected. Southward, again near SD Quentin, the line sagged still more deeply, and on the night of the 22nd Goff was driven to order a general retirement to the line of the Somme. He was hurried into this precipitate decision by a mistaken report that the enemy was already across the Krasat Canal at Jussi and so behind his right flank. Early next morning the Perun bridgehead was abandoned. Several of Goff's subordinate commanders were even more vague or misled as to the situation, control lapsed, and gaps occurred. The worst was at the joint between Bungs and Goff's armies and this the Germans speedily accentuated and a new danger arose farther south had the joint between the British and French. But Ludendorff, continuing to ignore his new principle, was only intent to nourish the attack near Arras, where progress was disappointing. Meantime Hutia, once across the Krasat Canal, was pressing swiftly forward, almost without check save from his own limited role. On the 23rd, Ludendorff again emphasizes in his orders that Billows is the principal effort, reinforces it by three divisions, and indicates that the 6th and 4th armies, still more to the north, will chime in to help it. Two days later, when the check to Below has become still clearer, Ludendorff arranges that Below's hitherto passive right wing shall strike direct at Arras on the 28th in order to overcome this strong place which is hampering and enfilading Below's attacking left wing. And on the 29th the 6th army, reinforced by 6 or 7 divisions, is to extend the attack northwards between Arras and Lens, with Boulogne as its goal. Meanwhile Hurler is actually told not to pass the line Neuenroy for the time being. On the 26th, Ludendorff begins to doubt Below's chances and to turn his eyes south. But, instead of throwing his weight thither, he merely makes it a second principal effort. And, even so, it is to be towards a means by Marwitz's army, while Hutior is told not to cross the Ava without fresh orders. This means that the army which has all the difficult ground of the old 1916 Somme battlefields to cross is pushed on while the army that has a smoother path is held back. The apparent explanation and the extraordinary flux of Ludendorff's thought, is revealed in a later sentence of the order which shows that he is contemplating a vast fan-like movement in which three armies are to wheel south towards Paris while below and his neighbours wheel north to crush the British against the sea coast. The grandiose conception was far beyond Ludendorff's resources in reserves. It would seem that for the moment he was intoxicated with success, and, like Moltke in August, 1914, was counting his chickens before they were hatched. Another parallel with 1914 was that the army commander's reports of progress outstripped their actual stages of advance. Even they, however, were less futuristic than the Kaiser who, according to Ruprecht, announced a complete victory on March 21 SD. On the 27th, Cutia reached Mont Didier, a penetration of nearly 40 miles but next day Ludendorff had a cold douche of reality when below Zaras attack with nine divisions collapsed under a storm of fire from the expectant defense. No mist came to the aid of the attackers. Ludendorff then put a belated stop to Below's vain efforts, and countermanded the 6th Army's attack intended for the morrow. Amiens was made the main objective, and Marwitz was given all the reserves at hand, nine divisions but Hutia had to pause for two days until four fresh divisions reached him. By this time the surge towards Amiens was almost stagnant, its impetus having slackened far less because of the resistance than because of the exhaustion of the troops and the difficulties of supply. Roads were blocked, transport scuppered, and reserves harassed by the British air attacks, which here played a vital part. When the attack was renewed on March 30 it had little force and made little progress in face of a resistance that had been afforded time to harden, helped by the cement of French reserves which were now being poured into the sagging wall. That day was the first on which their artillery, arriving later than the infantry, had come into action in force. Even so, 
There was a moment of crisis when the Germans captured the more Illwood Ridge, which was not only at the joint between the French and British but commanded the crossings of the Aver and Luce where they joined. And these covered the main Amiens Paris railway. But the menace was warded off by a swift counterstroke of the Canadian Cavalry Brigade, made on the initiative of and led by General Seeley, ex war minister turned Murat. The ridge was regained, and although lost again next day, by other troops, the coup seems to have extinguished the now flickering flame of German energy. Nearly a week passed before, on April 4, a further German effort was made by 15 divisions, of which only four were fresh. Meeting a reinforced defense, this had still less success. Seeing that his new effort was too late, Ludendorff then suspended the attack towards Amiens. At no time had he thrown his weight along the line of fracture between the British and French armies. Yet on March 24, Badain had intimated to Haig that if the Germans' progress continued along this line, he would have to draw back the French reserves southwestwards to cover Paris. How little more German pressure would have been needed to turn the crack into a yawning chasm? The knowledge is one more testimony to the historical truth that a joint is the most sensitive and profitable point of attack. The supreme features of this great offensive are, first, the immensity of its outward results compared with those of any previous offensive in the West, second, its ineffectiveness to attain decisive results. For the first it would be both unjust and untrue to blame the British troops. They achieved miracles of heroic endurance, and the prolonged resistance in most of the battle zone is the proof. The main cause of the subsequently rapid flow back lay in the frequent breakdown of control and communication. During three years of trench warfare an elaborate and complex system, largely dependent on the telephone, had been built up, and when the static suddenly became fluid the British paid the inevitable penalty of violating that fundamental axiom of war, elasticity. On the German side, Arras was the actual rock on which their plan broke. It is probable that military conservatism cost them dear. For Bruchmuller has revealed that while Hutier's army carried out his surprise bombardment designs, the Lowe's in the north clung to their old-fashioned methods, refusing to dispense with preliminary ranging. Once again, and near the Somme again, Below's conventional military mind had proved the best asset to the British Army. But a more fundamental cause of the German failure was Ludendorff's own limitations. He had sufficient receptiveness to see a new truth, but not sufficient elasticity or conviction to carry it out fully in practice. The principle of following the line of least resistance was too novel for one who from his youth had been saturated in the Clausewitzian doctrine of striking at the enemy's main force. The British must be defeated was his catchword, his vision was bloodshot, and he could not realize that in strategy the longest way round is often the shortest way there, that a direct approach to the object exhausts the attacker and hardens the resistance by compression whereas an indirect approach loosens the defender's hold by upsetting his balance. In the actual execution of the offensive by the German troops there is another cause of failure that has been commonly overlooked and yet is of great significance. It is the physical effect on ill-nourished troops of breaking into an area full of well-filled supply depots, and the psychological effect of discovering that the enemy is so much better fed and equipped than themselves that they have been nourished only with lies, about the result of the U-boat campaign and the enemy's economic condition. This dual effect is to be traced in many sources of evidence. One of the most illuminating and trustworthy is the war diary of the German poet and novelist Rudolf Binding. On March 27 he records now we are already in the English back areas. A land flowing with milk and honey. Marvelous people these who will only equip themselves with the very best that the earth produces. Our men are hardly to be distinguished from English soldiers. Everyone wears at least a leather jerkin, a waterproof. English boots or some other beautiful thing. The horses are feeding on masses of oats and gorgeous food cake. And there is no doubt the army is looting with some zest. Dot on the next day follows a highly significant entry. Today the advance of our infantry suddenly stopped near Albert. Nobody could understand why. Our armies had reported no enemy between Albert and Amiens. Our way seemed entirely clear. 
I jumped into a car with orders to find out what was causing the stoppage in front. Our division was right in front of the advance and could not possibly be tired out. It was quite fresh. As soon as I got near the town I began to see curious sights. Strange figures, which looked very little like soldiers, and certainly showed no sign of advancing, were making their way back out of the town. There were men driving cows. Others who carried a hen under one arm and a box of notepaper under the other. Men carrying a bottle of wine under their arm and another one open in their hand. Men staggering. Men who could hardly walk. When I got into the town the streets were running with wine. I drove back to divisional headquarters with a fearful impression of the situation. The advance was held up, and there was no means of setting it going again for hours. It proved hopeless, and the officers were powerless, to collect the troops that day, while the sequel he records was that the troops which moved out of Albert next day cheered with wine and in victorious spirits were mown down straight away on the railway embankment by a few English machine guns. But the intoxication due to loot was even greater and more general than that due to wine and the fundamental cause of both was the general sense of years of privation. A staff officer even stops a car, when on an urgent mission, to pick up an English waterproof from the ditch. And in this intoxication the Germans not only lose their chance of reaching Amiens, but ruin sources of supply invaluable to the maintenance of their own advance, wrecking waterworks for the sake of the brass taps. The cause of this senseless craving is revealed in their impression that the English made everything either out of rubber or brass, because these were the two materials which we had not seen for the longest time. The madness, stupidity and indiscipline of the German troops is shown in other things as well. Any useless toy or trifle they seize and load onto their packs, anything useful which they cannot carry away they destroy. Once this plunder was exhausted the reaction was all the greater and the contrast of their own paucity with the enemy's plenty the more depressing. As helps of military success fade, and with them the hope of again nourishing their stomachs, and souls, on the enemy's supplies, a moral rot sets in rapidly. Anyone with personal experience of war knows how the thought of food and of civilized comfort fills the soldier's horizon. How far was the German army's sudden moral decline from July onward, when the last attack proved abortive, due not only to increasing hunger but to the eye opening conviction of the enemy's greater material power of endurance? Propaganda and censorship could hide the difference so long as the front was an inviolable wall of partition. But when the Germans broke through the British lines and into the back areas the truth was revealed to the German troops. Is the historical verdict, penetrating beneath the surface of military statistics and acreage to the psychological foundation, then to be that the British disaster of March, 1918, was a stroke of fortune for those who suffered it? If so, it seems a pity that the solution was not tried earlier. Instead of conducting unwilling frocks round the front, the British command might have arranged visits for Germans to its back areas, that land flowing with milk and honey. Or at least it might have designedly released a proportion of its prisoners after they had been suitably entertained. Such a strategy would certainly have supplied the imagination which many found so lacking in the military leadership. Eight seen to the breakthrough in Flanders on April 9, 1918, the first anniversary of the abortive British attempt to break through the deadlock trench front in our toys. The Germans made a more successful attempt, in the reverse direction. This was the second move in Ludendorff's gigantic offensive campaign which had begun on March 21. Springing from around Neuve-Chapelle, where, three years before, the first British attempt to break the deadlock had penetrated half a mile deep in all, a narrow German jet of attack swept away the opposing Portuguese and before noon on the 9th had penetrated to a depth of over three miles. To the north, but happily not to the south. The flanks of the breach crumbled, and with fresh jets playing upon the British front more sectors gave way. By the next day, 24 miles of frontage had been engulfed, and, on the 12th, Sir Douglas Haig issued his historic order of the day There is no other course open to us but to fight it out. 
every position must be held to the last man. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight on to the end. To the British public, and even perhaps to the British forces, this message came like a thunderclap, awakening them to the graveness of the danger and seeming almost to convey a warning that hope had gone and only honor remained, to go down fighting with their faces to the foe. Dot yet at that moment, and still more during the following days, it is probable that the least sanguine and most depressed man was not in the British ranks, but behind the advancing enemy, Ludendorff himself. On March 21st and the next days Ludendorff had seen his carefully contrived strategical plan, for his great bid for victory, going astray. The rapidity with which progress was made where he did not want it, and its slowness where he did want it, had driven him unwillingly to press on towards a mains across the desert of the old Somme battlefields, instead of wheeling northwards from the Somme. With the repulse of his delayed assault on the Arras Bastion on March 28 he had been forced to relinquish definitely his plan of rolling up the flank of the British armies and penning them back against the coast, isolated from their allies. But his thrust towards Amiens failed, however narrowly, to reach its destination, through its belatedness and difficulties of supply. In desperation, rather than in reflection, Ludendorff clutched at wet cells rejected scheme, and decided to launch the St. George attack against the Ypres Lens sector. But he had pressed Michael too long and too far. Not only was he short of reserves, but he had to accumulate fresh supplies and ammunition, and switch his heavy artillery northwards. Conferences on April 1st and 2nd showed that the offensive could not be ready until the 9th, and, instead of 35 additional divisions, only 11 could be sent in time. With a sense of ironic humor the attack was rechristened Georgette. Ludendorff was in luck at the start, but it was an elusive and delusive form of luck. The luck was that his opening blow fell on the front of the 2nd Portuguese Division, which was just about to be relieved by two British divisions, and had in the meanwhile been stretched to hold the whole core sector. The less agreeable aspect, for Ludendorff, of this piece of luck was somewhat unkindly epitomized in the comment that the Portuguese ruined Ludendorff and saved their allies by running away. For although the extension and development of this attack was according to plan, Ludendorff never seems to have been wholehearted in pursuing it. From the point of view of his strategy, and its interests, he either pressed the attack too hard or did not press enough. The clearest evidence of this irresolution and depression, is to be found in the captured archives of the 4th German Army, which attacked in this sector. And their evidence is a better guide than any carefully prepared post-war apologia. They have the further advantage that they fell into enemy hands before any judicious adulterations could be made in the interests of high commanders reputations. These German records show the general staff officers, Losberg for the 4th Army, Kull for the Army Group and Ludendorff at the supreme command, settling all affairs without even the pretense of consulting their respective superiors, Sixt von Arnim, Rupricht and Hindenburg. They also show Ludendorff doling out divisions with a parsimonious hand, usually too late and inadequate in number for real success, so apprehensive that his new bulge would become another sack that at the moment of supreme opportunity he stops the German advance for fear of a counter-attack. But all this was hidden from the British commanders and men. They only knew the enemy's blows, not his doubts and disquietude. And if he felt himself in a sack, they felt themselves in a mincing machine, with an unpleasant likelihood of their minced remains being ejected into the sea. That is the sort of wall that an army does not relish having at its back. Whereas on the Somme there had at least been ample room to withdraw, in the north the British troops, bases, and communications were all crowded into and passed through a narrow throat of land sensitive to the least pressure and all too easy to strangle. Apart from the coast railway, the only lateral line of communication ran through St. Paul Lillis's Brook barely fifteen miles behind the front trenches. Thus it was that a ten-mile German penetration, reached on April 12th and, happily, never deepened appreciably, was as menacing, if not more so, 
than 40 miles had been on the Somme. Dot. The strain was all the more severe because it fell on troops already strained. Besides the Portuguese, all except one, the 55th, of the six British divisions between the Labassi and the Ypres Cummins canals were battle worn, having come to this front on relief from the battle in the south. Strained, they were also stretched. The drain on Hague's reserves and the greater importance of the vital bastion of high ground, Arras Givenchy, had caused a distribution of strength by which this handful of divisions had to hold a front of 24 miles. Worst of all, the greatest stretching of all fell on those who could least bear it. The Portuguese corps had been holding a six-mile front, on both sides of Neuve Chapelle. It had been in the line for a long time, and increasing cases of insubordination had been a warning of declining morale. General Horn, the first army commander, reshuffling his dispositions, withdrew the first Portuguese division from the line on April 5. The second also was to be relieved by British divisions on the night of April 9, but meanwhile it was given the whole corps sector to hold, although one brigade of the first Portuguese was left in reserve near Lestrem, five miles behind the line. The 51st Division had been on the scene for several days and might have been used, indeed, its commander had proposed that he should take over the second line, a strongly concreted position easy to hold. But his request had not been granted. Yet Horn had been warned by his Q-staff that the convergence of German railways made the Lys sector the most probable point of attack, indeed, the only point where an attack could be mounted. They had, further, sought permission to prepare special supply dumps 15 miles in rear to meet the danger of a breakthrough here, but had been rebuffed. Happily, they began preparations, without his knowledge. And the existence of these dumps helped to ease the emergency that followed. If the state of the local preparations was Horn's responsibility, it is right to point out that he saw eye to eye with Haig in failing to read the writing on the wall map. Rarely, if ever was this so clear, or surprise less warranted by the signs. For the Germans sacrificed concealment to speed in developing their new offensive. From March 31st onwards the British aircraft reported a general northward movement of the German reserves and artillery, by road and rail. On April 1st, as the official air history has revealed, one observer alone in a couple of hours counted 55 trains on the move along the lines feeding the Labassi Armentier's front. The air reports of the next few days, supplemented by air photographs, made it clear that the German concentration was of the most formidable kind. The reason that GHQ failed to profit by the warning lay in its belief that the enemy would adhere to his original plan, and that the next step in furtherance of his Somme offensive would be a renewal of his attempt to break down the Arras Bastion. It would seem that Hay Gordy to Ludendorff with a persistency similar to his own at Pass Kendall. Convinced that Ludendorff's correct course was to gain the key position of the Vimy Ridge, even though it was the strongest part of his own front, Haig held fast to the idea that Ludendorff, despite his hard lesson on March 28, was bound to try again. As late as April 7, in an appreciation of the situation, GHQ pinned its expectations to a converging attack on the Vimy Ridge. Yet, to quote the air history again, there was nothing in the air reports and air photographs up to the 9th of April to support the view, held by General Headquarters, that a converging attack on the Vimy Ridge was likely. On the contrary the air information showed that the German troops opposite Arras were being drawn upon to supply reinforcements for the north and should have left little doubt that the immediate enemy concentration was northwards from the Labassi Canal. The air information has also a bearing on Horn's delayed action over the relief of the Portuguese. That the relief might come too late was indicated from the air. Throughout the morning of the 7th air observers reported the main roads immediately opposite the Portuguese to be full of moving transport, and ground observers told of men carrying ammunition into the German support lines. The impression conveyed by the combined air and ground reports was that the tactical concentration was nearing completion. It did not, however, impress the men at the top, 
or they were slow in reaction. For at 4.5 am on the 9th, an intense bombardment was opened on the 11 mile front between the Labassi Canal and Armentiers. The flanks of this sector were deluged with mustard gas, an indication that they were to be paralyzed but not immediately attacked. At 7.30 am, after a slackening in the fire, small groups of German infantry began to move forward, and about 8.45 am, after the bombardment had swelled again for an hour, the assault was launched by a mass of nine divisions of the German 6th Army, against three. Once more, as on March 21, nature afforded it a cloak in the form of a thick mist. At the southern extremity the 55th, a Lancashire Territorial Division, held on to Givenchy firmly, opposing so unshakable a resistance as not only to break the attack, but to dissuade the German command from subsequent attempts to extend it southwards. But in the centre, the Germans swiftly overran the Portuguese positions. The Portuguese were temporarily holding a front more than double that of the 55th on their flank, although their strength per yard was not much less, comparison of quality made such a distribution risky, and the risk had matured. But the sturdy resistance of King Edward's horse and the 11th cyclist battalion checked the German onrush and helped, with that of the reserve brigade of the 55th Division, to prevent the Germans crumbling away the southern flank. This resistance, indeed, tended to shepherd the German advance into the northwesterly direction, which it took more and more. But on the northern flank of the breakthrough, the 40th Division, its own flank laid bare, was partly overwhelmed by the combined pressure. The 51st and 50th Divisions, coming up to dam the breach, were delayed on roads encumbered with Portuguese and shattered vehicles, and, caught by the tide of battle before they reached their positions, could not prevent the Germans, now reinforced by seven divisions, attaining, and even crossing the line of the Lys and Law rivers. But next day their resistance so far stemmed the German tide that little more ground was lost except on the north of the original bulge. That morning, however, the German attack had been extended northwards to the Apricumines Canal, against the southern sector of the British Second Army, Pluma. It was akin to a left fist followed by a right fist punch, although this new punch was much lighter, by only four divisions of the German Fourth Army. This lightness was counterbalanced by the enforced diversion of part of the three British defending divisions to the breach made the previous day. The Germans broke through and between the punches Armentier ears itself was pinched out, the 34th division barely escaping from the bag. That night the breach was 30 miles in width, and by the 12th its depth was doubled. This was the crisis. Less than 5 miles separated the Germans from Hasbrook Junction. On the 13th, British and Australian reserves began to arrive from the south, and the German pressure to show signs of slackening. One self-confessed reason being their difficulties of supply under the increasing attacks from the air. The approach to Hasbrook, barred just in time by the 4th Guards Brigade, was now finally bolted by the 1st Australian Division, and the remaining German pressure was exerted almost entirely on the northern half of the breach. Pluma now took over charge of all except the southern fringe of the battle area and, to shorten his line as well as to forestall the fresh extension of the German attack, he began an unhurried withdrawal from the Ypres salient to a line just in front of the immortal town. This was a wise and clear-sighted move, even though it abandoned the few square miles of mud which had been purchased at so terrible a price the previous autumn. Although the enemy gained Balliol and the Ravelsburg Ridge on the 15th, he was then stopped at Meteran and in front of Kemmel Hill, and by the 18th the storm subsided. Meantime storms of another type had been raging behind the front. Fox appointment as Generalissimo did not seem to Haig to have brought him the prompt support he had expected. Ever since the 10th, and, indeed, before, he had been pressing Fox for French aid and active share in the battle. On the 14th an acrimonious conference took place at Abbeville and next day Haig made the stricture that the arrangements made by the Generalissimo were insufficient to meet the military situation. Fock, on the other hand, was, perhaps to the point of hazard, intent on husbanding his reserves for an offensive. 
in his opinion, on April 14, Labatel du Nord est fini dash where to many observers it looked rather as if the British army was fini. As usual he illustrated his opinion by a parable, of the rings made by dropping a stone into water, the successive rings growing less marked until the water became still. To hard press to lies these parables were apt to be irritating. But his prediction proved right, even though, as at Ypres in 1914 and 1915, the British troops suffered a terrible strain in proving him right. Contrary to what has been alleged, five French divisions arrived behind the British front as early as the 24th. But their intended counter attacks, as at Ypres in 1915, did not at first materialize. Let it be said, however, in justice and as a matter of tactical interest, that British counter attacks throughout this battle achieved consistently little gain, at heavy loss. On the 18th, the French division took over Kemmel Hill, and next day the remainder entered the line. On the 25th, the Germans resumed their offensive, but only on a limited front. The famous Kemmel Hill was captured from the French and the British to the north were also forced back. For a few hours a last opportunity was vouchsafed to the Germans, but through Ludendorff's intervention they refrained from exploiting it. After a final, costly and more abortive assault on the 29th, the German offensive was abandoned. As General Edmonds, the official historian, has penetratingly remarked, it is easy to see why Ludendorff collapsed after the 8th of August, 1918, on the 29th of April he was already well on the way to despair. Eight scene 3 The breakthrough to the man for battle-worn British divisions were resting in a quiet sector north of the Aisne, between Reims and Soissons, far detached from the rest of the army. They had been sent to the French front, after strenuous exertions in the battles of the Lys, in return for French reinforcements which had gone north to aid the British in the later stages of that backs to the wall struggle. On the tranquil line they could recuperate while still serving a useful purpose as guardians of the trench line. It was too quiet to be true. But the uneasiness of the local British commanders, shared by certain of their French neighbours, was lightly discounted by their French superiors. On May 25th they received from French headquarters the message that in our opinion there are no indications that the enemy has made preparations which would enable him to attack tomorrow. Next morning the French captured two prisoners who told of the impending attack, but the higher command had no plan to meet it, and, even so, did not warn the troops until late in the day. Too late. For at 1 a.m. on May 27th, 1918, a terrific storm of fire burst on the Franco-British front between Reims and north of Soissons, along the famous Kemen des Dames, at 4.30 am an overwhelming torrent of Germans swept over the front trenches, by midday it was pouring over the many unblown bridges of the Aisne, and by May 30th it had reached the Marne, site and symbol of the Great Ebb of 1914. After nearly four years a men esteemed for ever past had returned to a point that endowed it with demoralizing symbolism. Happily, it proved to be thus far and no farther. Like the two great preceding offensives of March 21st and April 9th, that of May 27th achieved astonishing captures of ground and prisoners, but it brought the Germans little nearer to their strategical object. And, even more than its predecessors, its very success paved the way for their downfall. To the reasons for this we shall come. But why, a month after the last onslaught, in the north, had come to an end, why, when there had been this long interval for preparation and for examination of the situation by a new unified command, should a surprise greater than any before have been possible? This is perhaps the most interesting historical question of the battle. It has long been known, of course that the French higher command, the one directly concerned with the safety of the Aisne sector, did not believe in the likelihood of an attack. Nor did the British higher command, which, however, was concerned with the front in the north, and expected a further onslaught there. If not justified by the event, the British had some cause for expecting it, as German disclosures have since attested. But the intelligence service of another of the Allies, better placed to take a wide survey, 
did give the warning, only to be disregarded until too late. On May 13, a fortnight after the fighting in Flanders had died away, the British intelligence came to the conclusion that an attack on a broad front between Arras and Albert is intended. Next day this was discussed at a conference of the intelligence section of the American Expeditionary Force, and the head of the Battle Order section, Major S. T. Hubbard, gave a contrary opinion holding that the next attack would be against the Kemen des Dames sector, between May 25th and 30th. Among the reasons given were that, as surprise was the key note of the German method, this sector was one of the few where it was now possible, that it was all the more likely to be chosen because regarded by the Allies as secure and as a resting ground for tired divisions, that its feasible frontage corresponded well with the limited German resources available at the moment and that this hypothesis was confirmed by the ascertained location of the German troops, particularly of certain picked divisions. The warning in detail was conveyed to the French general headquarters, but fell on deaf ears. Why should credence be given to an opinion coming from such an amateur army, not yet tested in battle, over the verdict of war-tried and highly developed intelligence services? The warning was reiterated, however, and Colonel de Cointet, chief of the French intelligence, was won over to its acceptance. But now, as at Verdun two years before, the operations branch opposed until too late the view of its own intelligence. This time, however, it was less blameworthy, for it was tugged the other way by the comforting assurances of General Duquesne, commander of the 6th French Army, in charge of the Kemin des Dames sector. This general, indeed, bears a still heavier responsibility for he insisted on the adoption of the long exploded and wasteful system of massing the infantry of the defense in the forward positions. Besides giving the enemy guns a crowded and helpless target, this method ensured that once the German guns had made a bloated meal of this luckless cannon fodder, the German infantry would find practically no local reserves to oppose their progress through the rear zones. In similar manner all the headquarters, communication centers, ammunition depots, and railheads were pushed close up, ready to be dislocated promptly by the enemy bombardment. Badain's instructions for a deep and elastic system of defense had evidently made no impression on General Duquesne, so that it was still less a matter for wonder that the protests of junior British commanders met with a rebuff, and the conclusive jide it. It was unfortunate also, if perhaps less avoidable that when the four British divisions forming the Nine Corps, Hamilton Gordon, arrived from the north at the end of April, their depleted ranks filled up with raw drafts from home, they were hurried straight into the line, as the best place to complete their training. The central backbone of the AI defences was formed by the historic Kemen des Dames Ridge north of the river. The eastern half of this hog's back was to be held by the British, with the 50th Division, H. C. Jackson, on the left, next the 8th Division, Henneker, and beyond the end of the ridge, in the low ground from Berrio back along the Ain and Marne Canal, the 21st Division, D. G. M. Campbell, joining up with the French troops covering Reims. The infantry of the 25th Division, Bainbridge was in reserve. Altogether the French 6th Army front was held by three French and three British divisions, with four and one respectively in reserve. Against these tired or raw troops, in the main attack from Berrio back westwards, 15 German divisions, all but one brought up fresh, were to fall upon five, with two more for the subsidiary attack between Berrio back and Dreams, while seven German divisions lay close up in support. Even so, the Germans' superiority of numbers was not so pronounced as in the March and April offensives, whereas both the rapidity and the extent of their progress were greater. Once again the tactical surprise of the assault was aided by a thick ground mist, which wrapped the Germans' initial advance in a cloak of invisibility. But they had a series of extraordinarily difficult obstacles to cross. First, the Aylet stream in no man's land itself. The conclusion is, therefore, that the advantage was due in part to the strategic surprise, the greater unexpectedness of the time and place, and in part to the folly of exposing the defenders so completely to the demoralizing and paralyzing effect of the German bombardment, 
by 3,719 guns on a front of 38 miles. This last, indeed, was a form of surprise, for the object of all surprise is the dislocation of the enemy's morale and mind, and the effect is the same whether the enemy be caught napping by deception or allows himself to be trapped with his eyes open. Further, the German success on May 27, 1918, deserves study and comparison with their other offensives, whose success was almost in mathematical ratio to their degree of surprise. This final year, indeed, read in the light of previous years, affords fresh proof that surprise, or, more scientifically, the dislocation of the enemy's mental balance, is essential to true success in every operation of war. A lesson oft repeated, oft ignored. At the bar of history any commander who risks the lives of his men without seeking this preliminary guarantee is condemned. Let us pass to the events of May 27. For three and a half hours the unfortunate troops had to endure a bombardment unparalleled, according to the verdict of the more experienced sufferers, in its intensity. And the ordeal of those hours of helpless endurance, amid the ever-swelling litter of shattered dead and untended wounded, was made more trying by crouching, semi-suffocated in gas masks. Then the grey waves advanced, a relief, if only of action, at last. Three quarters of an hour later they had reached the crest of the ridge in the centre, near A's. This uncovered the flank of the left British division, the 50th, forcing its survivors to fall back down the other slope. Next to it the 8th division was being forced to give way. Although two of its brigades held stubbornly for a time on the north bank of the Ain. Here the second Devons earned imperishable glory and a citation in the French orders of the day, by sacrificing themselves almost to a man in a stand which gained breathing space for fresh resistance to take form in rear. On the British right, the attack on the 21st Division developed later, this division was awkwardly placed with the swampy Ain and Marn Canal running through the centre of its battle zone but most of it was successfully extricated and withdrawn west of the canal. By midday the situation was that the Germans had reached and crossed at most points the Ain from Berio back to Valley, helped by the fact that General Duckin had been belated in giving the order to blow up the bridges. Hitherto the German progress had been evenly distributed, but in the afternoon a heavy sagging occurred in the center, at the junction of the French and British wings and the Germans pushed through as far as Fismes on the vessel, 12 miles penetration in a single day. This central collapse was natural, both because it is an habitual tendency, and because the heaviest weight, more than 4 to 1, of the assault had fallen on the two French divisions in the centre and the left of the 50th division adjoining them. This sagging, together with the renewed German pressure, compelled a drawing back of the flanks. On the east, or British flank, this operation was distinguished by a remarkable manoeuvre of the 21st Division, which wheeled back during the night through hilly wooded country, while pivoting on and keeping touch with the Algerian Division, which formed the right of the army. After forcing the passage of the Vesel and capturing the heights south of it, the Germans paused until fresh reinforcements reached them from Ludendorff. But on the 29th they made a vast bound reaching Fear and Tardenois in the centre and capturing Soissons on the west, both important nodal points, which yielded them quantities of material. The German troops had even outstripped in their swift onrush the objectives assigned to them, and had done this despite the counter-attacks which Badain was now shrewdly directing against their sensitive right flank. On the 30th the German flood swept on to the Marne, fifteen miles beyond the vessel, but it was now flowing in a narrowing central channel, and this day little ground was yielded by the Allied right flank, where the four British divisions, the 8th and 50th now merely remnants, had been reinforced by the 19th, Jefferies, as well as by French divisions. Next day what remained of the original four was relieved by the French, who now took over command from the 9 Corps although fractions of them still remained in the fighting line for another three weeks as part of the 19th Division. But from May 31st onwards the Germans, checked on the side of Reims and in front by the Marne, turned their efforts to a westward expansion of the Great Bulge, 
down the corridor between the Auk and the Marne towards Paris. Hitherto the French reserves had been thrown into the battle as they arrived, in an attempt to stem the flood, which usually resulted in their being caught up and carried back by it. On June 1st, however, the Dane issued orders for the further reserves coming up to form, instead, a ring in rear, digging themselves in and thus having ready before the German flood reached them a vast semicircular dam which would stop and confine its now slackening flow. When it beat against this in the first days of June its momentum was too diminished to make much impression, whereas the appearance and fierce counter-attack of the second American division at the vital joint of Chateau Thierry was not only a material cement, but an inestimable moral tonic to their weary allies. Yet it would seem that the most valuable allies of all were the sellers of champagne, reinforced by the vast stacks of supplies that the French abandoned to their destitute pursuers. At Soissons the desire for such loot brought the forfeit of opportunity. At Fismes there were drunken soldiers lying all over the road. At Jonchery battalions stopped in the face of the slightest opposition and it was difficult to get them together again. Progress was very slow although there was no actual fighting. At the villages lamentable disorders took place. The officers could no longer keep control. A sorry picture of much drunkenness. Stot in their victorious onrush, the Germans had taken some 65,000 prisoners, but whereas this human loss was soon to be more than made up by American reinforcements, strategically the Germans' success had merely placed themselves in a huge sack which was to prove their undoing less than two months later. As in each of the two previous offensives, the tactical success of the Germans on May 27 proved a strategical reverse, because the extent to which they surprised their enemy surprised, and so upset the balance of their own command. For, as the disclosures of General von Kull have revealed, the offensive of May 27 was intended merely as a diversion, to attract the Allied reserves thither preparatory to a final and decisive blow at the British front covering Hasbrook but its astonishing opening success tempted the German command to carry it too far and too long, the attraction of success attracting thither their own reserves as well as the enemy's. Nevertheless, we may justly speculate as to what might have resulted if the attack had begun on April 17, as ordered, instead of being delayed until May 27, before the preparations were complete. The Germans would have worn out fewer of their reserves in ineffectual prolongations of the Somme and Gliss offensives, while the Allies would have still been waiting for the stiffening, moral and physical, of America's manpower. Time and surprise are the two supreme factors in war. The Germans lost the first and forfeited the second by allowing their own surprise to surprise themselves. Eight scene for the Second Battle of the Marne, July. 1918 How apt, if how strange, the historical coincidence by which, as the man had been the first high water mark and witnessed the first ebb of the tide of invasion in 1914, so four years later it was destined to be the final high water mark from which the decisive ebb began. For on July 15, 1918, the Shelchern wastes around dreams were the scene of the last German offensive on the Western Front. The tide of German success was definitely stemmed and three days later the air began under pressure of the great allied counterstroke. But although the first day marked the last German bid for victory, the actual attack was by no means the Germans' supreme effort, nor had it the decisive aims popularly ascribed to it at the time. For Ludendorff still adhered to his guiding idea that the British, severely shaken in the great battles of March and April, should be the target for his decisive blow and that their front in Flanders should be the stage on which he would produce this final drama of victory. Thus, as has already been told, the spectacular May 27 attack when the Germans, pouring over the Kemende Dames, across the Aisne and to the Marne, seemed to menace Paris itself, was conceived merely as a diversion to draw the Allied reserves away from Flanders. And its rapid success. Surprising Ludendorff as much as his attack surprised Fock, dug a pitfall for the Germans by luring their own reserves thither to exploit and retain this apparent windfall. So also with the June 9th attack, less bountiful in its fruits, 
that had been launched near Kempken to break down the buttress of Allied territory that lay between the huge salients created by the German pushes of March and May. When, instead, this German attack was broken off by Ludendorff, with little gained but his own reserves still further drained, he considered the enemy in Flanders still so strong that the German army could not attack there yet. So he planned a further diversion, to be made by 49 divisions attacking on either side of Reims. Another reason for this choice was that the German forces in the Marne salient depended on a single railway, the Lonsoysens line, which was dangerously exposed both to air and artillery attack. The chief of the field railway insisted that Reims must be captured in order to improve the communications. Otherwise the salient would become untenable, the Germans must get on or get out. Ludendorff chose to attack rather than to withdraw. The plan was finally settled at a conference on June 18th. The principal blow was to be delivered by the first, Mudra, and third, Einem, armies, driving towards Chilens, while the seventh army, Bohm, sought to cross the Marne near Dormans and to converge with the main advance in the direction of Ypres. Outwardly, Bohm's army seemed to have the most difficult problem to solve having to cross a river 80 yards wide in face of the enemy. The designers relied for success on the unexampled boldness of the plan, aided by the methods of concealment which had triumphed on May 27 th. But the sands of time were slipping out for the Germans, and American reinforcements, like the sands of the Shure in potential number, were slipping into the Allied line of battle, that to become a cement for this grievously strained rampart. Appreciating this, Ludendorff intended his Flanders attack, once more towards the nodal point of Hersbruck, to follow on the 20th day, only five days after the Reims diversion. On July 16 actually, as soon as the Reims attack was underway, artillery and aircraft were sent off by train to the Flanders front, and Ludendorff himself moved to Tournai to supervise the staging and production of his decisive drama. But the curtain was never to rise upon it. The Reims diversion had not even the brilliant opening success of its predecessors, and on July 18 the Allied counterstroke so jeopardized the Germans' situation that Ludendorff felt compelled to postpone, if not yet to abandon, the fulfillment of his dream. The reason why the German offensive fell flat on July 15 was that east of Reims it was played to an empty first night house. One of the great stories of the war which everybody knows is that of the elastic defense, in face of which the German onslaught lost its momentum, before it reached the real position of the French resistance. Statesmen and generals have vied with each other in acclaiming the brilliance of Gorod's maneuver. Alas! The story must be consigned to its place with many others in the Museum of War Legends. The maneuver was entirely due to Pétain, that cool unemotional company director of modern war, and shrewd economist of human lives, who, called to be commander-in-chief after the Nivelle fiasco of 1917, had systematically worked to rebuild the French army and to restore the stability of its manpower and morale that had been so undermined by the extravagant offensive policy of Joffrin's Nivelle from 1914 to 1917. Not content merely to reorganize, Bedain had set himself to ensure against a recurrence of the trouble by tactics that should be both an economy of force and of the nervous force of the combatant. To this end, one method was an elastic defense in depth, allowing the initial shock and impetus of the enemy's attack to be absorbed by a thinly held forward position, and then to await him on a strong position in rear, when the enemy's troops would be beyond the range of the bulk of their supporting artillery. This method Bedain had sought to apply against the German attack of June 9, but, although partially successful, its full effect was lost through the reluctance of the local commanders, still clinging to their old offensive dogmas, to reconcile themselves to a voluntary yielding up of a few square miles of worthless ground. And before July 15, when the coming German attack was definitely expected, a week's argument was required before Pitain could persuade the lion-hearted Gorod, who commanded the French 4th Army east of Reims, to adopt this elastic maneuver. But even when we have ascribed it to the right source, the accumulation of historical error is not fully corrected. For the method was not the revolutionary innovation that it has been termed.
the Germans, in fact, had used it on September 25, 1915, nearly three years before, to discomfit the great French autumn offensive in Champagne. And the underlying idea can be traced back 2000 years, to Cannae, where Hannibal applied it against the Romans in a distinctly more subtle and decisive way. But it sufficed, even in the mild way of 1918, to thwart the German attack east of Reims, where its effort was immeasurably strengthened by the German failure to achieve a surprise such as had marked their earlier offensives of 1918. Full warning of the coming blow was obtained by the French. The statements of prisoners taken from July 5 onwards being confirmed by air photographs of camouflaged ammunition dumps. And an evening raid on July 14 brought in a prisoner from whom, by withholding his gas mask, the French discovered the exact hour of the bombardment, 1.10 am. The French guns accordingly opened fire ten minutes earlier, and thus before the German infantry advanced from their trenches they had been trapped and driven by the French artillery counter preparation. They withered away before the machine guns of the French outpost line, and the shrunken remnants that passed beyond failed to make even a crack in the main position. But the dramatic nature of this repulse east of Reims has obscured the fact that it was not the whole battle. West of Reims the front had only been stabilized for a month since the last German thrust, and the newly improvised position was a handicap to the execution of the elastic method by commanders who were slow to grasp it. They chose to hold the forward position on the river line strongly, and their troops paid the penalty when the enemy's sudden deluge of gas shells caught them unawares. The Germans, in contrast, proved the value of taking the most obviously difficult, and hence most unlikely, course. Their infantry were ferried over the river under cover of darkness and a smoke screen, and then pushed forward to the attack, while a number of bridges were swiftly built under fire, an astonishing feat. Thus here the German attack deepened the corner of the great bulge made in May, and not only pushed across the Marne but behind dreams, so that it threatened to undercut this pivot of the Allied resistance. If the threat had an important influence on the French plan for the counter-stroke, its physical progress was stopped on July 16. The German attack, unaided by pressure elsewhere, had degenerated into local actions, disconnected and therefore useless, while the French artillery and aircraft, by bombarding the Marne crossings, made it difficult for the Germans to obtain supplies. Next day a queer hush of expectation spread over the far-flung battlefield. The stage was set for the great revenge. In an event so significant for the history of the world, the main historical interest is to determine its causes. The chief among them is to be found not by any analysis of military art, but by a process far more true to the character of the World War, that of drawing up a balance sheet of the previous six months' transactions. When Ludendorff opened his campaign, he had a credit balance of 207 divisions. 82 in reserve. Now he had only 66 fit divisions in reserve, most of them really so watered down that they could hardly be counted as sound assets. If these operations had made serious inroads into the Franco British balance of manpower, the Allies had at least averted liquidation, and now, in July, ample and increasing American drafts were being paid into their account. Like a promissory note, this American aid was of incalculable value in restoring their credit, their morale and confidence, even before it made good their material losses. Patain, the military economist, had appreciated this primary fact long before, when he had said dash if we can hold on until the end of June our situation will be excellent. In July we can resume the offensive, after that victory will be ours. If this simple calculation of time and numbers has the effect of attenuating the popular image of an inspired Fock counterstroke, wresting victory from the jaws of defeat, it is regrettable, but it is reality. Unfortunately, even what remains suffers in examination and, in the outcome, a further reduction. War is a masculine activity, and so it is perhaps natural that the feminine maxim, il faut souffre pour être belle, should be inverted. For in military history it is both easy and pleasant for all concerned to make an image of beauty, 
whereas it is not only hard for the seeker to reach the truth but the subject usually suffers in consequence. The riddle of July 18, 1918, might aptly be put in terms of the old conundrum dash when is a counter stroke not a counter stroke? Fox mystical faith in the almighty power of the offensive will to conquer had long since been shown at the man in 1914, where day after day he had ordered attacks, apparently oblivious of the reality that his exhausted troops could do and did nothing more than cling precariously to their grounds. Then at Ypres the same year he had spurred on Sir John French to order ambitious attacks, while actually the British troops were barely resisting superior numbers. On these occasions the result justified the spirit, if not the letter, of his instructions. But when the German gas attack made a hole in the Allied line at Ypres in April 1915, Fox refrain of it is, and his unredeemed promises of a French attack, caused Sir John French to waver almost nightly from the resolve to withdraw and straighten out the line, as Smith Doyen, to his cost, urged from the outset. Thus, when this common sense course was ultimately followed, the British had merely lost not only Smith Doyen's services but many lives to no purpose. When Fock was rehabilitated in 1917, this offensive instinct still dominated him, and when the crisis of March, 1918, called him to the supreme command, he had hardly set about his unenviable task of restoring the battered front of the Allies before he was dreaming of fresh offensives. Even before the new collapse of the AI front in May he had issued directives to Heg and Batain for attacks to free the lateral railway near Amiens and Hasbrook. If this project showed his practical belief in his theory of freedom of action, it is also evidence that he had no idea of luring the Germans into vast salients which he could cut off in flank, which was the conception subsequently extolled by popular propagandists. Similarly, the truth of the great counterstroke of July 18 is that it was not conceived, by Fock at least, as a counterstroke at all. But the refrain it is was chanted so continually that sooner or later it was bound to coincide with the psychological moment dash as on July 18 th. In the meantime Ludendorff's keenness in pursuing a similar policy, and the wariness of Bedain and Haag, helped to prevent the Allied forces becoming seriously involved in a premature offensive before the balance of numbers changed. In contrast, it was the oft-derided economist, Pétain, the cautious, who had conceived the plan of the defensive-offensive battle as it was actually waged, first a parry to the enemy's thrust and then a riposte when he was off his balance. On June 4 he had asked Fock to assemble two groups of reserves at Vise and Deepenay respectively with a view to a counterstroke against the flank of any fresh German advance. The first group, under Mengen, had been used to break the German attack of June 9, and was then switched a little farther east to a position on the west flank of the German salient between Soissons and Reims which bulged towards the Marne. Fock, however, planned to use it for the strictly offensive purpose of a push against the rail centre of Soissons. While this was being prepared, the intelligence service made it clear that the Germans were about to launch a fresh attack near Eames. Fock thereupon determined to anticipate it, not retort to it, by launching his offensive on July 12. But Ain, however, had the contrary idea of first stopping and then smiting the enemy when the latter had entangled himself. And, Perchance curiously, the French troops were not ready on July 12, so that the battle was fought rather according to Pitain's than to Fox's conception. But not altogether. For Pitain's plan had comprised three phases first, to hold up the German attack, second, to launch counter strokes against the flanks of the fresh pockets it was likely to make on either side of Reims, third, and only third when the German reserves had been fully drawn towards those pockets, to unleash Mangin's army in a big counter-offensive eastward along the baseline of the main bulge, the enemy's rear, and so close the neck of the vast sack in which the German forces south of the Ain would be enclosed. Events and Fock combined to modify this conception. As already narrated the German attack west of Reims had made an unpleasantly deep pocket, penetrating well over the Marne and threatening to take in rear the natural buttress formed by the Montani dreams. 
to avert the danger Badain was driven to use most of the reserves he had intended for the second phase of the counterstroke, and to replace them he decided to draw from Menjin's army, and to postpone the latter's counter-offensive, already ordered by Fock for July 18 th. When Fock, full of eagerness and with his spirit still more fortified, if that was possible, by Haig's promise to send British reserves, heard of Badain's action he promptly countermanded it. Hence on July 18 the French left wing 13 was launched to its counter-offensive while the defensive battle was still in progress in the centre and on the right wing. This meant that the second phase of Badain's plan had to be dropped out, and instead of the right wing attracting the Germans' reserves in order to enable the left wing to fall on their naked back, the left wing's offensive eased the pressure on the right wing. To compensate as far as possible the initial passivity of the right wing, 14 the British reserves, 51st and 62nd divisions, which were sent thither, were used to relieve the defending troops on the move, passing direct to an attack. In the center, 15 American reserves were similarly used and thus a general pressure began along the whole face of the great salient dot but this convergent pressure did not begin until July 20, and by the time the opening surprise, due to the sudden release of a mass of tanks, was over and the left wing had lost its impetus. After advancing about four miles on the 18th, and a little farther on the 19th, Mengen's army was brought to a standstill on the Soissons flank, near the jugular vein of the salient. Thus the Germans, fighting hard for breathing space, gained the time they required to draw the bulk of their forces out of the sack, even though they left 25,000 prisoners and much material behind. And once they were safely back on a straight and much shortened line along the vessel, Ludendorff felt able, on August 2, to order preparations to be resumed for fresh attacks in Flanders and east of Montdidier. Six days later, his offensive dreams were finally dissipated, but it is historically important to realize that it was not the Second Battle of the Marne, Fox's great counterstroke, which dissipated them. This July 18 counterstroke, conceived as such by Pitain and amended by Fock, was by no means decisive in its results. It may be that Fox's impetuosity robbed him of such results, that Badain's oft criticized caution would have been more fruitful and collected a larger bag. Nevertheless, if the battle had no clearly decisive effect, the first taste of victory after such deep and bitter drafts of defeat was an incalculable moral stimulant to the Allies, and perchance its depressing effect on the German morale was more insidiously damaging than was at first visible. So that Fock, who was ever concerned only with moral factors, which cannot be mathematically calculated, may well have been content. He had gained the initiative, and he kept it, that was enough, results mattered little. For his strategy was simple, not the complex masterpiece of art which legend has ascribed to him. It was best expressed in his own vivid illustration Dash war is like this. Here is an inclined plane. An attack is like the ball rolling down it. It goes on gaining momentum and getting faster and faster on condition that you do not stop it. If you check it artificially you lose your momentum and have to begin all over again. Eight scene 5 The Black Day of the German Army, August 8th August 8th, 1918, is a date which grows ever larger on the horizon of the historian. So far as any one event of the campaign in the West can be regarded as decisive, it is the great surprise east of Amiens that occurred on this day. And that decisiveness is above all a proof that the moral element dominates warfare. For although August 8 was a famous victory, the most brilliant ever gained by British arms in the World War, and, better still, the most economical, Neither its tactical nor its visible strategic results were sufficient to explain its moral effect. Its 16,000 prisoners on the first day, and 21,000 all told, were a handsome prize compared with that of any previous British offensive, but a trifle in proportion to the vast forces then deployed on the Western Front, and in relation to such triumphs of the past as Worcester, Blenheim, Rossbach, Austerlitz, or Sedan. Its initial penetration of 6 to 8 miles, and ultimate 12 miles, were, again, excellent by 1915 to 17 standards, 
but in March the Germans had penetrated 38 miles in the reverse direction without achieving any decisive result. Studied on the map, the advance of August 8th to 21st merely flattened out the nose and indented one cheek of the shallow German salient Taras Montedinoion. It was far from reaching any vital link of the enemy's communications or even cutting off the troops in that salient dot yet it unhinged the mind and morale of the German supreme command. It led the Kaiser to say dash I see that we must strike a balance. We are at the end of our resources. The war must be ended. It made Ludendorff take a similarly despondent view dash the war would have to be ended dot in comparing the impression made upon him by the dramatic county stroke of July 18th on the Marne and that of August 8th. There is a remarkable contrast. And in this contrast lies the answer as to which was the more decisive of the two. For after July 18th he had by no means lost hope. He seems to have treated this reverse as hardly more than an unfortunate incident, and as late as August 2nd was ordering preparations for four fresh attacks, including his cherished Flanders blow if on a reduced scale in comparison with his original intention. But after August 8 these dreams vanish. There is an abandonment of any idea of returning to the offensive, and, more significant still, no adoption of an alternative strategy. Mere passive resistance to the enemy's kicks cannot be called a strategical plan. Only when it was too late did he formulate the design of a purposeful evacuation of France as a preliminary to a fresh campaign beyond the frontier. By then, however, the moral collapse of the German command had spread to the German people. After the war, Ludendorff delivered his considered opinion that August 8 was the black day of the German army in the history of the war. The adjective black is peculiarly apt. For when faintness follows a sudden shock, the blackening of the vista is the symptom which precedes the loss of consciousness and the consequent paralysis of the faculties. Thus, the primary interest in the story of August 8 is to trace how this shock came about. On July 12th, Fock, irrepressibly eager to begin his cherished but oft postponed idea of returning to the offensive, proposed to Haig that the first offensive to be launched on the British front should be one starting from the front festuber to Rebecca, with a view to freeing the Brie mines and forbidding the communication centre of Isters. Five days later Haig replied that he saw no advantage in an advance over the flat and marshy region between Rebecca and Festubert, and suggested, instead, that, the operation, in my opinion, which is of the highest importance and which I propose to you, as before, should be executed as soon as possible, is to push forward the Allied front to the east and southeast of Mayans so as to free that town and the railway. The best way to carry out this object is to make a combined Franco-British operation, the French attacking south of Morill and the British north of the Luce. To realize this project I am preparing plans secretly for an offensive north of the Luce, direction east. In liaison with this project the French forces should, in my opinion, carry out an operation between Morill and Montdidier. This letter, from the archives, sheds light on several momentous points of post-war controversy. First, as to the origin of the offensive, it shows not only that it was purely of British conception, but also that it was a limited conception, a narrow affronted shove to secure for means and the railway a rather wider margin of safety. The question is often mooted whether the idea sprang from the commander-in-chief, Haag, or from the 4th Army commander, Rawlinson. Here the words as before suggest that Haig had priority, for it was the brilliant little surprise operation at Hamel on July 4 and its revelation of the decline of German morale which inspired Rawlinson with the idea of a wider offensive. However, there is little in the question of priority for the defensive advantage of freeing Amiens was obvious. Indeed, the fact that Rawlinson's inspiration should not have come until after Hamel suggests his deeper appreciation of the moral element. The exploitation of an enemy's moral disintegration is fundamentally an offensive purpose. Second, as to the plan of the offensive, the letter seems to contradict the claim, made in Sir Douglas Haig's command and elsewhere, that the British were forced by Fock, against their will to let the French share in the operation, thereby increasing what Clausewitz termed the inevitable friction of war. Rawlinson certainly, 
and rightly, argued against it as inimical to the surprise he sought. But the letter shows that it was Haig's proposal. It is true that he proposed leaving a gap a few miles between the French and British attacks. But both were purely frontal and strategically shoulder to shoulder. A richer offensive prospect was perhaps offered by a convergent attack on the two flanks of the salient, north of Albert and well south of Montdidier respectively. But, for the former, a trench-filled belt of the old Somme battlefields was a difficulty, and subsequent events do not support the view that another army would have brought off such a surprise as the 4th did south of the Somme. The enlargement of the original project was due to Fock. who, on August 5, directed that if the initial attack was successful, it was to be continued by pushing southeast towards Ham. If the attacks against the southern flank of the salient which Humbert's and Mangin's armies began on August 10 and 17 respectively could have coincided with that of the British, greater material profits might have been yielded. As it was, the close cooperation of Debony's army immediately adjoining the British did little to compensate its inevitable hindrance to the plan of surprise. For, lacking tanks, it could not dispense with a preliminary bombardment, and this could not begin, without forfeiting the general surprise, until the British advance started. Greater material profits, however, could hardly have increased the moral effect of August 8 on the German command and this effect came from the shock of perhaps the most complete surprise of the war. How it was achieved is an object lesson for future soldiers, for, like all the masterpieces of moral dislocation in military history, it was a subtle compound of many deceptive factors. Too often surprise is treated as an incidental, to be gained by a simple choice of date or place. Its foundation was the sudden loosing of a swarm of tanks. 456 in all, in place of any preliminary artillery bombardment. 16 This method, inaugurated at Cambrai the previous November, had been repeated by the French on July 18. Before Amiens it was enhanced by manifold devices. Secrecy was sought by holding the preliminary conferences always at different places, by concealing reconnaissances, and by informing the executants at the latest moment compatible with readiness, divisional commanders did not know that an attack was intended until July 31, and the fighting troops not until 36 hours before the start. Even the war cabinet in London was kept in the dark, and in that august assembly the Australian Prime Minister, Mr Hughes, was in course of a vehement demand that the Australians should be taken out of the line, when a telegram brought the undreamt of news that the Australians were far on the other side of the line. On that same morning also, a general from the neighbouring army made a casual call at Rawlinson's headquarters on his way home for leave, and incidentally inquired why there was such a heavy sound of gunfire from the front. Deception was sought by making all movements at night with aeroplanes patrolling the area to check any exposure, by continuing work on the British rear defences until the last evening, by regulating the times and rates of fire of the artillery so that as more and more guns were slipped into concealed positions they registered without any apparent increase in the normal daily quantity of fire. By such means the strength of the 4th Army was roughly doubled, 6 fresh divisions, 2 cavalry divisions, 9 tank battalions, and another 1,000 guns being concentrated in the area unsuspected by the enemy between August 1st and 8th. This involved the use of 290 special trains, 60 for ammunition and the rest for troops, and only two lines of railway were available. Thus, by zero hour, 4.20 a.m., on August 8th, the 4th Army strength had been raised to 13 divisions, 3 cavalry divisions. 17 air squadrons, 10 heavy and 2 whipper tank battalions, totaling 360 heavy and 96 whipper tanks, and over 2,000 guns and howitzers, including 672 heavies. Two thirds of the heavy artillery was allotted for counter battery work, and effectively paralyzed the hostile artillery. Distraction also is an essential component of surprise and in this case it centred round the introduction of the Canadians. Regarding them as storm troops, 
the enemy tended to greet their appearance as an omen of a coming attack. At the moment the Canadian Corps was near Arras and an aptly chosen fraction of it, two battalions, two casualty clearing stations, and its wireless section, was dispatched northwards to Kemmel in Flanders. There, also, other suggestions of attack were conveyed by erecting extra aerodromes and cavalry wireless. Meanwhile the bulk of the Canadian Corps was filtered down to the Somme, where various ingenious rumours were circulated among the British troops to account for its appearance. The 4th Army dispositions were that the main punch was to be delivered south of the Somme, by the Canadian Corps, Curry, on the right and the Australian Corps, Monash, on the left, next the river, whilst the three corps, R. H. K. Butler, advanced north of the river to safeguard the flank of the main punch. But the Canadians did not move into the front line until a few hours before the assault, and meantime the Australians extended their front as far south as the Amiens Roy Road, relieving the French, and thereby lulling the Germans into a false sense of security. For what enemy would expect attack from a force which was spreading itself out defensively? The whole front of attack was about 14 miles long, and on the German side was held by six skeleton divisions, averaging barely 3,000 effectives apiece, of General von der Marwitz's second army. Their weakness of numbers was accentuated by weakness of defences, and in their rough forward line there were none of the usual deep dugouts to safeguard morale until the hour of trial. Five days before the attack an enemy raid captured an Australian post, and three days later a local attack fractured the three corps front and took 200 prisoners. But such information as the enemy gained only deluded him further. Moreover, the German aircraft were so incessantly harried by the British that for several weeks they could not reconnoitre behind the British front. The only suspicious sign was a certain amount of noise at night. On several occasions the German troops reported that they heard the movement of tanks, but the army staff ridiculed the constantly recurring nervousness of the trench troops about tanks. Actually, there were no tanks near the scene on the dates they were thus reported, and these cries of wolf, wolf, hardened the German higher command in its attitude of disbelief and indifference. Thus when, an hour before sunrise on August 8, the British tanks swept forward, with the barrage and infantry advance simultaneous. The blow had the maximum shock of surprise. Shrouded by a thick ground mist, it fell on an enemy who had done nothing to strengthen his position by entrenchments, and the Canadians and Australians, matchless attacking troops, surged irresistibly over the enemy's forward divisions. Only north of the Somme, where tanks were few, was there a partial check. To accelerate the momentum all reserves were set in motion at zero hour, copying the Germans' example of March 21. Soon, two, armoured cars were racing down the roads, to spread confusion behind the German front, even shooting up an army corps staff at breakfast in Proyart. The day's final objective, six to eight miles distant, was gained over most of the front except the extreme right and left. But the next day saw slight progress and rather spasmodic pressure, and thereafter the attack flickered out as rapidly as it had blazed up. Why this strange contrast? Why was not so complete a breakthrough completed by a dramatic finale? Partly, it would seem, because the advance had now reached the edge of the old Somme battlefields of 1916, a tangled waste of rusty wire and derelict trenches which was a break on movement, reinforcement, and supply. It is well to remember that the problem of maintaining continuity of advance was never solved in the World War. Again, the original front of attack had not been wide, and it is significant that almost all successful advances in the World War seem to have been governed by a law of ratio, the depth of the penetration being roughly half of the frontage of attack. Another reason was, as at Cambrai, the lack of reserves. The introduction of the local reserves of the 4th Army was well timed but, when its 13 divisions had been engaged, all that were available were three divisions assembled by Haag in the area. Moreover, the Germans, in contrast, succeeded in reinforcing their original six divisions with 18 reserve divisions by August 11, 
10 more than had been estimated. A fourth cause of the stoppage was inherent in the form of the attack. For being strictly frontal, the more it pushed back the enemy, the more it consolidated their resistance. This is always the defect of a frontal attack unless an organized force can be rushed through and placed on the enemy's rear. The cavalry as usual were allotted the role of exploitation. This time they rendered serviceable help in gaining and holding certain localities until the infantry came up, but such help was but a slender thing compared with the true role of cavalry in past history. Greater results might have been at end if the 96 Whippet tanks, instead of being tied to the cavalry, had been used independently to pass through the gap and make a concentrated thrust southeastwards against the rear of the German army facing the French, as was suggested by the tank corps. But from the broad strategic point of view, there was, or was evolved, this time a method behind the lack of reserves. On August 10, Haig had visited this front and studied the situation at close quarters. In consequence, when Fock urged a continuance of the 4th Army's frontal pressure, Haig demurred to it as a vain waste of life. In a letter of August 14 he told Fock that he had stopped the further attack prepared for next day, and that he was preparing an attack by the 3rd Army north of Albert. Fock objected to the delay involved by this alternative step, but at a conference at Sarkis next day Haig stubbornly held to and gained his point. As a result the 3rd Army struck on August 21st, the 1st Army farther north on the 28th, while the 4th Army seized the opportunity of this distraction of the enemy to resume their advance, the Australians gaining Montana St. Quentin and Perrin on the 31st, and thereby turning the barrier of the Upper Somme. These operations marked the new strategy of successive attacks at different but closely related points each attack broken off and succeeded by a fresh as soon as its initial impetus was spent. It would be unjust, as many British writers have done, to claim that Haig initiated this strategy. For it is to be clearly traced in the successive attacks already begun by the French to the south, Debeney's left wing on the 8th, his right on the 9th, Humbert's army on the 10th and Mengen's on the 21st. But Haig appears to have appreciated first its potentialities for economy of force. While Fock was filled with the idea of maintaining the pressure, Haig was seized with the idea of pressure at the most economical expenditure of life. The 4th Army's bag of 21,000 prisoners from August 8 to 12 had cost only 20,000 casualties. To the success of this strategy, the surprise of August 8 and its effect on the German command had contributed greatly. Their instinctive response to the shock was to hurry to the spot all possible reinforcements, and thereby they drained their reserve funds to bankruptcy point. The reserve divisions of the army group of Prince Rupprecht, which held the front from the sea to the Somme district, fell from 36 to 9 by August 16. Rupprecht's own resolution had done much to bring the British advance to a halt by preventing the local army commanders from carrying out their first panic decision to fall back behind the upper Somme. But this very resolution, perhaps, cost the Germans more in the end. Thus, in sum, the decisiveness of August 8 came from its dislocation of thought or will, or both, throughout the whole hierarchy of the German command. The history of 1914 to 18 repeated the experience of all history that, except against an exhausted or already demoralized foe, decisive success in war is only possible through surprise. And that surprise must be a compound of many subtle ingredients. 18 6 Majdo, the annihilation of the Turkish armies on September 19, 1918 began an operation which was both one of the most quickly decisive campaigns and the most completely decisive battles in all history. Within a few days the Turkish armies in Palestine had practically ceased to exist. Whether it should be regarded primarily as a campaign or as a battle completed by a pursuit is a moot question. For it opened with the forces in contact and hence would seem to fall into the category of a battle, but it was achieved mainly by strategic means with fighting playing a minor part. This fact has tended to its disparagement in the sight of those who are obsessed with the Clausewitzian dogma that blood is the price of victory, and hold, as a corollary, 
that no victory is worthy of recognition which is not sanctified by a lavish oblation of blood. But Caesar's triumph at Herda, Scipio's near Utica, Cromwell's at Preston, and Moltke's, though opportunist rather than sought for, at Sedan, each had the same pale pink complexion. In each, strategy was so effective that fighting was but incidental. Yet no one can deny their decisiveness both as victories and on the course of history. A more serious depreciation of this final campaign battle in Palestine lies in the fact that Allenby had a superiority of over two to one in numbers, and more in terms of weapon values. 17 In addition, the morale of the Turks had so declined that it is often argued that Allenby had merely to stretch out his hand for the Turkish army, like an overripe plum, to fall into it. There is force in these contentions, but most of the crowning mercies of modern history from Worcester to Sedan, have seen almost as great a disparity of strength and morale between victors and vanquished. And in 1918, Allenby had to outwit such able commanders as Limon von Sanders and Mustafa Kemal, not such men as those who thrust their heads into the sack at Sedan. When full deduction is made for the advantageous conditions of September, 1918, the conclusion remains that the triumph immortalized by the already immortal name of Mejdo is one of history's masterpieces. By reason of the breadth of vision and treatment. If the subject was not a difficult one, the picture is almost unique as a perfect conception perfectly executed. The question is often asked, whose was the conception? Was it that of the titular commander? Or, did it spring from some gifted subordinate? When the victories of Hindenburg on the Russian front are discussed, even the man in the street speaks of Ludendorff's strategy, and the student of war goes still deeper, or lower, and muses on the unassessable influence of Hoffmann's military genius. But with Mejdo it is possible to dispel doubt, through the unanimous evidence of those most intimately concerned. The broad conception sprang entire from Allenby's mind. Whatever the credit due to his assistants for working out its executive details, grew, indeed, would be a better word than sprang, for the original conception was of more modest dimensions, to break through the Turkish front near the coast and, wheeling inwards, turn the flank of their forces in the Judean hills. But, returning one day from a ride during which he had been studying the problem, Allenby suddenly unfolded the plan as it was executed in all its almost breathtaking scope. It abundantly fulfilled Napoleon's maxim that the whole secret of the art of war lies in making oneself master of the communications. If Allenby had a superiority of strength he was going to use it to make himself master not of one, but of every one, of the Turkish communications. And the success of his attempt to do so owed much to the complementary fact that he had taken thorough measures to be master of his own communications. The three so called Turkish armies, each hardly more than the strength of a division, drew nourishment through a single stem the Hejaz railway running south from Damascus. At Dirara branch, ran out westwards, crossing the Jordan at Jisrael Mejami, just north of Bezen, it forked a teleful in the plain of Esdralon one line going to the sea at Haifa and the other turning south again through the hills of Samaria to Mesuda Junction. This line fed the 7th, Mustafa Kemal, and 8th, Jivad, Turkish armies which held the front between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. The 4th Army, Gemal, east of the Jordan was fed by the main Hejaz railway. Now, to cut an army's lines of communication is to dislocate its physical organization. To close its lines of retreat is to dislocate its morale. And to destroy its lines of intercommunication dash by which orders and reports pass, is to dislocate it mentally, by breaking the essential connection between the brain and the body of an army. Allenby planned to achieve not a single but the triple dislocation, and the third element was not the least important to the success of his plan. The convergence of both roads and railways made Dira, Eliful, and to a lesser extent, bees and the vital points in the Turks' rear. To get a grip on Eliphal and Bezen would sever the communications of the 7th and 8th armies and also close their lines of retreat, except for the extremely difficult outlet to the desolate region across the Jordan eastwards. 
to get a grip on Dero would sever the communications of all three armies and the best line of retreat of the fourth. But it was considerably farther from the British front. Telefil and Beeson, however, lay within a 60 mile radius, and hence were within the range of a strategic cavalry bound, provided that these vital points could be reached without interruption or delay. The problem was, first, to find a line of approach unobstructed by nature, and, second, to ensure that the enemy could not block it by force. How was it solved? The flat coastal plain of Sharon afforded a corridor to the plain of Esdralon and Vale of Jezreel, in which Elifal and Beeson respectively lay. This corridor was interrupted by only a single door, so far back that it was not guarded by the Turks, formed by the narrow mountain belt which separates the coastal plain of Sharon from the inland plain of Esdralon. But the entrance to the corridor was firmly bolted and barred by the trenches of the Turkish front. Allenby planned to use his infantry to force this locked gate and swing it back, as on a hinge, northeastwards, so leaving a clear path for his cavalry. But having passed through the front gate they would still have to get through the back door. This the Turks could easily close if they had time and warning. Speed on the part of the cavalry was essential. But not sufficient. The attention and reserves of the Turks must be distracted. Even so, there was still a risk. War experience had shown how easily cavalry could be stopped, and a handful of men and machine guns would suffice to block the two passes through the intermediate mountain belt. To avert this risk the Turkish command must be made deaf and dumb as well as blind. In this complete paralysis of the Turkish higher command lies the main significance and the historical value of the victory of Mejdo. Let us watch how it was achieved. For it, Allenby had two comparatively novel tools, aircraft and Arabs. Fay Isel's Arabs, under the guiding brain of Colonel Lawrence, had long been harassing, immobilizing and demoralizing the Turks along the main Hejaz railway. Now they were to contribute more directly to the final stroke by the British forces. On September 16 and 17, emerging like phantoms from the desert, they blew up the railway north, south and west of Dira. This had the physical effect of shutting off the flow of Turkish supplies temporarily, and temporarily was all that mattered here. It had the mental effect of persuading the Turkish command to send part of its scanty reserves towards Dira. The Air Force contribution was in two parts. First, by a sustained campaign it drove the enemy's machines out of the air. This campaign was carried so far that ultimately the fighters sat above the Turkish aerodrome at Jenin to prevent their machines even taking off. Thus it closed the enemy's air eye during the period of preparation. Secondly, when the moment came for the execution of Allenby's plan, the Air Force made the enemy's command deaf and dumb, by decisively bombing their main telegraph and telephone exchange at Elifal, a stroke in which Ross Smith, who later made history by his flight to Australia, helped England to make history. In addition, the enemy's two army headquarters at Nablus and Talcarum were bombed, and at the second, the more vital. The wires were so effectively destroyed that it was cut off throughout the day both from Nazareth and from its divisions in the coastal sector. Another and earlier form of air activity was, if less military, perhaps of even wider strategic effect. This was the dropping not of bombs but of an equal weight of illustrated pamphlets showing the physical comforts which the Turkish soldier enjoyed as a prisoner of war. Its appeal to half-starved and ragged men was nonetheless for being imponderable. While the Arabs and the Air Force were perhaps the two most vital factors in unhinging the enemy preparatory to the actual push, the plan had also the wide and purposeful variety of ruses which marks the masterpieces of military history. By these Allenby sought to divert the enemy's attention away from the coast to the Jordan flank. In this aim he was helped by the very failure of two attempted advances east of the Jordan, towards Amman and Es Salt, during the spring. Then, throughout the summer he kept a cavalry force, periodically relieved, in the stifling heat of the Jordan Valley to hold the enemy's attention. When the cavalry were ultimately moved surreptitiously across to the other flank, their camps were not only left standing but new ones added while 15,000 dummy horses of canvas filled the vacated horse lines. 
mule-drawn sleighs created dust clouds, but aliens marched by day towards the valley, and returned by night in lorries to repeat this march of a stage army, a hotel was taken over in Jerusalem and elaborately prepared for the mythical reception of general headquarters, new bridging and wireless activity fostered the illusion, Lawrence sent agents to bargain for vast quantities of forage in the Amman district. Dot and all the time more and more troops were filtering down by night marches to the other flank near the sea, that to be concealed in orange groves or in camps already standing. By these means Allen B increased his 2 to 1 superiority, on the front as a whole, to a 5 to 1 superiority on the vital sector, unsuspected by the enemy. For some time Lim and von Sanders had certainly anticipated a big attack, and indeed, had thought of frustrating it by a voluntary retirement to a rear line near the Sea of Galilee. I gave up the idea, because we would have had to relinquish the Hejaz railway. And because we no longer could have stopped the progress of the Arab insurrection in rear of our army. On account of the limited marching capacity of the Turkish soldiers and of the very low mobility of all draft animals, I considered that the holding of our positions to the last gave us more favorable prospects than a long retirement with Turkish troops of impaired morale. Although he feared an attack near the coast, he feared still more the effect of one east of the Jordan, and even at the last hour the warning of the first given by an Indian deserter on September 17 was offset by the more positive news of the Arab attacks on the vital railway at Dira. Deceived by his own preconceived idea, Limon von Sanders was, indeed, too ready to believe that this deserter was a tool of the British intelligence, and his story obliged to cover Allenby's real purpose. Further, Limon von Sanders rejected the plea of Refit Bay, commanding the coastal sector, who wished to withdraw his troops a mile so that the British bombardment might waste itself on empty trenches. Forbidding Refit to withdraw an inch. He ensured that he should go back 100 miles, to Tyre, leaving his army behind, dead or prisoners. On the night of September 18 began what was both the last move of the distracting preparation and the first move of the real action. The 53rd Division, which formed Allenby's extreme right, made a spring forward in the hills on the edge of the Jordan Valley. Thereby they would be a step on their way towards closing the only way of retreat, across the Jordan eastwards left open to the Turks when the main move had fulfilled its encircling purpose. Far away to the west by the sea all was quiet. But at 4.30 am 385 guns opened fire on the selected frontage. For a quarter of an hour, only, they maintained an intense bombardment, and then the infantry advanced, under cover of a rapid lifting barrage. They swept, almost unchecked, over the stupefied defenders and broke through the two trench systems, slow and slightly wired, by Western Front standards. Then they wheeled inland, like a huge door swinging on its hinges. On this door, a French contingent and the 54th Division formed a hinged end, then, with a five-mile interval, the 3rd Indian, 75th and 7th Indian Divisions formed the middle panel, and the 60th Division, by the sea, the outside panel. The latter reached Tul Karim by nightfall. But what survived of the Turkish 8th Army had long before been pouring back through the defile to Mesuda in a confused crowd of troops and transport. And upon this hapless mob the British aircraft had swept down with bombs and bullets. Meantime, through the open door had ridden the three cavalry divisions of the Desert Mounted Corps, Chauvel. By evening they had reached the Carmel Range the intermediate door, sending detachments with their armored cars to secure two passes. By morning they were across. One brigade descended on Nazareth where the enemy's general headquarters lay, ignorant of the events of the past 24 hours because cut off from all communication with its fighting body. Limon von Sanders, however, escaped through a failure to block the northern exit of the town, and after a vigorous street fight the cavalry were forced to retire. The real strategic key, however, was now not at Nazareth but at Eliphal and Bees. These were reached at 8 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. respectively, to Bees and the 4th Cavalry Division had covered 70 miles in 34 hours. 
passing through the Carmel Range in its wake, the Australian Mounted Division turned south to Jenin to place a closer barrier across the Turks line of retreat. The enemy's only remaining bolt hole was east over the Jordan, which flows swiftly, with few fords, through a deep and winding trough, 1,300 feet below sea level at the Dead Sea end. He might have reached this but for the Air Force, as the infantry advance was making slow progress through the hills in face of the stubborn Turkish rearguards. Early in the morning of September 21, the British aircraft spotted a large column, practically all that survived of the two Turkish armies, winding down the steep gorge from Nablus to the Jordan. Four hours continuous bombing and machine gunning reduced this procession to stagnation, an inanimate chaos of guns and transport. Those who survived were merely scattered fugitives. From this moment may be timed the extinction of the 7th and 8th Turkish armies. What followed was but a rounding up of cattle by the cavalry. Only the 4th Army, east of the Jordan, remained. This, delaying too long, did not begin to retire until September 22. A broken railway and the Arabs lay across its line of retreat to Damascus. And four days later the 4th Cavalry Division moved east from Bezan to intercept it, while the other two converged directly on Damascus, its goal. Escape was impossible, but its fate was different from that of the other armies, a rapid attrition under constant pinpricks rather than a neat dispatch. In this pursuit the Desert Mounted Corps cooperated with, and for the first time met, their real desert allies, hitherto an invisible and intangible factor. Their presence, and identity, was disclosed when a messenger reported dash there's an Arab on the top of the hill over there in a Rolls Royce, talks English perfectly and in the hell of a rage. Apostrophe for no pursuit could be fast enough to satisfy Lawrence's ardent spirit as he urged his Arabs on towards the city of desire. To a British cavalry officer with an apt gift of phrase their march looked like some strange oriental version of an old-time Epsom road on Derby Day, but they outpaced the 4th Cavalry Division. The fragments of the Turkish 4th Army were finally headed off and captured near Damascus, which was occupied on October 1. On the previous day the garrison had been intercepted by the Australian Mounted Division as it was trying to escape through the Baradag Gorge, the biblical Abana. Sweeping the head of the fugitive stream with machine guns from the overhanging cliffs the Australian light horse rolled it back to Damascus, that to swell a bag of prisoners to 20, 000. The next move was a fitting conclusion to this chapter of history. The 5th Cavalry Division was dispatched to advance on Aleppo. 200 miles distant, in conjunction with an Arab force. Its armored cars led the way and dispersed such slight opposition as was met, reaching the outskirts of Aleppo on October 23. Two days later the leading cavalry brigade came up. A combined attack was arranged for next morning, but during the night the Arabs slipped into and captured the town on their own. The British force, too weak to press the retreat of the garrison was awaiting reinforcements from Damascus when the capitulation of Turkey on October 31st wrote finis to the campaign. During a brief span of 38 days the British had advanced 350 miles and captured 75,000 prisoners, at a cost of less than 5,000 casualties. In a war singularly barren of surprise and mobility, those keynotes of the art of war, their value had been signally vindicated at the last and in one theatre at least. Surprise and mobility had virtually won the victory without a battle. And it is worth noting that the Turks were still capable of holding up the infantry attack until the strategic barrage across their rear became known and produced its inevitable, an invariable, moral effect. Because a preliminary condition of trench warfare existed the infantry and heavy artillery were necessary to break the lock. But, once the normal conditions of warfare were thus restored, the victory was achieved by the mobile elements, cavalry, aircraft, armoured cars and Arabs, which formed but a fraction of Allenby's total force. And it was achieved, not by physical force, but by the demoralising application of mobility. 
a new light on Napoleon's dictum that the moral is to the physical as 3 to 1. Eight, scene 7 The Battle of a Dream, St. Mihail for four years a wedge 16 miles deep lay embedded in the flank of the main French armies. It was the most marked, and most ugly, feature of the whole irregular front between the Swiss border and the Belgian coast. Along this long irregular line of trenches salients were numerous, and of all sizes, but none was so acute as that which came down from the heights of the Wovre to the Meuse at St. Mihail, and even protruded beyond the river. All that time it galled France bodily and mentally, for although it was not in itself a convenient spring board for a fresh German offensive it might easily become a menace if a new wedge were driven in on the other side of Verdun, worse still, it crippled the prospects of any French offensive into Lorraine. For such an offensive, whether launched from the Verdun or from the Nancy sector, would not only suffer the menace of St. Mihail in its rear but would be difficult to nourish, because the St. Mihail salient interrupted the railways from Paris to Nancy and from Verdun to Nancy. This handicap was all too clearly manifest in 1916, when the army defending Verdun fought half choked and always in danger of being suddenly strangled. For two more trying years, the defenders of Verdun had to bear the semi suffocation of their windpipe. And then, at the end of the first hour of September 12, 1918, 3,000 guns peeled a message of deliverance. Four hours later, deaf and yet exhilarated by the thunder of their guns, the infantry of the 1st American Army advanced from their own trenches across the pulverized earth that had held the enemy trenches. Twenty-four hours later the two sharp points of the American forceps, cutting into each side, met midway, and the ugly fang was removed. America's first army had fought its first battle and won its first victory, as an army. The achievement was not merely a good augury but of indication, especially of Pershing and it was an invaluable tonic both to the army which fought and to the nation behind it, while a proportionate disillusionment to the Germans, who had questioned, even more strongly than her allies, America's power to produce an effective army. Apparently, the extraction of the St. Mihail Fang was also one of the most perfectly complete pieces of strategic dentistry in the war. Actually, the operation was less satisfactory and routes were left to cause trouble later. In part, the incompleteness was due to the faulty action of the forceps, in part to the dentist, but still more to the long concealed fact that the dentist's arm was jogged. Yet there is still a question, whether the operation could have been more effective even if the dentist had not suffered interference. To answer it, we must examine the cause and course of the operation. It was the fulfillment of a dream and a scheme which almost coincided with the entry of the United States into the war. Indeed, Pershing and his staff had come to Europe in June, 1917, with their eyes fixed on St. Mihail and their minds on Metz, behind it. The British, they knew, were committed to operations in Flanders and northern France, an area which, despite its drawbacks, mud especially, was nearest to their home base and gave them the shortest lines of communication with the channel ports. The offensive operations of the French had all been carried out in the sector north of Paris and it was natural that they should concentrate to cover their capital. The choice of the easterly sector facing and flanking Metz was the natural one for the Americans, because it clashed least with their allies' lines of supply and was easiest of access from their own base ports in the Bay of Biscay. Moreover, this sector was obviously the Germans' most sensitive point, because a thrust they needed to penetrate only a short distance before it would imperil the stability of the whole German position in France, which formed a vast salient jutting southwards between Verdun and Ypres. For to sever the eastern end of the great lateral railway met Smorberge would at least restrict the free movement of reserves and supplies, and, more significant still, would turn the flank of all the successive lines to which the German armies could withdraw short of their own frontier. Further, such a thrust promised the vital economic result of releasing the Brian region and threatening the Saar Basin, upon which the Germans largely depended for their munitions. To pinch off the St. Mihail salient was not only a necessary preliminary to a secure offensive, 
but was a local operation well suited to the first test of a new force. But the American Expeditionary Force was more intent to conserve its strength until maturity than had been the British. A year passed before it was ready, and before that the Germans had intervened elsewhere to compel a further postponement. Not until August, 1918, when the German tide had begun to ebb, was Pershing able to collect his scattered divisions, which had just helped in stemming it, and to form them into the first tall American army. And even so it had to depend on the French for most of its artillery and on the French and British for part of its aircraft. On July 24 the commanders of the Allied armies met at Bonbon to discuss their future action. The outcome was very modest. Fock did not choose to look far ahead and merely called for a series of local attacks to free his lateral railways. The first was delivered on August 8 in front of Mians, and its dramatic evidence of the moral rot that had set in among the German troops changed the whole picture. On August 11 the newly formed staff of the 1st American Army moved to the St. Mihiel area, and they developed their plan to a far more ambitious one than had been suggested at Bonbon from that of freeing the French lateral railways to that of threatening the German. Not merely to pinch off the salient but to break through its baseline, where ran the Michel line as an inner barrier against any sudden rupture of the front. The plan framed by General Hugh Drum, the chief of staff, visualized the use of 15 American divisions, each more than twice the strength of a French or British division, and four French divisions. Pershing approved the plan on August 15 and Foch two days later. Indeed, Foch added to it not only six more French divisions, but an extension of the frontage and the direction to strike the heaviest blow possible and secure the maximum results. But on August 30 Foch came to the American headquarters at Linien Barrois with a radically different plan. The change was due to Haig's intervention. August 8 and its sequel had given him a clear perception of the German decline and, disregarding the cautious counsels of his government, he was now willing to test his judgment and risk his reputation by assaulting the ill-famed Hindenburg line, the strongest defences on the whole German front. But he was anxious to reduce the risk of failure and increase the profit of success and therefore urged Fock to change the main American attack from a divergent to a convergent direction. It would thus, he calculated, have a quicker and stronger reaction upon the German armies facing him, and by loosening their grip would ease his task, as he would similarly ease the Americans. Fock lent his ear the more readily to Haig's argument because his own horizon had enlarged. He now felt that the war might be finished in 1918, instead of 1919 and his enthusiastic assurance led him to transform his new method of alternating attacks at different points into a simultaneous general offensive dashed out le monde la bataille. By it he seems to have hoped not merely to stretch and crack the German resistance, but even to cut off and surround the German armies between his converging pincers, British on one side and American on the other. But Ain, when consulted, was quite agreeable to the change of plan, which promised to draw the German reserves to either flank and leave the French a clearer path in the centre. Thus, when Foch came to Linien Barrois, he proposed that the St. Mihiel plan should be modified to a mere excision of the salient. This operation was to be a preliminary, and safeguard, to the rear of the American main attack, now to be launched northwest towards Mezieres instead of northeast towards Metz. Fock further proposed that, while Pershing's army operated on the easier ground west of the Argonne, a Franco-American army under a French commander should attack the more difficult sector between the Argonne Forest and the Meuse. He also proposed to send General de Gout to hold Pershing's hand and guide his tactical decisions. The change of plan came as a shock to Pershing, and the other proposals as an affront. The interview was lively and the atmosphere grew heated. Fock hinted that he would appeal to President Wilson, and the threat had as little effect on Pershing as when previously used. Fock implied that Pershing was trying to shirk his share of the battle, and Pershing retorted that he was fully ready to fight as an American army. Fock ironically suggested that even for St. Mihiel Pershing could not raise an all-American army, but had to depend on his allies for guns, tanks and aircraft. 
Pershing retaliated with the reminder that by Allied request the Americans had shipped only infantry and machine guns during the spring crisis. Fock wisely dropped the argument and left Pershing to chew the cud. Next day Pershing, after reflection, wrote to Fock. He recognized the potential value of the convergent attack, but dwelt upon the difficulties of American participation. Since our arrival in France our plans have been based on the organization of the American Army on the front ST Mihiel Belfort. All our depots, hospitals, training areas and other installations are located with reference to this front and a change of plans cannot be easily made. Then he dealt with Fox's second proposal, contending that it is far more appropriate at the present moment for the Allies temporarily to furnish the American Army with the services and auxiliaries it needs than for the Allies to expect further delay in the formation of the American Army. Pershing did not attempt to hide his dislike of limiting the St. Mihiel attack, and suggested that instead of switching at once to the Musargon he should exploit the St. Mihiel attack to the full and later, if necessary mount a fresh attack either in the region of Belfort or Looneville. Not yet vouchsafed an intuition of victory that autumn, he suggested that these attacks would fit in with the ultimate American aim of taking charge during January and February of the sector from St. Mihiel to Switzerland. However, he said, it is your province to decide as to the strategy of operations, and I abide by your decision. On one question he was unshakable. I can no longer agree to any plan which involves the dispersion of our units. Briefly, our officers and soldiers alike are, after one experience, no longer willing to be incorporated in other armies. The danger of destroying by such dispersion the fine morale of the American soldiers is too great. If you decide to utilize the American forces in attacking in the direction of Mezzi-Ears I accept that decision even though it complicates my supple system and the care of my sick and wounded, but I do insist that this American army be employed as a whole. The result of this letter was a conference between Fock, Pitain and Pershing on September 2, whereat Pershing gave up his own plan for a share in Fox and Fock conceded Pershing's claim to American unity. The concession was wrung from him by his own realization that without the Americans his right pincer would have a weak and worn point and as Pershing preferred to attack east of Argonne, where supply would be easy or although the ground was more difficult, he obtained his preference. The one outstanding question was that of St. Mihiel. Fock wanted the general offensive to open by September 20 at the latest, and suggested that the St. Mihiel attack should be abandoned. Pershing and his staff decided that they must first cut off the St. Mihiel wedge to safeguard the rear of their Musargon attack. Again, their claim was conceded. But it meant that they would not switch divisions from one battle to the other in time, and that a number of raw divisions had to be used for the Musargon attack. In addition, the St. Mihiel attack was two days, and the Musargon six days behind timetable. Each attack interfered with the other. And the consequences were compound, not simple. The first effect was upon the American dispositions. Instead of fifteen double-sized American divisions, which were available, only seven were used in the attack. Although this was a more than ample provision for the task, ensuring a numerical superiority of about eight to one over the Germans, the actual distribution was curious. For while six divisions, including two of regulars, formed the right pincer, only one National Guard division formed the left. What had happened was that instead of reshuffling the entire dispositions the left pincer had been severely fined down, and the objectives rigorously limited. Fock, indeed, suggested that the left-wing attack should be abandoned. The plan in detail was that Liggett Psycor, on the extreme right nearest the hinge, and Dickman's four corps should attack the eastern face of the salient at 5 a.m. Liggett would demonstrate with the 82nd Division against the hinge, while on its left his 90th, 5th, and 2nd Divisions thrust towards the baseline of the salient. Attacking next to them on the left were Dickman's 89th, 42nd and 1st Divisions. At 8 a.m. the 26th Division of Cameron's four corps would thrust into the western face of the salient, aiming to join hands with the 1st Division. 
Meantime the French would exert a gentle pressure on the nose of the salients to keep the defenders busy until their retreat was cut off. But the Germans had for weeks been meditating and preparing to forestall the attack by a retreat. And when the Americans advanced to the assault on September 12th, the Germans had actually begun this withdrawal during the night. This fact has led to a satirical description of St. Mihail as the sector where the Americans relieved the Germans. If there is some truth in the description, it is not the whole truth. Unlike the bigger strategic retreat to the Hindenburg Line in 1917, this withdrawal worked but to the disadvantage of those who planned it. Although the German command were as well aware of the impending blow as most of the population of France, and were not deceived by feints elsewhere, they hesitated too long over their decision and made their preparations too leisurely. Thus they were caught at a moment when part of their artillery had been withdrawn, and although a large part of the American bombardment, from 2,971 guns, mostly French, was wasted on empty trenches, the longer range fire trapped some of the retiring Germans on the roads. Moreover, the comparative shortness of the bombardment, due largely to Liggett's insistence on the need for surprise, prevented the Germans gaining a comfortable start in their withdrawal. And the swift onrush of the American 2nd and 42nd Divisions, especially, upset their methodical arrangements. But Pershing's plan was also too inelastic. Before midday Liggett's divisions had reached their final objectives and, soon after, their second day's objectives on the high ground north of Thiaucourt. The rapidity of their advance was accelerated by Liggett's instructions that units should press on as long as possible, without checking to keep alignment with their neighbors. Dazed and unsupported by their own artillery the Germans made practically no resistance. But Pershing felt himself tied by Fox instructions and refused Liggett's plea for a further bound, which might have ruptured the Michel line. Dickmans and Cameron's converging corps reached their day's objectives with almost equal ease. But there, tied too closely to Pershing's apron strings, they came to a halt and awaited further orders. Too late, Pershing tried to exploit his opportunity. If the German roads out of the salient were jammed, so also were his own roads into it. His orders for Dickman and Cameron to resume their advance did not reach the troops until after dark. And thus all but some 4,000 of the 40 or 50,000 Germans in the bag slipped out before the neck was drawn tight by the junction of the two American corps at Vinals next morning. Nevertheless, Liggett had taken over 5,000 prisoners and the other two corps, together with the French, had taken as many in their original advance. The total came to 15,000, and, more remarkable, 443 guns, for a cost of less than 8,000 casualties. If the result did not entirely satisfy the Americans, they could console themselves with the thought that this first attempt was no different from the past offensives of their allies in failing to reap the harvest of an initial success. During the 13th and 14th, Dickman and Cameron wheeled up, with the French 2nd Colonial Corps between, into alignment with Liggett facing the Michel line. Then, and there, the battle was broken off. The only serious fighting had been borne by Liggett's corps, which had met with counter-attacks owing to the menacing direction of its advance, the enemy was willing to evacuate the salient, but had no intention of allowing his baseline to be crossed. What might have happened if Pershing had not been prevented from trying his original plan? There is no doubt that the Germans were immensely relieved that Pershing did not follow up his success or that in their view a further advance in this direction would have been a greater menace than the Mezzi-Ears direction of the Argonne offensive. Pershing's own view was emphatic dash without doubt, an immediate continuation of the advance would have carried us well beyond the Hindenburg line, the Michel line was an extension of the main Hindenburg line, and possibly into Metz. Dickman was still more pungent dash the failure to push north from St. Mihail with our overwhelming superiority in numbers will always be regarded by me as a strategical blunder for which Marshal Fock and his staff are responsible. It is a glaring example of the fallacy of the policy of limited objectives. On the other hand, Liggett, who proved himself perhaps the soundest reasoner and strongest realist in the American army, 
has declared dash the possibility of taking Metz and the rest of it, had the battle been fought on the original plan, existed, in my opinion, only on the supposition that our army was a well-oiled, fully coordinated machine, which it was not as yet. He has also pointed out that although the attack between the Meuse and Argonne came as a greater surprise to the Germans they were able to throw in reserves so rapidly as to block the original breach by the third day. And even if the Michel line had been broken in advance from St. Mihiel would then have met a fresh obstacle, especially on its right, in the defences of Metz. Significant also is the matured verdict of General von Galwitz. The opposing German army group commander dash an overrunning of the Michel position I consider out of the question. In order to capture this position a further operation on a very large scale would have been required. It is well to remember that for decisive results Pershing would at least have had to reach the longer Inthanville stretch of the lateral railway, a further 20 miles beyond the Michel line and to have gone far enough beyond it to interrupt the line running back from Longa in through Luxembourg. It would have demanded a penetration deeper and quicker than any yet achieved by the Allies on the Western Front. With an untried army this was surely a remote hope. Yet there is one factor of which criticism has taken no account, a factor which endowed Pershing's original plan with a peculiar advantage. Almost every attempted breakthrough in the war had been based on the idea of a single penetration. Among the few exceptions had been the simultaneous Artois and Champagne attacks on September 25, 1915. But although in form a dual penetration, the effect was that of two single ones, for they were too far apart to cause any prompt sagging and collapse of the sector between. The convergent Argonne and Cambrai thrusts of Fox's new plan had also the same appearance of duality but an even wider interval between them. Now duality is the very essence of war, although curiously overlooked. Everyone recognizes the advantage which even a lightweight boxer has in using two fists against a one-armed opponent. So in war the power to use two fists is an inestimable asset. To faint with one fist and strike with the other yields an advantage, but a still greater advantage lies in being able to interchange them, to convert the feint into the real blow if the opponent uncovers himself. Nor should duality be limited to the force. Duality of objective, of which Sherman was the supreme exponent, enables the attacker to get his opponent on the horns of a dilemma, and, by mystifying him, to obtain the chance of surprising him so that if the opponent concentrates in defense of one objective the attacker can seize the other. Only by this elasticity of aim can we truly attune ourselves to the uncertainty of war. Returning from the general to the particular, we can recognize that the St. Mihiel salient offered the chance of attempting the yet untried method of dual penetration under almost ideal conditions. If two powerful attacks had broken through the flanks of the salient, and better still, beyond them to right and left, the defenders in the center would have dissolved into chaos, and been securely gauged. Through this collapsed center a fresh force might then have driven, with a clear path between the two protecting wings. What we know of the incompleteness of the baseline defenses and the time taken before they were completely garrisoned suggests that, on September 12th and 13th at least, they could have been ruptured on a wide front. On a smaller scale, the actual attack fulfilled this process as far as it went, but the wings were then held back and there was no fresh force to pass through the center. But it is still a question how far the Americans could have advanced beyond the breach. And here the main factor would not have been defenses or defenders, but supplies. The roadblocks and transport difficulties actually experienced in the limited advance do not encourage an optimistic answer. It is more likely that the eventual result would have justified Liggett's opinion, and Napoleon's axiom, with a new army it is possible to carry a formidable position, but not to carry out a plan or design. And the last weeks of the war were to show that even experienced armies could not solve the problem of maintaining supplies during a sustained advance, even though almost unopposed. For bulk cancels out experience. Eight scene eight, the Battle of a Nightmare. The Meuse Argonne Eldor for far greater battle in scale the Meuse Argonne is less significant, except to the combatants, than St. Mihiel. 
strategically and historically it may even be viewed as an appendix to the unfinished and partly unwritten story of St. Mihiel. In the first place, the intimate aim was more idealistic than realistic. It was based on the idea that the Ardennes formed an impenetrable back wall to the great German salient in France, and that if the Allies could reach and close the exits east and west they would cut off the German armies in the salient. But the impossibility of the Ardennes had been much exaggerated, especially in Haig's reports. Actually, the Ardennes were traversed by numerous roads and several railways, so that though the severance of the routes east and west might complicate the German withdrawal this would be imperiled only if the objective was attained very rapidly. As always in war, everything turned on the time factor. To reach the lateral railway from the Musargon sector the Americans would have to advance 30 miles. And to be effective they would have to advance more rapidly than from the St. Mihiel sector, because their thrust would be aimed close to the main German armies instead of like the projected St. Mihiel thrust, close to the German frontier. The attempt, and hope, was fundamentally unreal. To cross these 30 miles of difficult country, they would first have to break through the German front and then, some 8 miles behind it, would meet the untouched defences of the Kriemhilde section of the Hindenburg line. Pershing might have confidence in the capacity of his untried army, but his faith, like that of the French in 1914 and 1915, was to founder on the rock of machine guns. But Ain, if he underestimated the effect of other factors, was closer to reality when he predicted that the Americans might cover a third of the distance before the winter. That roughly was as far as their original attack reached, and there they stuck, until other factors, unforeseen by Pertain, intervened to relieve them. In the second place, the Musargon attack did not fulfill its immediate aim, the Hague-inspired aim for which Pershing had sacrificed his own plan. For the left-wing attack broke through the Cambrai St. Quentin section of the Hindenburg line, the strongest artificially, before the Musargon attack had drawn off any German divisions from the British front. Thus the result justified Haig's confidence but not his precaution proving that his troops could break through without indirect help to ease their path. The strength of the defences was nullified by the weakening morale of the defenders. The irony of the result was increased by the fact that while 57 German divisions faced the left-wing attack by 40 British and 2 American divisions, only 20 German divisions were present to oppose the right-wing attack by 13 American and 31 French divisions, the equivalent of at least 60 ordinary strength divisions. The difference of result may be explained, in part, by the differing degree of experience, and in part by the difference of conditions. The left-wing attack opened with the British close on the edge of the Hindenburg line, while on the right wing the Americans had to conquer a deep series of defences before they could assault their section of the Hindenburg line. And before they reached it their attack had lost its momentum. Thereafter, although stubborn American assaults at heavy cost caused the Germans to draw off, on balance, a further 16 divisions from the French front, the strategic effect was small. For with shrewd strategic sense the French in the centre appreciated that decisive results depended on the rapid penetration and closing of the pincers, and so did not unduly hasten the retreat of the Germans facing them. In their skilful advance they usually kept a step in rear of their allies on either flank, moving forward by successive bounds when the enemy had been shouldered back. For the first two years they had borne the main burden of the fighting. If their commanders had been slow to learn how to economize life, they, and still more their men, had learnt it now. Perhaps a shade too well. But it is not for those who were fresh in the evening of the war to complain of excessive caution in those who had suffered the full heat of the day, since dawn. On the other hand, criticism of the disappointingly early check of the Musargon attack has been too apt to overlook the handicap of excessive freshness. The trouble was not merely that the troops were fresh, perhaps it was mostly that the arrangements were fresh. The Americans had scarcely a week of real preparation, an astonishing contrast with the months which preceded the French and British offensives of 1915, 1916, and even 1917. 
even though their German fighting power and morale were now in decline, such haste would have put an almost superhuman strain on any troops. Yet it was demanded of new troops with a new organization. Popular opinion might complain of the frequency with which the machine jammed, the miracle is that it did not collapse and, instead, was rapidly repaired to move forward a new dot it is equally creditable to the higher command that the opening attack achieved so high a degree of surprise. This preparatory success owed much to the ingenuity of the intelligence section in creating the most artistic mirage of an offensive farther east, near the Vosges dot thus when the real offensive was launched, the 20 mile front of attack was held by only five German divisions, all emaciated and all but one composed of low-grade troops. Against them were thrown nine American divisions, with three more in close reserve, a superiority in fighting strength of about eight to one. There were three more divisions in army reserve. But, owing to the difficulty of withdrawing and switching troops from St. Mihiel, only one regular division could be used at the outset, and only three had previous battle experience. The attack was preceded by a three hours intense bombardment from 2,700 guns and accompanied by 189 small tanks. It is significant to note that the proportion of tanks was much lower than in the Allied offensives of July 15 and August 8. It is also noteworthy, in view of Pershing's pre St. Mihiel hint to Fock, that all the artillery was French made and half of it manned by the French, as also were 47 of the tanks. Pershing's plan was far-reaching. It certainly cannot be criticized as circumscribed or short-sighted, for the attacking troops were expected to reach and break through the Greenhilde line on the first day, an advance of over eight miles, and were to exploit the success during the night so that the second morning would find them in open country and almost halfway to Sedan in the lateral railway. Unfortunately, Pershing's orders were by no means clearly worded. Fock in a personal note had intimated that the American army must not let itself be tied by the pace of its neighbor, Gorod's French Fourth Army, and added dash there is no question of fixing. Fronts not to be passed without a new order, such a restrictive indication tending to prevent exploitation of opportunities. Unfortunately, Pershing's orders to his corps had this very tendency, however far reaching his aim. Bullard's three corps on the right and Ligat's I corps on the left, were to drive in wedges on either flank of the commanding height of Montfaucon, thus helping Cameron's V corps in the centre, which was to sweep over Montfaucon and onto the Creamhilde line without waiting for advance of the three and I corps. This provision was wise, but less happily their advance was to be based upon the V corps. Here lay the germ of paralysis. For when the assault was launched, at 5.30 am on September 26, the V Corps, which had its flanks protected, made far less progress than its neighbors, although its left division, the 91st, was a happy exception. On the right of the V Corps, the 4th, regular, division of Bullard's Corps penetrated deeply past the flank of Montfaucon while the 80th and 33rd near the Meuse made good progress. On the left wing of the army, which had the most difficult task and ground, Ligat's orders paved the way for a good start. Thus the 35th Division neatly circumvented the formidable obstacle of Vorquois by an encircling advance, and then, with the 28th Division on their left, drove a wedge nearly four miles deep up the air valley just east of the Argonne Forest. Through the forest itself moved the 77th Division, which had the difficult task of linking up with the French on the west side. Then, however, Pershing's orders for a halt, on reaching the core objective, were construed as putting a break on the advance, and it was difficult to get up momentum again after the six hours' delay. A method that was sound in siege warfare was, as Ligat's insight told him, a mistake when faced with a weak and temporarily demoralized enemy. The Americans had, as yet, neither the training nor organization for methodical siege warfare, and the best chance of decisive success lay in swamping the defense by a human torrent in the first flush of surprise before the enemy could bring up reinforcements. With the break put on prematurely, the advance thereafter slowed down and became spasmodic along the whole front. Guns could not get forward to support the infantry, 
control lapsed, and supplies frequently failed, through inexperience accentuating the natural difficulties of the ground. All these factors helped the success of the Germans' own tactics in drawing the sting from the attack. For the Germans had repeated the method of elastic defense, with the real resistance some miles in rear. The unexpectant Americans ran into this cunningly woven belt of fire when their initial spurt was exhausted and their formation disordered. Although Montfaucon was taken, by the 79th Division, on the second day, the V Corps only came up level with the two flank corps, and they had made little further progress that day. The great offensive had practically shot its bolt and, in the days that followed, the arrival of fresh German divisions enabled the enemy to counterattack and force back the disjointed attackers in places. A renewed general attack on October 4 made little progress, except on the left, and revealed once more the folly of trying to overthrow machine guns by sheer weight of human bodies without adequate fire support or surprise. But the value of training was also shown by the regular 1st Division in Liggett's Corps which drove in a deep if narrow wedge on the east bank of the air. This enabled Liggett, on October 7, to try a maneuver both original and daring, bringing the 82nd Division up in the wake of the 1st. He swung it against the enemy's flank west of the air and then northward. If the execution fell below the conception, only a tithe of the division came into action so that the chance of cutting off the enemy troops in the Argonne was lost, the threat at least persuaded the enemy to retire from the forest while there was time, and by October 10 the American line had passed and was clear of this hampering obstacle. Meantime, the all too obvious failure to fulfill the original plan had provoked widespread reactions behind the front. Clements visited Fock and bitterly remarked Dash those Americans will lose us our chance of a big victory before winter. They are all tangled up with themselves. You have tried to make Pershing see. Now let's put it up to President Wilson. The complaint was rather unfair in view of the fact that the advance of Gorod's army was well behind that of the American, if by design. But Fock was more generous, or more fully aware of the firmness of Pershing's position and replied dash the Americans have got to learn some time. They are learning now, rapidly. But Ain, indeed, had made the strategically sound suggestion of giving charge of the Argonne Forest sector to a separate army, half French and half American, under General Hersher, but Pershing had seen in it only a fresh political maneuver, and had rejected it firmly. Pershing, however, overhauled his own army, and its commanders. The inactive forces east of the Meuse were formed into the 2nd American Army, to be commanded by Bullard, while Liggett was given charge of the 1st and of the Meuse Argonne attack. Pershing himself retained the superior direction of both and left Hugh Drum to continue as Chief of Staff to Liggett. Dickman succeeded Liggett in the I Corps, and Hines succeeded Bullard, while Cameron was replaced by Summerall. Other commanders of all grades fell beneath Pershing's sickle almost as fast as their men beneath the scythe of the German machine guns. But for a time these changes made little impression on the Germans. The next general attack on October 14 achieved little at large cost, both of men's lives and generals' reputations, and with its failure even the higher command realized that the offensive had reached stalemate. An attempt to press on with exhausted troops and disordered communications, could exercise no pressure adequate to be any appreciably greater relief to the other Allied armies. Moreover, the British left wing of the Allied offensive, in which the 27th and 30th American divisions shared, had already broken through the last defenses of the Hindenburg line and by October 5 had emerged into open country, with only natural obstacles mileage and a devastated area to hinder its advance. Liggett, who now took charge, was wise to realize that in the circumstances it was far better to rest and reorganize his forces, for a shore bound as soon as possible, than to sacrifice lives in attempting the impossible. While utilizing the breathing space not only to replenish his ranks and supplies but to improve his communications and overhaul his organization. He carried out local operations to obtain a good jumping off line for the fresh bound. Further, he recast not only the tactics but the plan. 
Pershing had proposed that the American left should strike first, followed in turn by the remaining corps to the right. This meant battering first at the naturally strong and heavily wooded Bois de Bagone area due north of the Argonne, where also the enemy were in strongest force. Liggett preferred to drive a broad wedge in the center and so outflank the Bois de Bagone, threatening its encirclement in conjunction with the advance of the French Fourth Army to the west. It was well conceived, for when Liggett unleashed his forces on November 1, this area was the only one which showed resisting power and by next day the enemy rearguards there had disappeared and were falling back as fast as on the rest of the American front. If the Germans were offering little resistance, the very rapidity of the pursuit, outstripping the French on the flank, imposed almost as great a strain, and it was a tribute to the overhaul that the first army machine functioned much more smoothly than in the earlier phase and this despite the execution of a most difficult maneuver by which the whole army wheeled progressively to the right during the course of the pursuit, ready for an attack northeastwards, against the strong position between the Meuse and Chais rivers to which the enemy had retired. This wheel was a preliminary to an advance towards Metz, but the armistice now rang down the curtain. Strategically this move was more important, because the Germans here were more sensitive, than the now incidental arrival of the left wing on the Carignan and Sedan section of the lateral railway. This railway had been brought under artillery fire as early as November 3, and had been reached by the infantry four days later, but the Germans had already slipped out of the bag. Indeed, the advance to this point, although an exhilarating finish, was chiefly significant in showing the liberties that could be and were taken at the finish. With a somewhat brusque disregard of French feelings Pershing issued a message that he wished the American army to have the honor of entering Sedan Dash although it was now in the French sector of advance. Pershing added the encouragement or incitement Dash boundaries will not be considered as binding. The message was passed to the Corps without being shown to Liggett, and as a result the 42nd Division on the left of the army raced for Sedan. But the vague wording produced a still more unmilitary, indeed, a burlesque, result. For the first division, Pershing's favorite, from the center corps had also started to race thither by night, crossing the divisions of the I Corps and throwing them into confusion as it impetuously swept through them. It capped the farce by taking prisoner the commander of the 42nd Division. Liggett, however, intervened with prompt action and vigorous language to restrain both divisions and allow the French the courtesy of entering Sedan, thus to wipe out the bitter memory of 1870. The historian who scans the whole horizon of the war must recognize that this last offensive, beginning on November 1, had only a supplementary influence, for Ludendorff had fallen from power, his plea for a renewed stand on the German frontier rejected, and the enemy were already suing for peace before Liggett struck. Nevertheless it was well that the armistice had tarried long enough to allow the offensive of November 1st to take place. For it provided a counterpoise to the bitter memories of the first phase, more truly, the first battle, of the Meuse are gone, and a proof that when purged and refined by experience the American army could produce leadership and staff work worthy of the gallant sacrifice of the fighting troops. The American Nation in Arms. Epilogue UE very anniversary of the armistice kindles emotions and memories such as no other day in the year has at present the power to do. For those who shared in the experiences of those four and a quarter years of struggle, the commemoration does not stale with repetition. But the mood in which it is commemorated has undergone subtle changes. On the original armistice itself, the dominant note was a sigh of relief, of infinite volume most restrained among those who had the most direct cause for relief, most exuberant, perhaps, among those who least appreciated the relief. The earlier anniversaries were dominated by two opposite emotions. On the one hand grief, a keener sense, now that the storm had passed, of the vacant places in our midst. On the other hand, triumph, flamboyant only in rare cases, but nevertheless a heightened sense of victory that the enemy had been laid low. That mood again has passed. Armistice Day has become a commemoration instead of a celebration. The passage of time has refined and blended the earlier emotions, so that, 
without losing sense of the personal loss and quiet thankfulness that as a people we prove our continued power to meet a crisis graver than any in past annals, we are today conscious, above all, of the general effects on the world and on civilization. In this mood of reflection we are more ready to recognize both the achievements and the point of view of our late enemies, and perhaps all the more because we realize that both the causes and the course of war are determined by the folly and the frailty rather than by the deliberate evil of human nature. The war has become history, and can be viewed in the perspective of history. For good it has deepened our sense of fellowship and community of interest, whether inside the nation or between nations. But, for good or bad, it has shattered our faith in idols, our hero worshipping belief that great men are different clay from common men. Leaders are still necessary, perhaps more necessary, but our awakened realization of their common humanity is a safeguard against either expecting from them or trusting in them too much. It has been for the benefit both of history and of future generations that the past decade has seen such a flood of evidence and revelations, of documents and memoirs. That most of the actors are still alive provides an invaluable check in sifting the evidence, while the historians themselves have been so immersed in the atmosphere of war that they have a certain immunity from the abstract theorizing which an historian in his cloistered study fifty years later so easily contracts. We know nearly all that is to be known. The one drawback is that the flood has been so huge that only the student has been able to cope with its investigation. What caused that astonishingly sudden collapse and surrender of Germany, which, as by a miracle, so it seemed, lifted the nightmare load of war from Europe? To arrive at a satisfactory answer, it is not sufficient to analyze the hectic weeks of negotiation and military success which preceded November 11th. Even in the military sphere we need to go back to August 8th, the day which filled the German command with the conviction of defeat, and to July 18th, which witnessed the visible turning of the tide. And if we go back thither we must go back further, to March 21st, for the decline of Germany's military power is not explicable without reference to the consummation of that military effort, and consumption of her military resources in the great series of offensives which opened in the spring of 1918. We ought, however, to go back further still. Indeed, if the historian of the future has to select one day as decisive for the outcome of the World War he will probably choose August 2, 1914, before the war, for England, had yet begun, when Mr. Winston Churchill, at 1.25 a.m., sent the order to mobilize the British Navy. That navy was to win no Trafalgar, but it was to do more than any other factor towards winning the war for the Allies. For the navy was the instrument of the blockade, and as the fog of war disperses in the clearer light of these post-war years that blockade is seen to assume larger and larger proportions, to be more and more clearly the decisive agency in the struggle. Like those jackets which used to be applied in American jails to refractory prisoners, as it was progressively tightened so did it first cramp the prisoner's movements and then stifle his breathing, while the tighter it became and the longer it continued the less became the prisoner's power of resistance and the more demoralizing the sense of constriction. Helplessness induces hopelessness, and history attests that loss of help and not loss of lives is what decides the issue of war. No historian would underrate the direct effect of the semi-starvation of the German people in causing the final collapse of the home front. But leaving aside the question of how far the revolution caused the military defeat, instead of vice versa, the intangible all-pervading factor of the blockade intrudes into every consideration of the military situation. This, during the last year of the war, is studied with ifs. If Germany, instead of throwing all her military resources into a series of tremendous offensives in 1918, had stayed on the defensive in the west, while consolidating her gains in the east, could she have averted defeat? Militarily there seems little doubt that she could. In the light of the experience of 1915, when the Allies had 145 divisions in the west to Germany's 100, and when the German trench systems were a frail and shallow bulwark compared with those of 1918, 
it is difficult to see that the Allies could have breached it, even if they had waited until the inflowing tide of American manpower had restored to them the relative numerical superiority that they had enjoyed in 1915. And if so, in face of the accumulating cost of vain assaults, would they not eventually have inclined towards a compromise peace? A peace, per adventure, which, in return for the relinquishment of Belgium and northern France, might have conceded to Germany part or the whole of her gains in the East. Yet as we ask the question, and militarily find an optimistic answer difficult, the factor of the command of the sea comes to mind. For it was the stranglehold of the British Navy which, in default of a serious peace move, constrained Germany to carry out that fellow de say offensive of 1918. She was dogged by the spectre of slow enfeeblement ending an eventual collapse. Perhaps if she had adopted such a war policy of defense in the West, offense in the East, after the Marne in 1914, or even, after 1915, continued the policy which she had that year temporarily adopted, her prospects might have been brighter and her story different, for, on the one hand, she could have consummated unquestionably the dream of Metel Europa, and on the other, the blockade was still a loose grip, and could hardly have been drawn effectively tight so long as the United States remained outside the conflict. But in 1918 the best chance had passed. Another big if, often mooted, is the question whether even in the autumn of 1918 Germany could have avoided capitulation. Would the fighting front have collapsed if the war had gone on after November 11? Was capitulation inevitable? or could the German armies have made good their retreat and stood firm on their own frontiers? German opinion largely says yes to the latter question, and blames the surrender on the home front. Many open-minded and diligent students of the war among the Allies are inclined to agree that it was possible from a military point of view. But again the naval aspect intervenes. Even if the German armies, and the German people, roused to a supreme effort in visible defense of their own soil, had managed to hold the Allies at bay, the end could only have been postponed. The most that history is likely to concede is that they might have held on long enough, tightening their belts, for the Allies, already weary, to sicken of the effort, and thus concede more favorable terms than those of Versailles. Having disposed of the ifs, having emphasized the fundamental cause of the armistice, Britain's sea power, her historic weapon, the deadliest weapon which any nation has wielded throughout history, let us turn to examine the immediate causes of the armistice. How did victory come? Here military action bulks large. Other factors contributed, apart from the naval. If we do not accept entirely, we should not discount unduly the unwilling tribute paid by the Germans to the effectiveness of Allied, and especially of British propaganda. In the later stages of the war it was skillfully directed and intensively developed. If now, when passions are stilled, the memory of some of the facts that were exploited is disturbing to our sense of fair play and lies uneasily on the stomach, we realize equally that such forms of propaganda neither stimulated our own people nor discouraged the enemy. It was the kernel of essential truth upon the bigger issues which was digested by the German people and, by leading them to question both the honesty of their leadership and the hope of success, weakened the will to continued sacrifice. Nevertheless, though we should recognize the value of the more discriminating propaganda, its effect was rather in supplementing and completing the military successes than in paving the way for them, as German spokesmen have often contended. There is significant evidence on this point to be found in the memoirs of Prince Max of Baden, a man whose high-minded patriotism and sincerity command the respect of both friend and foe, and whose book is one of the most valuable of the war memoirs yet published. Unintentionally, and unconsciously, he shows in casual passages, easily missed, that when German arms were temporarily in the ascendant moderation was forgotten in exultation even among the more sober dot in March, 1918, he quotes even a pacifist as exuberantly crying dash never worry. What an experience. World dominion. And another representative of moderate opinion let the cat out of the bag in saying meditatively dash it would seem that we needn't say no to Brian Longway dash revealing that intoxication of spirit which, 
more fundamentally than any ill intention, was responsible for Germany's war guilt. In face of such widespread intoxication, propaganda could only be secondary to military action. Thus we are left with the sure conclusion that the success of the Allied armies was chief among the immediate causes of Germany's capitulation on November 11th. That conclusion does not necessarily, or even naturally, imply that at the moment of the armistice the German armies were on the brink of collapse. Nor that the armistice was a mistaken concession, as some among the Allies, usually those whose fighting was done with their tongue were so loud in proclaiming at the time. Rather does the record of the last hundred days, when thoroughly sifted, confirm the immemorial lesson of history, that the true aim in war is the mind of the enemy command and government, not the bodies of their troops, that the balance between victory and defeat turns on mental impressions and only indirectly on physical blows. That in war, as Napoleon said and Fock endorsed, it is the man, not men, who counts. The reiteration of this great truth is to be found in the war's last phase. Great as was the stimulus and visible success of the tide turning battle on the Marne in July, Ludendorff was still planning and preparing fresh offensives thereafter. If he was chagrined, he does not appear to have been so disillusioned as he had been after his own outwardly successful attack on the Lys in April. But the Fourth Army surprise attack before Amiens on August 8 was a dislocating moral blow. Prince Max put August 8 in its true light psychologically, when he defined it as the turning point. Even so, to develop the conviction of failure into the conviction of hopelessness required to compel surrender, something more was needed. It came not from the Western Front, but from a despised sideshow Dash Salonica, long condemned by Allied military opinion and scornfully ridiculed by the Germans as their largest internment camp. With Bulgaria's collapse the back gate to Austria, as well as to Turkey, and through Austria to Germany, lay ajar. The immediate issue of the war was decided on September 29, decided in the mind of the German command. Ludendorff and his associates then cracked, and the sound went echoing backwards until it had resounded throughout the whole of Germany. Nothing could catch it or stop it. The command might recover its nerve, the actual military position might improve, but the moral impression, as ever in war, was decisive. Yet, let us once again emphasize that the fundamental causes of the decision are more various than the acts which immediately produced it. The truth is that no one cause was, or could be, decisive. The Western Front, the Balkan Front, the tank, the blockade and propaganda have all been claimed as the cause of victory. All claims are justified, none is wholly right. Although the blockade ranks first and began first. In this warfare between nations victory was a cumulative effect, to which all weapons, military, economic, and psychological, contributed. Victory came, and could only come through the utilization and combination of all the resources existing in a modern nation, and the dividend of success depended on the way in which these manifold activities were coordinated. It is even more futile to ask which country won the war. France did not win the war, but unless she had held the fort while the forces of Britain were preparing and those of America still a dream the release of civilization from this nightmare of militarism would have been impossible. Britain did not win the war, but without her command of the sea, her financial support, and her army, to take over the main burden of the struggle from 1916 onwards, defeat would have been inevitable. The United States did not win the war, but without their economic aid to ease the strain, without the arrival of their troops to turn the numerical balance, and, above all, without the moral tonic which their coming gave, victory would have been impossible. And let us not forget how many times Russia had sacrificed herself to save her allies, preparing the way for their ultimate victory as surely as for her own downfall. Finally, whatever be the verdict of history on her policy, Unstinted tribute is due to the incomparable endurance and skill with which Germany more than held her own for four years against superior numbers, an epic of military and human achievement.